Torn Apart. The Secret Apocalypse, Volume 4. Written by J.L. Hardin. Audiobook produced by Book TV. Thank you to Off Grid Magazine for supporting this story. Fear. I am alone. I have been separated from Maria. From everyone. I am blindfolded and my hands are tied behind my back. I am in a room. I think. I'm not sure. I don't really know where I am. But I know it is hell. A place of suffering. Someone pushes me into a chair. They free my hands, cutting my ties with a knife. My arms hang at my side and I slowly roll my shoulders, moving the pain and stiffness away. I reach forward. I am sitting at a table. The ground under my feet is smooth concrete. I am about to remove the black hood over my head. But I am stopped. A voice speaks. A man. His voice sounds weird. Do not move. Do. Not. I freeze. Give me your hand. No. It was not a question. He grabs my wrist, yanks it forward, slams my hand on the table. What would you do if you had a day to live? What would you do if you had two days to live? Three? Imagine your last day on Earth. What would you do? I... I don't know. I say, I don't know, because I genuinely don't know. I don't want to think about it. No one wants to think about it. Death, life, mortality. We know that one day we will die. We know that in a sense, we are all dying, living and dying. But we don't think about it. We can't. When faced with death, some people get depressed, he says. A deep depression. They die this way, feeling this way. I try and pull my wrist back, but I can't. His grip is iron tight. His voice sounds like it is being altered. Have you heard of the five stages of grieving? He asks. I shake my head. No. Denial, he says. Bargaining, anger, depression, acceptance. Suddenly my arm is jabbed with a pin or a needle. The sharp pain shocks me and scares me. I instinctively try and pull my arm away, but I can't. He is too strong. I immediately feel weak, lethargic, and sleepy. Some people, he continues. Most people never, ever get to acceptance. They never reach this final stage. My eyes are heavy and getting heavier. What's your point? What did you just stick me with? What are you doing? It is a sedative. It is for your own good. Where is Maria? I ask. What have you done with her? He ignores my questions. As you know, the military, the company, tried to cover up this disaster. They tried to keep the entire outbreak a secret. They tried to cover up the death toll. They cut off Australia and shut down communication networks. They isolated the entire country, like it was sick. They kept the world in the dark. They kept the world in denial. Who are you? I am no one. I am nothing. You are the star. You told everyone the truth. You are the hero. And now everyone knows. Everyone. And now the whole world is looking for Maria Marsh. Where is she? Where? Again, he ignores my question. Do you know why they are looking for Maria? Yes, because she is immune. With her blood, they can make an antivirus. Stop the spread of infection. Stop the death toll. No, you are wrong. The whole world is looking because the whole world is scared. They are afraid. Fear is what motivates them. They do not care if the death toll rises, as long as they are safe, as long as they are inoculated, vaccinated. They do not care if the outbreak continues, as long as it does not continue near them. Fear is the reason they are looking for Maria. Of course people are scared, I say. They should be scared. Fear is like a spark. Fear will ignite a fire. I feel dizzy. I am struggling to process what he is saying. I am struggling to understand. The world has not seen the Oz virus, he says. Not like you and I have. No, they have been protected by their governments. They have been betrayed by their governments. But I will show them. I will show them the Oz virus, the mutations. I will show them Project Salvation. I will feed them fear. I will show them Maria. I will give them hope, and then I will take that hope away. I will destroy it right in front of their eyes. I am exhausted and weak, possibly hallucinating, 
possibly dying. It's hard to focus, hard to process what he just said. But as far as I could tell, he was going to execute Maria on camera. Record it for the world to see. I cannot let that happen. I have to do something. But what? What the hell am I supposed to do? When I destroy hope, he continues, the world will no longer be in denial. They will finally accept their fate. They will be free. I am alone. I have been starved and tortured and broken. But I need to stop this madman. I need to save Maria. We promised each other at the start of our journey. We promised that we would protect Maria at all costs. Everything else came second, including our own survival, we promised. And as I renew this promise to myself, and as the sedative continues to work its magic, and I slip in and out of consciousness, I realize I have two choices. I can curl up into a ball and die. Or I can live. I can fight. I can fight for Maria. I can fight for my friends. I'm pretty sure I'm dying. But I choose to fight. Chapter 1 Denial. This is where I'm at. I've been in this stage for a while now. Months. I was daydreaming. I had been doing this a lot lately. I dreamt I was sitting on a couch in a therapist's office. The person interviewing me and judging me was a Sigmund Freud inspired figment of my imagination. I told him, I'm in denial. I've been in denial for a long time. Our goal, our mission, was to evacuate Maria, save her, because she is immune to the Oz virus. We failed. Our group has been torn apart. We have no idea where Kenji is. He just disappeared. Ben, the big guy who saved our lives, has disappeared as well. Kim and Jack, we don't know where they are either. There's a chance Kim is now working with the military. We just don't know. And Daniel? Daniel had become sick, violently ill. We left him at his camp. At the Sigmund Freud lookalike scribbled something in a notepad. So now Maria and I are walking through the Australian outback, I continued. We are trying to find our friends. We have no idea where they are. We don't even know if they are alive. We are following a set of tank tracks that we think might lead somewhere. But we really don't know. We have hardly any water. Our food is all but gone. I looked at the therapist, waiting for some advice, waiting for some magical answer that would make me feel better about our current situation. But he didn't say anything. He just shook his head and checked his watch. Our time was up. Maria handed me a bottle of water, snapping me out of my daydream, bringing me back to reality, back to the desert. It was nighttime. The moon hung low in the sky. The stars were bright. Lunchtime, she said. Today we have hot water, a delicacy in some parts of the world. It was an attempt at humor. No, we had been walking through the desert for three days now. We had been walking at night, sleeping during the day. As a result, we had totally reversed our body clocks. The section of desert we were walking through was largely featureless. It offered no shelter. There were no large rocks or caves or dried up riverbeds. No trees, no shrubs. When we slept, we had to make our own shelter. We did this by digging ditches to sleep in. A foxhole is what Kenji had once called them. The first one we had to dig with our hands and our shoes. We loosened the dirt with our shoes and then dug the hole with our hands. It was awful and hard work, especially since we had to dig the ditch deep enough so that one side would provide shade. In the middle of the day, when the sun shone directly down on us, we would just cover ourselves with a t-shirt. It was hot and uncomfortable, but it was better than walking around in the heat. Walking around during the middle of the day was a one-way ticket to heat stroke and dehydration. A deadly combination in the Australian desert. Anyway, the second night, we found an abandoned car. It had broken down. It was out of fuel. The good thing was, in the trunk, we found a small garden shovel. After digging a ditch with your hands, digging a ditch with a shovel was an absolute luxury. It's the little victories, the little things that keep you going. We just had to ignore the fact that each time we dug a foxhole to sleep in, it felt like we were digging our own graves. We had to stay positive. How's your head? Maria asked. It's getting better, I think. 
I had suffered a pretty bad head wound back at the military outpost when we were attacked. Since then, I'd been getting headaches, and I'd get dizzy and have trouble with my vision. Although it could have been worse. Luckily, I was able to bandage it up, and it eventually stopped bleeding. I think it was finally starting to heal. I had a few mouthfuls of water and handed the bottle back to Maria. She placed it inside her backpack, and we kept walking. The sky was beginning to gray. The sun was beginning to rise. It was time to dig ourselves a bed. You know that saying? Maria said. What saying? It's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah. It's completely not true, she said, pointing to the eastern horizon. Look, if anything, the night is brightest just before dawn. The darkest part is the middle of the night. She had a point. Because we were out in the open, and it was just the two of us, we took turns keeping watch while the other slept. We were each other's guardians. Maria still had the protection of the NBC suit. She complained constantly that it was too hot to wear. It was getting uncomfortable and annoying. But I made her wear it. The suit was bulletproof and biteproof. It was essential. Although I eventually agreed to let her take it off in the middle of the day, since we'd be able to see any dangers coming from a distance. But at night, or when she was asleep, she had to wear it. Today, it was my turn to sleep first. But I had only slept for a few hours before Maria woke me up. She'd noticed it wasn't sunny. The sky was covered in dense gray clouds. It was the first cloudy day we had seen in weeks. We decided it would be best if we kept walking. It was a hard decision to make. We needed rest, but we also needed to cover ground. Jack had once said, Walking across the desert in the midst of a zombie apocalypse is not something to be taken lightly. He was so right. Eventually we came to a crossroad. Sort of. The tank tracks we had been following branched off. One set continued north. One set headed west. What do you think? Maria asked. Doesn't look like a tank, I answered. What? These tracks don't look like tank tracks. They're tire tracks, like a Jeep or a Humvee or something. So? I shrugged my shoulders. Why do you think they turned off? Maria asked. Don't know. I looked through the scope on our one and only rifle that Maria had taken from Daniel's camp. I saw something on the horizon, black, elongated. It could have been a building. It could have been a mirage. I pointed to the horizon. There's something out there. Something? A building, I think. Out here? Could be a mirage, I said. You think they went to check it out? She asked. Maybe. Should we check it out? I think we should stay with the tank tracks. Could be food. Water. Might be something else, I said. What do you mean? Well, I don't see any tracks coming back. But who knows how much further we have to walk, Maria said. We're running low on water. We can't afford to pass this up. It was simple, really. There might be water. There might be food. Or there might be death. We had a choice to make. If we made the wrong choice, we would die. How far do you think that is? Maria asked. A mile? Two? Won't take long, Maria said. We go and check it out and come straight back. I nodded. Okay. We can't afford to pass it up, she repeated. She was right. Chapter 2 we had been walking about 20 miles a night, and to pass the time we had been playing a couple of games to lift our spirits and boost morale. My favorite game was Life BZ. BZ stood for Before Zombies. Okay, tell me something about Kenji, Maria said. Like what? Anything. I thought about it for a second. Kenji went to Japan with his parents this one time when he was younger, I said after a while. He told me that they went to an all-you-can-eat restaurant. A self-serve all-you-can-eat restaurant. You mean like a buffet? Maria said. Like Sizzler? Better. Each table had its own built-in deep fryer. What? A deep fryer? Yeah. Built into the table? Yep. Like right in the table? Yes. No way. Yes way. Maria was shaking her head. She didn't believe me. 
Like with the hot oil and everything? Yeah. So basically you would load up your plate with food. Anything from meat, chicken, fish, shrimp, vegetables, whatever. Everything was on skewers. Then you would dip your food in egg yolk and then breadcrumbs. And then you would dip the skewer in the deep fryer. Leave it in there for a minute or two. And voila. Your food would be deep fried to a perfect golden crisp. Wow, Maria said. That sounds awesome. And kind of dangerous. Yeah, no kidding. I don't know how they make it work without people hurting themselves. It's like a major lawsuit waiting to happen, Maria agreed. Okay, your turn, I said. I can't. I'm still thinking about the deep fryer in the table. You have to. It's your turn. And the thought of deep fried food is making me hungry. Please talk about anything but food. All right. Let me think. She paused, trying to think of something. Okay, I got one. Lay it on me. I remember Jack's first ever surfing tournament. It was a couple of years ago now. This guy dropped in on his wave. Stole Jack's wave, which is against the rules. The guy was penalized and deducted points and everything. But that wasn't enough for Jack. He swam over to the guy and punched him in the head. Nearly knocked him out. Of course, then Jack was disqualified from the tournament. But he didn't care. He was there for the waves. For the love of it. And that guy stole his wave. A really, really good wave. That's all that Jack cared about. Maria trailed off lost in her own thoughts. She was smiling. He apologized to me the next day, she continued. He swore that he wasn't normally a violent person. But I didn't care. He's just so damn passionate, you know? I nodded. This is why Jack had run off into the desert to find his sister. He wasn't thinking about his own safety. I don't think he ever did. He was thinking with his heart. Screw the danger. Maria was about to say something else, but she stopped. What is it? I asked. She pointed to the overcast sky to birds circling off in the distance. Vultures, maybe. Or eagles. What the hell are those? Maria asked. I looked closer and realized they weren't birds. They're aircraft, I said. Predator drones. Like the one from the airport? Maria said. Yeah, I guess this means we're on the right track. Should we hide from it? Where would we hide? We looked around lazily. We were both so weak. There was nowhere to hide. I guess we could dig a hole to hide in, I said. Cover ourselves in dirt? This was our only option. But at that moment, we both knew there was no point in digging a hole and hiding from the drone. The drone had already seen us. So there was nothing to do but keep walking and just hope and pray that the damn thing wasn't armed with missiles. And that it wasn't going to blow us up. We kept walking at a brisk pace keeping one eye on the tire tracks and one eye on the sky. But the closer we got to the building, the more cautious we became. It appeared to be a barn of some sort. We crouched down to study the building and see if it was safe. We both agreed that we needed to get back to the tank tracks before nightfall. If we weren't back by the time the sun went down, we would lose our way and get lost, especially if the cloud cover remained. So far on our journey, the moonlight and the starlight had been bright enough to travel by. But on a dark night, with plenty of cloud cover, we would be lost within minutes. What do you think? I asked. Looks like a regular old barn. Maria was right. It looked like the tire tracks had led us to a barn full of hay and grain. I guess it was once used for feeding cattle. Must have been an important barn because it was absolutely packed full with hay. And there was a fuel pump out the front. Maybe the farmers or whoever used this place would fill up their vehicles here as well. And I guess that's why the soldiers had deviated off course and broken away from the main convoy. Fuel. I was starting to learn that a commodity like fuel was quickly becoming one of the most valuable things in this new world. It was right up there with food and water. It was worth dying for. I looked through the scope on my rifle again. I noticed that the ground surrounding the barn was absolutely covered in spears. I blinked, looked again. They weren't spears. They were harpoons, fired from a launcher, an experimental weapon. One that set up an electromagnetic pulse field. 
The weapon was designed to trap and disable rogue nanoswarms inside the EMP field. A nanoswarm was made up of microscopic robots, or nanobots, that were originally designed to fight the Oz virus. They were released into the atmosphere by the military in an operation called Project Salvation. But something had gone horribly wrong. The nanobots had done little to stop the Oz virus, and now the nanobots were acting outside of their original programming. They were forming rogue nanoswarms. These swarms were becoming aggressive, deadly, top of the food chain type predators, and the only way to stop them was with an electromagnetic pulse. There were hundreds of harpoons. They stuck into the desert ground like some sort of weird piece of art, and the fact that there were hundreds of these harpoons meant the soldiers here had come under attack by a very aggressive swarm, or maybe multiple swarms. There were two abandoned Humvees parked out the front of the barn, satellite dishes mounted on the roof, another EMP weapon. The Humvees were covered in black dust, and there were holes in their armor, like Swiss cheese, like the metal had been eaten by moths or caterpillars. What do you think happened here? Maria asked. Looks like these guys were low on fuel, I said. Or maybe they had been charged with loading up for the rest of the vehicles. They must have come under attack by a nanoswarm. Looks like it was a suicide mission, Maria said. We quickly realized this might not be a safe place. We moved ahead and then crouched down again, behind one of the Humvees. Watching. Listening. Oh my god, Maria said. What is that? She pointed to the ground, under the front tire of the Humvee. It was a wild dog. Mutated. The legs and its claws were enlarged and covered in blood. Its whole body was extremely muscular. The snout was also enlarged, and the teeth had grown almost right through the gums and jawbone, giving the impression that it was always growling and snarling, ready to bite and eat and kill. Maria was terrified of this thing, and I couldn't blame her. The thing was a nightmare. She eventually grabbed my arm, pulled me away from it. I must have been lost for a moment in my own world. Remembering that night at Daniel's camp, when we had been attacked by a whole pack of these monsters, we were nearly overrun. Luckily, the security of the camp, the sentry guns, and the electrical fence were enough to protect us. But if they had broken through, they would have killed us, eaten us alive. We moved closer to the barn. Keep your eyes out for a water source, I said. Maria nodded. On the side of the barn was a message a note written in blood and maybe charcoal. I had a dream about freedom, about a world on fire. I'm not sure what that meant. We walked through the harpoons. We had to squeeze through in some parts because they were so close together. Whoever had fired these harpoons had done so in a panic. We peered through the barn door. Apart from the hay, it was empty. Suddenly we heard voices. They sounded desperate. The voices were coming from the attic. As Torn Apart takes you through suspenseful twists, are you prepared to navigate your own path? Off-Grid Magazine stands ready with inspiring stories, practical survival strategies, and essential gear guides. Experience a world where the captivating saga of Torn Apart meets the raw challenges of survival. Your next adventure is waiting at Off-Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 3 as far as I could tell, the voices belonged to two men. They were talking to each other. We couldn't make out what they were saying. There's someone up there, I said, pointing to the barn attic. Alive? I think so. Infected? Maybe. What do you think? They could have information, Maria said. They could have answers. Only one way to find out? I made sure my rifle was loaded made sure the safety was off. We made our way inside the barn and we slowly climbed up the ladder that led to the attic. Not surprisingly, the attic was also full of hay. Sitting amongst the hay were two men. I couldn't tell if they were soldiers or civilians. They were covered in blood and black dust and red dust. They were both sitting down. They were sitting directly across from each other. They were barely alive. One of them was holding a handgun. We stepped up and into the attic of the barn. 
We were standing in the doorway, but they ignored us completely. Now, the unarmed guy was sitting down against a stack of hay. Do it, he said. I'm ready. The guy with the gun aimed it, finger on the trigger. Whoa, hold up, I said. What the hell is going on? Stay back, they both said at the same time. The man with the gun took the shot. No hesitation. He put the bullet right between the other guy's eyes. I guess he was infected. Stay back, the man repeated. What are you doing? I asked. Are you infected? Was he infected? I'm dying. He was dying. We drew straws. I lost. It was my duty to put him out of his misery. The man was holding a revolver, an old cowboy-style revolver. He put the barrel of the gun against the underside of his chin. He squeezed the trigger. Click. He looked at the gun. Heartbroken. He swore. He felt around his pockets, searching each one. Slowly. Clumsily. His fingers and most of his hands were black, like he was suffering from frostbite. What are you looking for? Maria asked. I'm gone, the man answered. I'm too far gone. Have you been bitten? No, but the swarm got to us. It's hard to breathe, can't move my legs. His fingers were black. His skin was discolored and bruised, like he had been beaten, like he was bleeding internally. His muscles, his neck muscles and shoulders and mouth were twitching. What are you doing out here? I asked. I know, right? He answered. Why would anyone come out here? He paused. Before the world ended, I was a FIFO worker. A what? FIFO. Fly in, fly out. I worked all over the outback. South Australia, Northern Territory, Western Australia, Queensland. Lived in Melbourne. Was hardly ever home. Had a girlfriend. A great girl. She was too good for me. Treated me like a king. And I... I didn't treat her like anything. I cheated on her so many times. I didn't even think twice about it. I just, I couldn't stop. Do you believe in karma? Am I being punished? I just hope she didn't suffer. Melbourne. Ben told us that when they lost control, when the virus took over, they started hurting people together like cattle. Killing people like cattle. Did she suffer? Probably. Too far gone, he repeated. What are you looking for? I asked again. A bullet. He then leant to the side and threw up. The vomit was black, like oil. He looked up at us, at me, looked at the rifle in my hands. Hey, that thing loaded? That's a military-grade rifle. Where the hell did you get that? No way you're a soldier. I found it. Finders keepers, he whispered, struggling to speak. That's the way it is now. I guess so. He tossed the revolver over to me. It landed at my feet. Take it. Who knows? Maybe you will find some bullets for it. Maria leant down and picked it up. It's kinda heavy for a small handgun. Take this as well, he said, as he produced a hand grenade. It's not much, but it might help. Is that an EMP grenade? I asked. Impressive. How do you know that? You must have been through some shit. I nodded. You could say that. He dropped the grenade accidentally and it rolled away from him. His fingers tensed up and twitched. God damn, it's getting worse. I wanted to tell this guy that everything was going to be all right. I think it was just a reflex, trying to comfort someone in pain. But the truth was, everything was not going to be all right. Especially not for this guy. What happened here? I asked, even though I had a pretty good idea of what happened but I figured if I could get this guy talking, it might keep him alive just a little bit longer. It might take his mind off the pain. We were ambushed, he said. It was waiting for us in the barn. It was hiding. It knew. It? The swarm. Took us by surprise. Two more flanked us. Surrounded us. They were so fast. Too damn fast. There was nothing we could do. We couldn't get a clear shot. Not with three of them out there. We couldn't trap them. Were you part of the tank convoy that came through here? I asked. Eight days, he whispered, ignoring my question. Eight goddamn days. Longer than a week. You can't be gone longer than a week. You're gone a week. You're gone for good. What are you talking about? 
I guess because it was a rescue mission, I figured we'd be out of harm's way. Not like volunteering to go out with the recon teams. Survival rate for those missions was practically zero. There was a rumor floating around that the teams would use civilians as bait. Can you believe that? Yeah, I could. Bait? Maria asked. For what? For the infected, and the other things, and the black clouds. That's what got us. They hunted us down. It's the only way to describe it. I wonder if the swarms got the rest of the convoy before they made it back. So you were part of the convoy? I repeated. Yeah, we went to a small town, not far from here, about a hundred miles or so. Apparently, the Special Forces soldiers had vital intel from the surveillance drones. Apparently, they had identified a target. I don't know who the target was. They never tell us civilians anything. There was a rumor going around about a girl, immune to the Oz virus. This is why I volunteered. I wanted to help. If there really was someone immune to the virus, then we needed to go and get them. Make sure they were safe. But we didn't find a girl. We found a guy. A teenager. He was alone. Dehydrated. Jack, Maria whispered under her breath. The man looked down at his hands. He tried to move his fingers. I can't believe we risked all this for one kid. So many people died on this mission. I'm starting to think they left us to die out here on purpose. So where did they take this guy? Maria asked, desperate for any information. Desperate for answers. Back to base. Apparently he was still considered important. They wanted to use him. He shook his head again. Don't know why. Doesn't make sense. It did make sense, I thought. They had surveillance of Jack, and Kim must have known about it somehow. If I had to guess, I'd say she would have convinced the powers to be, the military commanders and Dr. Hunter, that Jack was worth saving. I'm such an idiot, the man said. Should have stayed low. I was wrong. There is no hope left. Not in the desert. Not out here. Not anywhere. He was grimacing in pain. I noticed he had a barcode on his wrist. Like the dreadlocked woman. Like Ben. What's the deal with the barcode? I asked. He looked at his wrist. That was my ticket to freedom. It's irrelevant now. It's useless. I was a guest. Now I'm an outcast. I don't know why I volunteered. So stupid. I should have kept my mouth shut. Although I suppose we are all screwed now. Code Black. It's over. Code Black? I said. Yeah. Can you believe it? How does this keep happening? What the hell is a Code Black? Maria asked. What are you talking about? The man retrieved a small walkie-talkie from his top pocket. Shh. Listen. He turned it on. Fiddled with the knobs. Tuned it to a specific frequency. We heard a soothing female voice. Emotionless. Almost robotic. It was a recorded message. A code black has been issued for the following areas. Residential. And research. That is all. Code black initiates lockdown procedure and evacuation. Please be advised of evacuation protocol. The time for evacuation has expired. Code black. Code black. Code black. The message repeated again and again, over and over. I got the impression that the message had been playing for a while, like a broken record. Then we heard another voice, a male voice. He was calm and serene like the recorded voice, but with more authority and more menace. It was not a recording. Turn that off, the voice said. Tell the men there will be no evacuation. Tell the men there is no turning back. We will win this war. We do not need an army. We only need the brave, the committed. Who is that? Maria asked. The man held up his black fingers, telling us to be quiet. He had a look of anger and concentration on his face. I want napalm, the voice said. Lots of napalm. Napalm, sir, inside? Yes, lots of napalm. We need to burn it. Burn the air. Static took over, and the voices faded away. The man's hand seized up and he dropped the walkie-talkie. See? It's over. Code black. The entire residential area is in lockdown. Same with the research area. They were working on a cure. I guess they failed. Another goddamn containment failure. How? How does this keep happening? This virus is pure death. Blood began bubbling out of his lips as he spoke. His voice sounded rough and coarse, 
like his voice box had been dragged over a gravel road. He was dying. Who was that? Maria asked. On the radio? That was General Spears. He's in charge. General Spears? I asked. Wait, was that transmission? Was that coming from the fortress? Yeah, I'd never thought the fortress would be compromised. It had been an oasis in this desert. An oasis in this goddamn apocalypse. But if we can hear the transmission, I said, that means it has to be close, right? The man shook his head. Doesn't matter. You heard the message. Code black, lockdown, it's over. No one gets in. No one. What is a code black? Maria asked. Code black is infection. An outbreak. How? The fortress is so goddamn secure. How the hell did the virus get loose? They have so many security measures. So many fail safes. Are we close? I asked. Do you know where it is? He nodded. Yeah, you're close. Less than a day. But you won't find it. Hell, I wouldn't even be able to find it. And you should stay the hell away from it. You heard. Code black. Lockdown. It's all over. See? He said, pointing out the barn window. What? He's watching. Maria and I moved slowly over to the window. We had to look really hard and shield our eyes from the dull glare of the overcast sky. And even then, the damn thing looked like a bird. A large eagle. But it wasn't. It was the predator drone we had seen earlier. There's one of the drones, the man said. They are always watching. He is always watching. But he doesn't send help. He never sends help. We have to find it, I said. We have friends there. We need to get them out. No, forget them. They're already dead. I stepped forward. We are not leaving them behind. Tell us where it is. His head drooped forward. No. Tell me. Where is it? I leant down, grabbed his collar. Look at me. Where's the goddamn fortress? Rebecca, calm down, Maria said. No, I will not calm down. This guy is going to tell me where the fortress is or else. Or else what? She asked. I'll ask the hard way. Ben taught me a few things. I can ask pretty hard. I shook him by the collar again. Do you want that? Rebecca, stop. Look at him. He's dying. He's been through hell. Just then, I thought I saw a black mark move under his collarbone, into his chest, like a moving bruise or a shadow or something. I let go of him and jumped back. His shoulders seemed to spasm and twitch. The man's eyes rolled back into his skull. He was gone. Chapter 4 We were back to square one. We would have to find the tank tracks again. Keep following them. Hopefully, they would lead somewhere. Hopefully, they weren't just leading us to our deaths. What the hell was that? I asked about the moving bruise. Did you see that? See what? Maria said. And I moved towards him again and pulled his shirt collar down so I could see his shoulder and his chest. His skin was kind of gray. I could see his ribs, and his collarbone was sticking out, like he was malnourished or anorexic. No black mark, though. Should you be so close to him? Maria asked. I don't think that's safe. That's exactly how I was bitten, remember? Good point. I made sure my rifle was loaded and took a step back. I pointed the barrel directly at his head. Do you want to say a few words? Don't know, Maria answered. It's hard to say something when you don't know them. We only spoke a few words. He seemed like a good man, someone who would give his life for another. I don't know how or why he is dead when we are not. I just don't know. After a while, she said, May God, or someone, have mercy on his soul. Have a good journey. Have a good journey? Yeah. You know, to the other side or wherever. We didn't know if he was infected, but it was better to be safe than sorry. We were going to make sure that he didn't turn. That he didn't come back. So I put a bullet in his brain. We were about to climb down from the attic of the barn when I noticed the harpoon launcher that they had used when they were under attack from the nano swarms. It was next to the window. I moved over to it and picked it up. I saw the name of the manufacturer on the barrel. Yoshida Corp. I traced the name with my finger. What is it? Maria asked. 
I showed her the weapon, showed her the name. Yoshida is Kenji's surname. Yoshida Corp. is his father's company. What do you think it means? She asked. What do you think happened to Kenji? I don't know. Don't want to think about it. Again, I must have drifted off into my own little world, because the next thing I know, Maria had taken the prototype weapon off me. She placed it on the ground and led me out of the barn. We need to stay positive, she said. We need to stay strong. I nodded my head. She was right. We still had a job to do. We had a mission. I needed to be strong for Maria. Time to get back to business. Come on, Maria said. It's getting dark. We need to make it back to the tracks before dark. We began walking. Maria was deep in thought. Her forehead, her entire brow was all scrunched up. What is it? I asked. It's nothing. Actually, I'm not sure. It's just that the way that guy was throwing up black vomit, it reminded me of Daniel. He was so sick. It was scary, she said, taking a deep breath. Do you think he's still alive? To be honest, I don't know. But I do know that he is one tough dude. And plus, he was at his camp, his base. That means if his people are looking for him, that's the first place they'll look. That's the first thing they teach in survival school, isn't it? What is? Stay with the camp. Stay with the car or boat or plane or whatever. You've got a better chance of being found. If you go walking off, you're screwed. Maria nodded, thinking it over. But that's exactly what we did. We walked off. We walked off into the Australian outback. We had no choice. We have to find our friends. We have to get you to the safety of the fortress. But I'm worried, Maria continued. You heard what that guy said. Code black. Lockdown. The entire residential area and the research lab. What if this place is overrun? We heard those voices, right? So we know there are survivors. And we saw the surveillance drone. Someone is remote piloting that thing. Trust me, this is where we will find Jack. And Kim. It has to be. We have to keep going. The sun continued to set. The sky was still overcast. As we walked back to the tank tracks, I looked back at the barn. I don't know why I looked back. I just did. It was like a reflex. Like I could sense something or someone. And as I looked back, I could have sworn someone was standing in the window of the barn, looking at us. I was so shocked, I lost my footing. I stumbled and tripped over a rock. When I got to my feet and looked back, the figure was gone. Are you all right? Maria asked as she helped me to my feet. Yeah. I just thought, I thought I saw someone. What? Someone in the window. The man, I said. I could barely form whole sentences. There was a shadow, a figure, a silhouette. He was standing in the window, looking at us, watching us. Maria looked back at the barn, squinting her eyes. There's nothing there. I rubbed my head. It still throbbed and ached. Maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me. The desert playing tricks on me. I hoped so. Let's get out of here, I said. Let's go. Chapter 5 The cloud cover remained, so when nighttime arrived we could not see a damn thing. It was too dark. No moonlight, no starlight. We dug a foxhole and slept during the night taking turns at keeping watch. I don't think either of us got much sleep. The next day, the cloud cover had dissipated. But it was early in the morning, and we figured we should get a move on. It would be best if we got back to the tank tracks, just in case. As we walked, Maria kept asking me and interrogating me about Ben. The things he had done. She was worried about me. After I lost my cool yesterday, she thought I was becoming violent. Maybe she was right. Tell me, she said. No. Just tell me. Why? You never told me. That's why. And that Maria was pestering me about the scene in the church in the town of Hope. The murder scene. The scene of torture. Justice, according to Ben. Why do you want to know? I asked. Because it's important, she answered. No, it's not. It is. It's important because it symbolizes where we're at. The reality. 
The scene flashes in my mind every now and then, like lightning. Maybe it would be better to talk about it. Talk about Ben. Big Ben. He was part maniac, part hero. He had saved Maria and me from a certain death. And then he had killed the priest, Father Damon, and his men. He had killed them with his bare hands. He had tortured four men, four that I'm sure of. He might have tortured more. Maria wants to know the specifics, the gory details. I don't know why. Just tell me, she said again. The truth is, Big Ben may have been crazy. The truth is, we owe him our lives. The truth is, he crucified the priest, strung him up above the altar in the church. If I had to guess, I'd say he probably enjoyed it. You don't want to know, I said. Yes, I do. I took a deep breath. Fine, I'll tell you. I was about to tell her all the gory details, the part how the priest's arms were stretched out, his shoulders dislocated, how his neck was at this impossible and awkward angle, how his skin from his back was flayed and spread out like angel wings. I was about to tell Maria all of this, but I didn't. I stopped walking. The tank tracks had disappeared. Chapter 6 We both stopped immediately. The tank tracks had disappeared. We were officially screwed. We were in the middle of the desert. Barely any food. Barely any water. We both looked around frantically. Fear took a firm grip in my chest. The dusty dirt red ground was barren. It offered no answers. The only thing in the immediate area was a waist-high black metallic pole that stuck up out of the desert. I walked up to it. What is this? I asked with fear and anger in my voice. What the hell is this? Maria just shook her head. I don't know. I kicked the pole out of frustration. It was secured firmly in the ground. We are screwed. Don't say that. We don't have enough water to make it back. How much do you have? I asked Maria as I wriggled out of my own backpack and checked my water supply. I had one bottle and one canteen left. Maria, how much water do you have left? Maria didn't answer. Hey, what's that? She asked. What's what? She pointed. Behind the pole. I looked. There was what appeared to be a square patch of carpet, covered in dust and dirt. The piece of carpet was covering a small ditch, like someone had hastily dug a hole to bury something and then had tried to hide it. I leant over and picked up the dirty piece of carpet. What I saw was enough to make me feel sick, and I should have taken it as a warning sign from a higher power to get the hell out of there. Turn back. Run! It was a ditch of severed hands. All the fingers were clawed in rigor mortis. The hands had been severed just above the wrist, about halfway up the forearm. The hands were all dusty. They were covered in blood that was dried and cracked and brown. On the inside of each wrist was a barcode. Maria took a step back. What the hell? What is this? What's going on? She put her hand up to her mouth. She looked like she was going to be sick. I don't know, I whispered. It was all I could say. I put the piece of carpet back, covering the ditch of hands. This was a bad sign. The fear that had taken hold in my chest was spreading to the rest of my body. The tracks we had been following were gone. We had hoped they would lead us to the fortress. Or to another outpost. Or to a town. Or something. But they hadn't. They had led us out into the middle of nowhere. To a metal pole and a ditch of severed hands. We had taken a gamble. A huge risk. We had risked our lives. And we had lost. Where did the tracks go? Maria asked. Where did the tanks go? I don't know, I repeated. They didn't just disappear. But they did. Where did they go? She asked. Why is there a ditch of severed hands? Maria shouted the questions at me and at the desert. She was scared and freaking out, and so was I. We had walked off into the desert with no real plan other than to follow these goddamn tank tracks. And now? they had disappeared. I was about to tell her to calm down, that we needed to think rationally and figure this shit out and plan our next move. But I never got the chance. Suddenly we heard a weird noise. A pop hiss. Something small like a can of soda came flying and smoking towards us. And then another. 
We immediately began choking. Tears filled my eyes. I dropped to my knees, trying to cover my face. My throat and my eyes and my nose were on fire. I couldn't see properly, but someone or something emerged from the dusty desert ground. Emerged. And uh, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like they were hiding in the dirt. Under the ground. Waiting. Waiting for what? For us? Get down! A voice growled. Drop the rifle. Do not run. Do not move. You move. You die. Every chapter in Torn Apart unveils a thrilling new challenge. Ready to face your own? Let Off Grid Magazine be your guide. Brimming with gripping tales, expert survival tips, and the latest gear, Off Grid Magazine transforms readers into adventurers. Embark on a journey where the intense drama of Torn Apart collides with real-world survival. Your adventure begins with Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 7 Maria and I had both fallen to our knees. Our faces were covered in tears and snot. A man was standing over us. He had a shotgun pointed directly at our heads. He appeared to be a soldier. He was wearing desert camouflage fatigues. He had a huge, overgrown beard. It was big and wild and unkempt. It was knotted and full of dust and twigs from the desert brush. The exposed sections of his skin were red. His eyes were bloodshot. He kicked away my rifle and then he began talking to himself and rambling. They killed everyone else, he said. The general cleansed the fortress, cured the ranks of weakness. He is a great man. Please don't hurt us, I blurted out. We're looking for our friends. In the desert? he asked. Yeah, we were following the tank tracks, Maria said. Haven't you heard? There is nothing in the desert. Nothing but death and heat and pressure. Nothing is out here. Not even the fortress. Code black. Lockdown. Do you know where it is? I asked. Of course I do, he said as he spread his arms out wide. It is all around us. What is in that ditch? Maria asked. The severed hands. What happened? Never you mind, little girl. Best forget about the hands. They're watching. They are always watching. What the hell was this guy talking about? Who were watching? The hands were watching? Did you do that? I asked. Did you cut? I trailed off. I couldn't even ask the question. No, he answered. Someone else did that. Someone who knew. Someone without conscience. Someone who either is prepared to do whatever it takes to survive, or enjoys doing whatever it takes to survive. This guy wasn't making a whole lot of sense. And he looked sick. Not infected with the Oz virus, but just sick. Malnourished. Sunburnt. Suffering from next-level heat stroke. The general exiled me, he said. He had his reasons. The desert. The heat. The pressure. Before it kills you, it changes you. Hey, Blondie. Give me a look at your face. He grabbed Maria by the hair and studied her face. He turned on a small computer screen attached to the inside of his left wrist. It was similar to the control panel on the NBC suit, but not as sleek. It looked like an earlier model or something. Yeah, this is you all right, he said, as a smile crept across his dusty, cracked lips. Yeah, boys, today is our lucky day. I thought she looked familiar. It's her. It's Maria Marsh. Check your intel report. It's her, man. I looked at Maria worriedly. Who the hell was he talking to? He showed us the small computer screen on his wrist. See? There was a picture on the computer monitor. It was a picture of Maria. A school photo from last year. She had a radiant smile. A bright blue ribbon in her hair. This is our ticket out of here, he said to, I'm not sure who. Or, at the very least, back into the fortress. The general has gotta let us back in now, right? What are you talking about? I asked. What do you mean? I'm not supposed to tell anyone. It's highly classified intelligence, you know? It's above top secret. Maria Marsh, female. Approximately 16 years old. Medium height, blonde, blue eyes. She is reportedly immune to the Oz virus. I personally don't believe it. 
but it doesn't matter what I believe. So the military is looking for Maria? I asked. Of course, the whole world is looking for Maria Marsh. Well, here I am, Maria said. You found me. I'll gladly help. I want to help. With your blood, we can manufacture an antivirus, he said. Make a fortune. Just imagine it. Any country or government that doesn't buy it off us, we will release the virus in their population. I guarantee they'll buy it after that. Just imagine it. What we could do. I mean, just imagine the amount of money you could charge for this vaccine. And they'll pay. They'll all pay. He then started singing an extremely disturbing version of Imagine by John Lennon. How the hell have you survived for this long? The man asked after he had stopped singing. And what are you wearing? This is an NBC suit, Maria answered. It has saved my life more than once. Never seen anything like it. Although it's kind of like mine. Land warrior system. Officially, the program was scrapped. Unofficially, it was taken to the next level. Cloud-based technology. Godlike. Omnipresent. All-knowing, all-seeing. How do you think the general sees all? The general, he was in charge down here. I mean, he is in charge. Not was. He is in charge. Yeah, that's what I said. He is in charge down here. The man looked around quickly, as though he was about to be hit or punched. He even looked over his shoulder. He was spooked. From the moment of the outbreak, he continued, the moment the virus spread its tentacles across the country, he was in charge. He took charge. He never backed down. He ordered the nuclear strike. Man, the stones on this guy. He is brilliant. The conviction. The belief he has in himself. It is pure genius. And now he is preparing for a long, drawn-out war. A war for survival. He will win. He will. You want to know why? We didn't get a chance to answer his question. We didn't get a chance to say anything. This guy was talking crazy. He was rambling. I'll tell you why. It's because he is prepared. He is 100% prepared. He will do anything and everything. He is not afraid. He has a mastery of fear and a mastery of death. I've never seen anything like it. Never. The soldier spoke fast. Too fast to keep up with everything he was saying. Let alone understand everything he was saying. It must be the heat stroke, I thought. Either that, or he was on some serious drugs. Some say he's crazy. Some say he's acting on his own. I mean, sure, the military discharged him. Took away their resources, cut us off, cut Australia off. But everything he has done. Everything. It has been for the greater good. He's not acting on his own. How can you say that when his actions are for the survival of the human race? You can't say it. And you shouldn't dare say it. Lest he hears you. And believe me, he hears everything. He is watching. He's always watching. Why do you think I'm out here? He knew. I had a moment of weakness. I wasn't thinking straight. I questioned him. And he was listening. The one time I slipped. The one time I spoke out of line. He was listening. And watching. And this one time, he comes at me. Stronger. Louder. More severe than usual. He banished me. Although, I guess I should consider myself lucky that he didn't kill me. That he didn't shoot me. That he didn't cut off my head. That he didn't hang me up in the mess hall for everyone to see. That he didn't put my head on a stick for everyone to see. So yeah, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones. But I'll make it up to him. You'll see. I'll make it up to him. I'm strong. I'm loyal. I am a soldier. I served in the Middle East. I never asked questions. Not even up in those Afghan mountains. Not when the shit hit the fan. Not after the first outbreak. Not when we lost control at Woomera. I have served until the very end. And this is how they treat me? He began pacing back and forth in front of us. We were on our knees in the desert. Alone in the desert. The tank tracks had disappeared. But they had led us to a mad soldier. Someone who had been banished from his team. His words. His movements were wild. His eyes were wild. He was heavily armed. It looked like he was prepared to last a few days on his own. Maybe a week. Please don't hurt us, I said. We came here looking for help. We came here to find someone. We all came here to find someone, he answered. 
We are all looking for someone, searching, and my search is over. I have been rewarded. I found you, Maria Marsh, the one, the only. You're a goddess, you know that? You're an angel, the savior. I'm certain some of the guys fell in love with you the moment they saw your photo. How could they not? You represented everything that is good with the world, everything that is worth fighting for. You represented hope and innocence to these men, these men who are not innocent and never will be. You were something worth saving because you could save us. Do you see? That is why you're an angel. That is why you're a goddess. And now the general will have to let me back in. Now that I have you. How? I asked. How do we get in? Where is this place? It is far. It is big, he said as he looked up to the desert sky again. We need to contact him. Get his attention. He is always watching. He sees all. But first, we need to hide you. We need you out of harm's way. It is too dangerous out here. He bent down and picked up a chain that was hidden in the dust. The chain was attached to a trap door. There was a keypad on the door. He punched in a code and opened it up. A ladder led straight down into darkness. We must have come across another outpost, I thought. Or a bunker or something. Maybe this is where he was getting his supplies from. Food and water and ammo. There must be hundreds of these bunkers hidden all over the desert. Where are you taking her? I asked. He ignored me and retrieved a black hood and two plastic zip ties from one of his pockets on his vest. He tied my hands together, and then tied Maria's hands together in front of her body, and slipped the black hood over her head. Go, he said to Maria. Start climbing. You stop. I shoot. And then you'll get to the bottom real fast. You catch my meaning? Shoot? He was just talking about how she was a goddess? You won't shoot her, I said trying to call his bluff. You need her. We all need her. Doc never said nothing about getting her alive, but I don't feel like carrying you all the way back. We got a long way to go, especially now the trains are out. I can't see, Maria said. How do you expect me to climb? You don't need to see where you're going. Just hold on real tight. You just need to climb straight down. It's a piece of cake. Now if you fall, you will fall to your death. It is a long way straight down. A long way. So you better hold on tight. When you reach the bottom, you wait. You stay quiet. Like a good girl. The door is locked. Can't open it from the inside. You should be safe. But you stay quiet just to be sure. You never know what is lurking in those tunnels. He helped Maria onto the ladder. She began climbing. Maria, be strong, I said. It's going to be okay, she answered. She was trying to be strong. She was trying to be brave. But I could see her knees and hands shaking. I could hear her voice tremble. She began the climb. A few seconds later, the mad soldier slammed the trapdoor shut. He looked at me with his wild eyes, and I knew he was going to kill me. If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a jolly good favor and subscribe? It's a marvelous way to help us bring you oodles more free audiobooks. Now, back to the story. Chapter 8 The mad soldier stared at me for a few seconds. His eyes were glazed over. When nuclear weapons were first invented, he said, they tested the effects of them on humans. They would chain up prisoners and criminals and test subjects. They would put them at various distances from ground zero. The people closest to the blast would be incinerated and vaporized immediately. Further out, they would be burnt to a crisp. And even further out than that, they would still be burnt. But they would survive. At least they would survive for a few days. Over the course of a few days, or a week, they would slowly die from their burns or from radiation poisoning. Some would take longer. Some lived long enough to develop cancer. What is worse? I don't know. Please, I begged. I can help. I said I could help even though I wasn't entirely sure that I could. He had Maria. She was all he needed. But all of that, he continued, ignoring my plea. All of that pales in comparison to what is going on down here. Down here, in this place, in this desert, it is hell. And General Spears is the devil. Don't get me wrong. He is a brilliant man. A genius, really. 
but don't you dare cross him. You don't do it. It is better his way. He looked up to the sky. Now, where is that goddamn drone? I know he's watching. He spun around, looking, searching, and shielding his eyes from the sunlight. Where are you? I found her. I have the goddess. I have Maria Marsh. You have to let me in. There was something I didn't see before. A short distance away from the trap door was a whole bunch of severed hands, arranged in a message. The message said, Let me in. Big letters. Big enough to be seen from the sky. He was now arranging more hands. Another message. It took him about ten minutes to get the severed hands in the right position. I have Maria Marsh. Please, I said again. Maria wants to help. Believe me. She does but she will be more likely to cooperate if I'm there with her. She won't fight you. She won't struggle if I'm there. The mad soldier looked up to the sun, stared at the sun. After a few minutes, he lowered his gaze. And when he looked at me, his eyes were unfocused and bloodshot. His pupils were pinpoints. No, he whispered. I'm sorry. You cannot be allowed to live. The general would not want it. He doesn't like weakness. He doesn't like outsiders. I'm not weak. I will help. I will. He took out a knife. He held it up. And I knew he was going to do it. He was brandishing the knife, waving it back and forth like an evil and crazy conductor. I looked away and focused on the desert horizon. Adrenaline surged in my chest and made me feel sick. I remembered this one time, when me and Jack and Maria went fishing in this isolated cove of Sydney Harbor. Well... It was supposed to be isolated and protected. The wind picked up in the afternoon. The swell picked up. We were only in a small boat. It started rocking back and forth. I immediately felt seasick. Jack told me to stare at the horizon. Pick out one spot and focus on it. Maria caught a fish. Big enough to eat for dinner. Jack scaled it and gutted it, which made me feel even worse. But the longer I stared at the horizon, the better I felt. So. As the mad soldier brandished a hunting knife and looked at his teeth in the reflection of the blade, I stared at the horizon. I picked out one spot. A small black mark on the horizon. I saw a shape, a dark blob. I felt less nauseous. And then I heard a gunshot. It was faded and distant. The noise echoed across the desert. Two seconds later, the knife fell at my side and stuck into the dirt. Blood dripped down the blade. It was not mine. I looked up. The mad soldier was holding the side of his neck, like a mosquito had bitten him. He was confused. He took his hand away. Blood spurted out in a huge red arc, spraying the desert ground. He looked at his hand. It was completely red. And then his head snapped backwards. Suddenly, and violently. And he fell to the ground. I looked back to the horizon. The dark blob was getting closer. I realized the mad soldier had been shot in the head. It was an expert shot. By a marksman. A sniper. Kenji? The shape moved closer. It was a man. A man with a gun. A rifle. It had to be Kenji, I thought. It had to be. The shadow moved closer, coming for me. It was a man. A large man. Wide. Tall. It was not Kenji. It was Ben. Chapter 9 Ben cut me free with the mad soldier's hunting knife, saving my life for the second time. I tried to thank him, but he just ignored me. I mean it, I said. I really am grateful. I don't know how to repay you. I don't think I'll ever be able to repay you. My father once told me that you should do things for people that they can never pay you back for, Ben said. You should do these things as often as possible. He paused, as if remembering something. Besides, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Don't thank me. Thank your lucky stars. And this guy was obviously a psycho, pushed over the edge. So what the hell are you even doing here? What happened back at the outpost? Have you seen Kenji? I'm here because I'm pissed off. I'm here for my revenge. It's selfish, really. What? The people in charge. They took something from me. What did they take? My life. My freedom. 
Ben knelt down over the mad soldier and relieved him of his shotgun. He also took his sidearm and several magazines of ammunition. He handed me one for my rifle. He threw away the hunting rifle he had used to shoot the soldier with. It was out of ammo. His movements were slow but methodical, almost mechanical, like he was working and moving on autopilot or something. I noticed that Ben did not look good at all. He looked pale and weak. I had to remind myself that he had been unconscious back at the outpost. He had undergone emergency surgery to remove a bullet from his chest. He was obviously not fully recovered. He continued to search the pockets of the dead soldier, picking him clean. In the soldier's vest, he found a couple of energy bars. Here, eat this, he said, as he handed me one of the bars. Don't know when we will get another chance to eat. I took the energy bar, but I wasn't hungry. I still felt sick. How did you get out? I asked again. What happened back at the outpost? Did Kenji make it out? Don't know. I woke up. Pain in my chest. Heard the alarm. I got out of there. You get a feeling in your gut. A cold, sinking, awful feeling. You come to trust that feeling. Trust it with your life. So you don't know where Kenji is? You don't know where he went? You don't know if he made it out? No, I'm sorry. The place was abandoned. I heard the alarm. I got the hell out of there. I figured you people had done the same. We came back for you. We wouldn't just leave you. Whatever. Doesn't matter. It's in the past. How did you get here? How did you find us? I just followed the tracks. Same as you, I guess. I wasn't looking for you. Oh. The mad soldier also had an automatic rifle slung over his back. It was similar to the one I was carrying. I picked it up and offered it to Ben, but he didn't want it. Don't like automatic weapons. They jam. I'll stick with the shotgun. It's got plenty of stopping power, and I've got a feeling we're going to need stopping power. We need to get Maria first, I said. She is all that matters. We need to get down there. I pointed to the trap door. Ben was already moving, one step ahead. He pulled up the chain that was attached to the trap door. He looked at the manhole. He shook his head. No good. Need a password. And we can't ask him. Dead men tell no tales. So what now? He moved over to the ditch of severed hands. He started looking through them, tossing them aside. What are you doing? Looking for a key. A key? Yeah. He picked up a hand that looked less dirty than the others. Fresher. He moved the fingers back and forth. Now what are you doing? I asked. Checking for rigor mortis. The keys have a time limit. This one is still fresh. He moved over to the pole and moved the hand in front of it. It's a scanner, he said. Reads the barcode. He scanned the barcode on the wrist of the severed hand back and forth. Nothing happened. So the barcode is the key, I said. Bingo. Wait, don't you have a barcode? On your wrist? I saw it. He showed me his wrist. The barcode was gone. It was replaced with a messy scar. It was inflamed and swollen. Someone took it. Need to find another one. The barcode was the key, I thought to myself. The dreadlocked woman in the creek bed? She had one. Ben had one. And someone took it. Someone cut it off his wrist. Someone who knew they needed a key. He kicked away a few hands, found a small square piece of fabric or sandpaper or something. Well, look what we have here, he said, as he held up the small rectangular piece of fabric. He held it up to the sunlight. And that's when I saw what it was. It wasn't a piece of fabric. It wasn't a piece of sandpaper. It was a piece of skin. A piece of skin with a barcode tattooed onto it. Wait, what is this place? I asked. He showed me his forearm again. It was burnt and disfigured. He showed me how the square piece of the skin fit into place on his arm. This is the fortress. Chapter 10 What? I asked in disbelief. This is the fortress? Yeah. Well, where the hell is it? It's underground. Underground? The whole thing? Ben nodded. 
This is why the dreadlocked woman and why Ben had said we would never find the fortress. It was hidden. Off the grid. It was underground. And what the hell is that? I asked, referring to the square piece of skin. He showed me his forearm again. My barcode. My access code. This should work. Who did that to you? Who cut it off you? Don't know. I woke up. I was bleeding from my arm. I was bleeding bad. Tried to stop it, but several veins and the artery had been cut. Had to burn them to seal all the vessels shut. Burn it? With what? A blowtorch. I shook my head. I could not even imagine the amount of pain that would cause. Taking a blowtorch to an open wound? Voluntarily? It made me feel sick just thinking about it. But I suppose the alternative was bleeding to death. Sometimes I got the feeling that Ben was a machine or a god. Or maybe he just didn't feel pain the way normal humans did. Who the hell would do that? Who cut? Who... I couldn't finish the sentence. It was too much. Someone had severed all these hands. Maybe hundreds. Someone who knew they needed a key, the barcode, to get inside the fortress. There were so many hands. Was it the crazy soldier, or was it someone else? Where are the bodies? I asked. Ben shrugged his shoulders. Don't know. They've either been eaten, or they have turned. Eaten? By the nano swarms. By wild dogs. The fact that there are no bones here suggests maybe the nanoswarms got to them. Or maybe someone buried them or hid them somewhere else. He was cleaning his own piece of skin, carefully brushing the dirt off. He moved over to the pole and scanned the barcode back and forth. He did this multiple times. And again, nothing happened. How long has it been? Ben asked. Huh? Ben closed his eyes, thinking back, counting the days in his head. Counting the days since he left the fortress. Six days. There's still time. This should work. What should work? My access code. It shuts off after a week. Once you leave, you got a week to get back. If you're gone longer than that, you're gone for good. Wait a minute, I said, remembering what the man in the attic of the barn had said. It won't work. Why not? They issued a code black, a lockdown. No one gets in. Lockdown? Ben asked. No, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't. Lockdown would mean shutting down. He trailed off, thinking of the implications of what the lockdown meant. From the way he was acting, I got the impression that a lockdown was a very bad thing. What happens when they order a lockdown? I asked. It's not good. It basically means game over for everyone. He flattened his piece of skin out, tried scanning it again. This has to work, he said with a hint of desperation in his voice. It has to. Why? Because they took from me. They... Again, he trailed off. Come on! He dropped the piece of skin and started kicking the pole. Come on! Suddenly, a light on top of the metal pole turned green. The ground began to shake. And then it began to sink. Is sink the right word? Maybe not. It was like the whole ground began to lower. Descend. The desert floor gave way. It was like a massive elevator platform. It was an entry point into the fortress. It worked, Ben said relieved. We're in. Chapter 11 I couldn't get over the size of this platform. It was massive. This is massive, I said in complete shock. Vehicle entry point, Ben said. Tanks, Humvees, transport vehicles, aircraft, drones, everything. The desert floor continued to give way, descending slowly. It was a large, rectangular area. Bigger than a football field. Bigger than several football fields. It was like the ground. The entire desert was sinking. How far down did we go? I'm not sure. Hundreds of feet. Maybe deeper. So where does this entrance lead? I asked, as we continued to go deeper, as the sky continued to shrink. Vehicle storage hangar. It's connected to the rest of the facility via a subway tunnel. It should lead directly to the military headquarters. We have to get into that tunnel. We have to get Maria. 
You still hell-bent on saving the world? Yeah, if you had a chance to help, wouldn't you? You still think you have a chance? Yeah, I do. Well, sort of. What are you even doing back here if you're not going to help? He looked at his wrist again. It was red and inflamed. Like I said, they took something from me. A part of me. They took my freedom. They took it without asking. I want my revenge. Who did that to you? I asked again. I don't know. Someone who knew? We found someone at the outpost, I said. Apparently he works for the Red Cross. Or maybe he was working for the military. I can't remember what he said. But he performed surgery on you. He cut a bullet out of your chest and stitched you up. Ev ben felt the wound that was just to the left of his heart. He was pretty amazing, I continued. He... Ben held his hand up, cutting me off, as the platform came to a stop. We had arrived. Ben had a look of concentration on his face. Quiet, he whispered. We don't know who or what is down here. Yeah. We had been lowered into what looked like a giant underground airplane hangar. Military vehicles were parked everywhere. There were Humvees, tanks, transport vehicles, aircraft, jets, A-10 warthogs, smaller planes that had to be the unmanned drones, the Predator drones, choppers as well. Weirdly, there was also a row of X-Wings, the experimental hypersonic jet that Daniel had flown out here. Their distinctive black arrowhead shape looked out of place amongst the more robust designs of the other vehicles. The row of tanks closest to us were covered in red dust from the desert. Their tracks were caked with red dirt. At least we know where the tanks went, I said. Something is wrong, Ben whispered. What is it? Ben pointed to a large circular door. It was half open. In there, the doorway leads into the tunnels. That's a good thing, right? That's where we'll find Maria. The trap door, the ladder she climbed down, that's where it leads, right? If there was a code black issued, if there was a lockdown, they would have sealed that entry point. So why is it open? I asked. I don't know. A voice, calm and soothing, said, Please disembark, platform. We moved into the hangar. Dust from the desert covered the smooth concrete floor. The tanks that we had been following were all parked neatly side by side. So, if we move into that tunnel, I said, we should be able to find Maria. She couldn't be too far. Ben shook his head. Something is wrong, he repeated. But that's where we'll find her, right? In the tunnel? Yeah. We moved closer to the tanks. It was then we noticed they were not only covered in red dust from the desert, but black dust as well. I looked at Ben. He was looking at the circular doorway, but his eyes were barely open. He was slouched over. His left arm was close to his body, like he had it in a sling. Nanoswarm? I asked him, referring to the black dust. He nodded. Some of the tanks had holes in their armor. Ditto for the choppers and the Humvees. Again, I got the impression that the armor, the metal, had been eaten by moths or caterpillars. The metal looks like Swiss cheese, I said. Again, Ben nodded. What did this? What's going on? They're feeding, he answered. What? The nano swarms. They feed on metal. Break it down at the molecular level. Use it to build and grow. Fuel for their manufacturing process. Ben shook his head. This is bad. You should turn back now. You should run. It's not safe here. What? Turn back. Go. Get out of here. I'm not leaving. Not without Maria. Not without my friends. Your friends? I caught Ben up on what had happened. On Jack running away, looking for his sister. We saw Kim, back in a small country town about 100 miles south of here. She was with Dr. Hunter. Working with Dr. Hunter. They had found Jack. And they took him prisoner, I think. Who is Kim? Ben asked. Jack's sister. I don't see the problem here. It's hard to explain, but that man she was with, Dr. Hunter, he's bad news. He's one of the people responsible for the outbreak, for everything. And he will stop at nothing to fix what he's done. Back in Sydney, at the hospital, he tied us up. He took us down to the morgue. He was about to put us under and harvest our organs, 
turn us into a science experiment for his research. We tried to tell him that we weren't infected. But he wouldn't listen. We were nearly butchered, murdered by this guy. So why was he with Jack's sister? Ben asked. What the hell is going on? Why did they take Jack? It sounds like Kim found her brother, took him in, saved him from a lonely death in the desert. I shook my head. No. Something is wrong. I don't know what. But I'm going to find out. You prepared to risk your life for your friend's life? He asked, pointing to the subway tunnel, to the massive circular door. You see that tunnel? It descends miles below the Earth's surface, deep underground. You prepared to go down there? In the dark? You prepared to die? Yeah, I am. <laughs> I was talking tough because there wasn't much else I could do at that point except fake it. The truth? I was terrified. I had no idea at the time. But the crazy soldier. He was just a preview of the madness and the horror that was waiting for me. And for us, waiting down there in the dark of the fortress. If I had known that, I might have turned around. Might have turned a gun on myself. Would my friends have blamed me? I doubt it. But of course there was no way I was turning back. I was a girl on a mission. I had come this far. So I was going down into the fortress. Down into hell. I pointed to the tunnel to the circular doorway. If that's where we'll find Maria, then that's where we need to go. Right now. Is this the only entry point? Is that the only tunnel in this area? Slow down, Ben said. We need to be careful. You go running off into the dark and you will get yourself killed. This place is bigger than Manhattan, bigger than most major cities, and General Spears is not someone you want to mess with. I've only met the general a couple of times, but believe me, you would not want to make an enemy of him. He was determined to win this thing, to right the ship, right every wrong. He took the losses of life, the outbreaks, and all the containment failures as his own personal failures. Some were saying the pressure was starting to get to him. Some say he was starting to lose it. About a month ago, civilians were banned from all military areas. The paranoia hit. Civilians were separated. We were isolated. People were getting scared. More rumors about death squads and massacres. You know, in World War II, in Auschwitz, in the concentration camps, the extermination camps, the prisoners. They didn't know they were being led into gas chambers. Not at first. And those that did, those who had that cold, sinking, awful feeling in their gut, they ignored it. They were in denial. The truth, the reality was too horrifying. When the general isolated the civilians, kept them locked up in the residential area, I knew something was wrong. I could feel it. That's why I took that last job. I got my team together. The four of us. I wanted to take more, but I couldn't. A few of my regular team didn't want to go. The scavenger hunts were becoming more and more dangerous. There were more infected, less things to scavenge, but I managed to convince them. When we finally got outside, when we were clear of the fortress and the surveillance drones, I told them what I thought was going on. I told them I thought the general was becoming paranoid. A threat. I told them we shouldn't go back. They agreed. That's why we were raiding the town of Hunter. We knew it might have been compromised, but we needed extra supplies if we wanted to get away clean. To get away from the fortress and the teams of special forces soldiers the general has at his disposal. We gambled. We knew the risk. We lost. I said, I had to keep reminding myself that Ben had been through just as much adversity as we'd been through. It was a miracle that either one of us had survived this long. But remember, he continued. We are on his turf now. This is his domain. So we have to be careful. All right, I said. We'll be careful. But the ladder that Maria climbed down, it's got to be close by, right? I think it was a maintenance access point, Ben answered. It should lead into the subway tunnel. Where the hell is that? Again, he pointed towards the massive circular door. Through there, subway tunnel leads all the way to the inner sanctum to the military and residential and research facilities. Okay, let's go. Hold on there. We need weapons. Guns. EMP weapons. EMP weapons. Don't tell me there are goddamn nanoswarms down here. Don't know. But we have to be prepared for the worst. We don't want to be trapped down here. 
face to face with a nano swarm with no way of defending ourselves. You saw what it did to the priest's men. Yeah, I did. It took their feet out from under them and strangled them and choked them to death. It filled their lungs with black nanoparticles or whatever. I remember the feeling and the pain after I ran right through the middle of a swarm. It was like razor blades on my skin. My throat was on fire. Ben had a good point about being prepared. So what now? I asked. We need supplies. We need weapons. Ammo. There had to be some guns down here somewhere, I thought. But in the dark, even with the light from above, from the desert, we couldn't see very far. The hangar was huge. We couldn't see where it started or where it ended. Maybe we should look for some medical supplies as well, I suggested. Get you patched up. No point. I need an ICU, not a patch up. Let's just get some guns, maybe a few EMP grenades, and get the hell out of here. Ben put his hand against the hood of an armored transport. What is it? Still warm. What? The tank is still warm. Means it's been outside recently. Is that a good thing? Should be loaded up. He moved to the rear of the tank and opened the hatch slightly. The hatch made a loud squeaking noise. The screech pierced through the air and echoed throughout the hangar. He stopped, and we listened to see if the noise had attracted any attention. Nothing. Silence. The hangar appeared to be abandoned. Ben was about to try and open the hatch again, when suddenly we heard something moaning. Something howling. A thump. It sounded like it was coming from inside the armored transport. We heard a moan of pain. And then another moan. It was the unmistakable sound of the infected. Ben raised his shotgun. Get behind me. Where are they? I asked. Are they in the tank? I had my rifle raised up to my shoulder, ready for the onslaught. I was searching the massive hangar. There were a million hiding places, behind each tank or Humvee, under them, or inside them. We heard another thump, more moaning. It had to be coming from the tank, I thought. Are they in the tank? I asked again. Yeah, Ben answered. They're in there, he said, pointing with the shotgun. In that tank. It's a troop transport. Holds maybe a dozen or so soldiers. So there could be twelve infected people in there? Maybe more. Ben moved back towards the tank and reached out to the door handle. Wait, what the hell are you doing? Taking care of them. What? Why don't we just leave them in there? No. The door closes and locks from the inside. I don't think it's locked. Won't be safe if these bastards are running around down here. We gotta take care of them. I gripped my rifle, made sure it was loaded, made sure the safety was off. I wanted nothing more than to leave those poor infected soldiers to rot inside that tank. But Ben was right. We had to take care of them. It was too dangerous to leave them in there. Get back, Ben said. Another thump. The hatch moved. The infected moaned. Louder, more desperate. They were inside all right, and they were now trying to break out. They knew we were there. Before Ben could open the hatch and move back to a safe distance, they pushed it open. The infected are relentless, and once they know there is food, fresh meat, fresh hosts on offer, they don't stop. The infected barged through the armored door, knocking the hatch open, knocking me on my back. I raised my rifle. Ben aimed his shotgun at the infected. The torch on the barrel shone into the tank. The torch lit up the eyes of the infected. The eyes of demons. A tank full. With every twist in Torn Apart, a new adventure unfolds. Are you ready to create your own real-world saga? Off-Grid Magazine awaits with inspiring survivor stories, practical advice, and the latest in expedition gear. Experience an adventure where the gripping narrative of Torn Apart meets the practical challenge of survival. Off-Grid Magazine is your companion on this thrilling journey. Visit offgridweb.com for more. Chapter 12 I scrambled to my feet and opened fire in a panic. I began shooting and shuffling backwards. Get behind me, Ben shouted. He calmly unloaded with the shotgun. He took out two or three infected with one shot, knocking them clean off their feet. Suddenly, more infected piled out from the next tank over. I turned and unleashed with my rifle. 
I emptied an entire magazine within seconds. I reloaded, kept firing, empty. Ben, help! He turned and raised his shotgun in one swift movement. Get down! He continued to unload, methodical and almost rhythmic. He would take a shot and then pump the shotgun, ejecting the spent cartridge. Then he would take another shot. And another. He continued to take out two or three infected at the one time. When he ran out of shells, he used the gun as a baseball bat and completely caved in the skulls of the last remaining infected. When it was over, the infected lay in a pile. We were safe for the moment. Although Ben had busted the torch on the shotgun. Why? I asked, between deep breaths. Why did they bring them back here? I don't know, Ben answered. Maybe one of the soldiers was infected. Maybe they didn't realize. I shook my head. No, we're past that point. These people, the soldiers, they know. They know the symptoms. They know all the telltale signs. They wouldn't let anyone who was infected into their tank. Unless they wanted to. They were hurting them. They were bringing them back here. And they messed up. I pointed to the pile of dead. Look, there are only four soldiers here. The rest are civilians. They were rounding them up. They were bringing them back here on purpose. Why? Don't know, Ben answered. Research, maybe? I stepped forward cautiously. I was about to check the inside of the tank. Maybe there were orders or documents or something that would give us a clue as to exactly what the hell they were trying to do. But just then we heard another noise. It wasn't a moan or howl of an infected person. The noise was mechanical. Gears whirring into action. The calm and soothing pre-recorded female voice said, Proximity alarm has been tripped. Vehicle access point has been locked for security purposes. Two huge security blast doors were closing, high above the platform. The blast doors were two solid steel slabs. I guess it was sort of like an airlock. What the hell is going on? I asked. The proximity alarm, Ben said. Something is up there. Something is coming. I suddenly realized that the only source of light in this underground hangar was coming from the desert. We were about to be locked inside this hangar. It was about to get real dark, real soon. Ben grabbed me by the shoulder. Get in the tank. What? Why? Something tripped the proximity alarm. Something bad. What? Look, he said, pointing to the blast doors. Just as they were about to close together, something slid inside. Something dark. Black smoke. It was a nano swarm. The blast doors closed completely, slamming shut. It was now pitch black. But we could hear it. The familiar snake hiss of the swarm moving through the air. Ben grabbed me by the shoulder again and whispered in my ear. Get in the tank. Now. We need to hide. Don't make a sound. Chapter 13 We carefully and quickly stepped over the bodies of the infected, feeling our way into the armored transport vehicle. Ben slowly and quietly shut the hatch. We knelt inside the tank in the darkness for a few seconds that felt like a few hours. We listened for the familiar hissing sound of the nano swarm, but we couldn't hear anything. Maybe it was a false alarm? I whispered. Maybe. Do you have a torch on your rifle? Ben asked. I felt around on the barrel of my rifle, looking, searching for the torch. I was convinced I had one. I hadn't used it yet. But I was pretty sure there was one attached to the underside of the barrel. I finally found it. I switched it on and breathed a sigh of relief. We peered out one of the portal-style windows of the tank. Outside, everything was still and silent. What do you think? I asked. I think the nano swarm tripped the proximity alarm, and now it's inside. Then again, maybe someone at the control center flicked the switch. I just don't know. Suddenly, orange flashing lights lit up the entire hangar. Emergency lights. The calm, soothing female voice spoke to us again. Security failsafe has been activated. Purge will commence in three minutes. All personnel must evacuate. Repeat. Security failsafe has been activated. Purge will commence in three minutes. All personnel must evacuate. Repeat. Purge? What the hell is that? 
I asked. It's a fail-safe, Ben answered. What? It's like a self-cleaning oven, a pyrolytic oven. This room will heat up to a thousand degrees, maybe hotter. Every living thing will burn. Everything will be turned to ashes. It's a fail-safe, a security measure. Purge will commence in three minutes, the female voice said. Oh, great, I said. What the hell do we do? We have to get to the tunnel. But if there's a swarm out there, we'll never make it. We've got no choice. We stay here. We burn. What about this tank? Can we hide in here? Is it fireproof? Ben thought it over. It might be enough to protect us, but we don't know how long the purge will last. We don't know how hot the blast will be. We don't know how much oxygen we will need. We then heard the hissing noise of the swarm. Louder, closer. There was a nano swarm in here, all right. It had tripped the proximity alarm and caused the hangar's blast doors to close, caused the failsafe to commence. It had waited, though. It had kept to the shadows, the darkness. It had watched us. It was studying us, watching and learning, adapting and evolving. It was hunting. And now it was ready to strike. Chapter 14 We continued to hide in the tank from the nano swarm, but we were running out of time. We had two minutes before the hangar turned into a pyrolytic oven, a self-contained inferno that would burn at over a thousand degrees. We could not afford to be stuck inside this tank when that happened. We would either burn or suffocate. Or both. Ben moved back over to the small portal window of the tank so he could watch the nano swarm. It was currently searching the hangar. It slithered in and around the other vehicles, the Humvees and the choppers. It would circle them and surround them and engulf them. And then it would tear them apart, flip them over, throw them around like rag dolls from one end of the hangar to the other. And the noise. It was enough to make your skin crawl. It was the noise of metal being twisted and bent and smashed into the concrete. Purge will commence in two minutes. I turned to Ben. What the hell do we do? I don't want to burn. I don't want to suffocate. Not now. Not yet. I can't die. Not until I know Maria is safe. I don't know, Ben answered. I don't have any EMP weapons. No EMP gun. We might just have to run for the tunnel. Wait. I have an EMP grenade. I felt for my backpack. But it was no longer over my shoulders. I must have dropped it outside the tank when we were attacked by the infected. You do? Ben asked. Only one? Yeah, we found someone. A scavenger, I think. He was dying. He gave us his last EMP grenade. Ben shook his head. One EMP grenade is not enough to stop the nano swarm, But it might be enough to slow the swarm down. Give us a few seconds to get through the blast door. Get inside the tunnel. I looked over to the circular doorway to judge the distance we would have to run. It was almost on the other side of the hangar. We would have to sprint as fast as we could to make it. And then we'd have to get lucky. Hopefully, the swarm wouldn't see us. Hopefully, nothing else jumped out of the shadows and attacked us. If anything like that happened, we were dead. If we sprint as fast as we can, we should be able to make it, I said. But then the doorway began to close, moving and rotating slowly. Oh no, I whispered. What is it? Look. The tunnel. The doorway. It's starting to close. Purge will commence in one minute, thirty seconds, the female voice said. That's okay, Ben said. The door needs to be closed. If it remained open, the flame, the heat wave would race through the tunnels. We can't have that. Ben was able to remain calm and level-headed. He reminded me of Kenji in that regard. He was still watching the nano swarm. It had moved over to the Predator drones. The swarm then paused and spread out in front of the drones. Then it seemed to take on its shape, like it was mimicking the design of it. Strange, Ben whispered. It must have seen the drones flying around in the area. It appears to be very interested in them. Maybe it thinks it can mimic its shape. I said. Use it as a camouflage technique. Like the car headlights. The what? Back at the outpost, I said. 
We were attacked by a swarm while you were unconscious. It took on the shape of a car, even had headlights. It was a camouflage technique, so it could sneak up on us. Ben shook his head in disbelief. He then moved away from the window. We have to make a run for it, he said. Into the tunnel. The tunnel will lead us to the control center. It's basically one long subway system. But the swarm? We'll never make it. I remembered how fast they could move. If it saw us and decided to chase, it would catch up to us in no time. We don't have a choice, Ben said. We stay here. We die. Purge will commence in one minute. The entry to the subway tunnel felt so far away. It was on the other side of the hangar. It was a huge, circular doorway. It continued to slowly close. Once that doorway was shut, the purge would commence. We go now, Ben continued. While the nano swarm is busy studying the Predator drones, if it attacks us, throw the EMP grenade. That will slow it down. Give us a chance to get away. We can't let it get inside the tunnel. Okay, I said. But wait, there's a problem. The EMP grenade. It's in my backpack. Where's your backpack? I'm not sure. I think I dropped it when we were attacked by the infected. Purge will commence in 30 seconds. The circular door was almost closed. We were leaving our run too late. Ben swore under his breath. This is our only chance, he said. We run. If you see the bag, pick it up. Get the EMP grenade ready. Purge will commence in 20 seconds. Ben had moved over to the hatch of the tank. It was go time. I was hesitant. Wait, what if I don't find the bag? If you don't find the bag, keep running. And? And pray. He turned the handle, opened the hatch. Purge will commence in ten seconds. Ben pushed me out of the tank. Run! Chapter 15 We sprinted for the tunnel. I held my breath. The circular blast door was a huge thing made of steel and concrete. It was almost completely closed. I guess Ben had waited for the last possible moment. Less chance of the nano swarm following us into the subway tunnel. As we ran, I saw my backpack. I had dropped it when we had been attacked by the infected. I bent down and scooped it up in one movement and kept running. We couldn't see the nano swarm, but we could hear it, the hissing sound. It was over in the opposite corner of the hangar somewhere. It was still moving in and around the surveillance drones. I began fumbling around in my bag to find the EMP grenade, but it was difficult to search for it, feeling for it blindly while sprinting as fast as I possibly could. In the end, we didn't need the grenade. We had timed our run to perfection. Ben made it to the doorway and turned around. Forget the grenade! Just run! I slung the backpack over my shoulders and dived for the tunnel. The doorway slid into place, closing and locking. It had nearly crushed me. One of the straps of the backpack was caught. I had to pull it with all my weight to get it free. But we had made it. We were in the tunnel. A dark tunnel. We were breathing hard. Ben was coughing and wheezing. I couldn't see, but it sounded like he was spitting up blood. What? What's stopping that thing from getting in here? I asked. The heat from the purge should be enough to kill it. Should? I'm not really sure, but it can't get through this door. At least not right away. The door is massive. It's vacuum sealed, pressurized. It can't get in here. Not unless it starts eating through the metal. And what's stopping it from doing that? Nothing. But that would take it a long time. You saw how thick the door is. It's at least six feet thick. Solid steel. It'll give us a good head start. Great. That's real great. Real reassuring. Not trying to be reassuring. We've just bought ourselves some time. And that's as good as we are ever going to get. Let's go. We got about a day's walk. What? A day? How long is this tunnel? Not sure. The train that transports passengers back and forth is a bullet train. It travels at about 200 miles per hour, sometimes faster. It takes at least 15 minutes to reach the residential area, 10 minutes to reach the lake. There's a lake down here? Yeah. This place was designed to survive an extinction-level event. Water is essential. There are at least three of these entry points that I know of. I still couldn't believe it. So there's a lake down here? 
I repeated. Yeah, it's huge. It keeps this place running. There's a massive bridge that spans across the lake. This place really is a modern wonder, an unbelievable achievement of human engineering and endurance. I looked at the train track. It was deep and wide, heavy duty. So how deep does this tunnel go? I asked. Not sure. Miles, like I said, deep enough to survive an extinction level event. Nuclear, asteroid, zombies, nanoswarms, whatever. Ben was trying to give me the layout of this place, but he was struggling to talk. He was breathing heavily. N Are you all right? Are you going to be able to make it? No choice. We have to walk in. Not sure how we are going to cross the lake, but we'll deal with that when we get there. Ben was a tough son of a bitch, but at that moment he was weak from blood loss and dehydration. The only thing that was keeping him going was his desire for revenge and his hatred of the people in charge. Okay, I said. But before we go anywhere, we need to find Maria. The ladder she climbed down has got to be close. Where would that maintenance shaft lead to? It should be around here somewhere. Yeah, it should be right near the entry. I switched the torch on my rifle again. Finally found the door for the maintenance shaft. The sign on the door read, Authorized Engineers Only. Emergency Access. Door is alarmed. But something was wrong. The door was open slightly. Just a crack. I ran to it. Opened it. I should have been more careful. There could have been anything hiding behind that door, waiting for me. Zombies, nano swarms, crazy bearded soldiers. I pointed the rifle inside, shone the torch up and down. It was a narrow maintenance shaft, an emergency exit and entry point. The ladder went straight up. The maintenance shaft was empty. Maria was nowhere to be seen. Chapter 16 I began to panic. Maria was gone. She was supposed to have climbed down this maintenance shaft. This door was supposed to be locked. She was supposed to have waited here. But she was gone. To make matters worse, Ben was struggling. He was getting worse. He had dropped to his knees. He looked like he was having a goddamn heart attack. I couldn't see how bad he was because it was too dark. But he was definitely struggling. Maria had to be close by, I thought. But where? Where is she? I asked Ben, and no one. Where the hell is she? Ben did not respond. Where the hell is she? I repeated. What the hell is going on? I spun around. I looked deeper into the tunnel, into the darkness. Keep your voice down, Ben whispered. No, I will not keep my voice down. I don't care if it's not safe. I don't care if infected zombies and nanoswarms hear me and come and eat me. If we don't have Maria, if she is not alive, it's all over. Nothing will matter. I won't matter. You said you were prepared to die for your friends, Ben said. Sacrifice yourself. You came here searching for answers. I came here because I wanted to help. And we can help. As long as we have Maria. I was getting frantic. I was starting to panic. We had all agreed to keep Maria safe, above all else. And I had stupidly risked her life by coming here. I had risked everyone's life by coming here. And for what? Maria had disappeared. I should have known I wasn't strong enough to keep her safe. Not in this world. We could barely keep her safe when Kenji and Daniel were protecting us. Ben was still kneeling a short distance away. Hunched over in pain. He spoke quietly. I could barely hear him. The fortress is a refuge from the virus and the infected and the apocalypse. It is self-sustainable. It is protected. It is a paradise in a wasteland. But... He trailed off and coughed up some blood. But what? I asked. It is also a prison. A prison for bodies. And souls. It is a nightmare. A place of torture and evil. It is a place of love. And hate. Of good. And evil. You cannot have one without the other. I couldn't tell if Ben was looking at me. It was too dark. I couldn't tell if he was delirious from blood loss or not. Once again, I looked up ahead into the dark tunnel. There was only one way to go. Down. Deeper. I gripped my rifle tightly with both hands even though it was out of bullets. I took a deep breath. I had to find Maria.
She couldn't be far. I was right. Just then I heard a scream. A girl's scream. If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a favor and share it with a friend? The more you share, the more free audiobooks we can publish for you. Now, back to the story. Chapter 17 I ran forward, around a slight bend in the tunnel. Up ahead there was a train. There were four carriages. The two at the rear were dark. The two at the front had their lights on. They were blindingly bright in the dark tunnel. I heard another scream. Maria! Ben grabbed me from behind and put one of his giant hands over my mouth. Shh, he whispered into my ear. Be quiet. I wrestled away from him. I didn't have time to be careful or quiet. That was Maria, I said. It has to be. She's in trouble. Something is wrong, Ben said. Ben doubled over again. He was too weak to stand up straight. He looked like he was holding his guts in with his hands. He dropped to one knee. The lockdown, he said. This track should be closed. It goes for miles. So? So there shouldn't be any carriages on the track. We are in the middle of nowhere. Something is wrong. Another scream. Yeah, something is wrong. Maria is in trouble. I need to go and get her. Don't do it. Not safe. No kidding. But I have to go. I don't have a choice. Ben grabbed me and pulled me back. Even as he was lying on his deathbed, he was still unbelievably strong. But I needed to go. I didn't care if it wasn't safe. I didn't care if it was a trap. I didn't care that there weren't supposed to be any carriages in the middle of this tunnel, miles underground, in the middle of nowhere. Maria was screaming out, in pain or for help. I couldn't tell. But I wasn't going to let Ben stop me. He could either shut up or come with. Let go. I slipped out of his grip and pushed him with all my strength. He fell backwards, sprawled across the tracks. Now he really did look dead. I was just about to storm off. Maybe I should have checked his pulse. But then he coughed so I knew he was alive. At least for the time being. I'm sorry, I said. Stick to the shadows, he whispered. When you strike, strike hard, strike fast. You will only get one chance. Chapter 18 I ran up to the rear of the train, hunched over, keeping low. Ben was right. The train appeared to be a bullet train. The front carriage and the rear carriage both had an aerodynamic and futuristic design. It gave the impression that it was built for speed. The two rear carriages were boarded up. The windows were spray-painted black. They were completely dark. I moved towards the front. The lights inside the carriages were so bright they hurt my eyes. The passenger doors located on the side were both open. I moved up to the second carriage and peered through the side door. The carriage was empty. Sort of. Empty of living people. No Maria. But it was full of dead bodies. Dead soldiers. They lay slumped in the seats of the train. Some lay in the aisle. Blood covered their bodies and their armor and helmets, and the inside of the carriage. Bullet casings covered the floor. I had no idea what had happened here. Did someone shoot all these soldiers? How? They would have had to have taken them by surprise. Unloaded with a machine gun when they weren't prepared. Weren't ready. Maybe they had been asleep. Maybe they were about to go out on a mission. Or maybe they were just coming back. I climbed up into the train and crouched inside the carriage of death. I was surrounded by dead soldiers. They looked like special forces soldiers. According to the patches on their uniforms, some of them were paratroopers. Airborne. These guys were the elite. They were the best of the best. And they had been executed. I had to take several deep breaths to calm myself down. Each of the paratroopers was wearing a parachute harness. As I moved through the carriage... I could see that they had all been shot multiple times. There was blood everywhere, and bullet casings. They were concentrated at the doorway that connected the second carriage to the front carriage, like someone had stood there and unloaded magazine after magazine at the soldiers while they were sitting down. Loaded bullets littered the floor as well. They were piled up in heaps. Again, 
I had to take deep breaths. I had to breathe through my mouth and concentrate and focus so I didn't throw up. I had to distance myself and think about something else, so it didn't feel like I was crawling over a pile of dead soldiers. I moved slowly through the train. I moved up to the door that connected the carriages. I peered through the window. I was not prepared for what I saw. I immediately ducked back down so that I was hidden. I put my hand over my mouth so that I didn't scream. This is what I saw. I saw Maria. Her hands were tied to the hand railing at the far end of the front carriage, near the driver's cabin. Her face was streaked with tears. Standing menacingly at the other end of the carriage, right near where I was crouched, was a man. He was shirtless, wearing military-style cargo pants. He was wearing a gas mask. The goggles of the mask were tinted black. I couldn't see his face. The mask gave him the impression that he was an alien. Or a monster. Something inhuman. His entire upper body was covered in scars. Cuts. Burn marks. I couldn't tell if they were self-inflicted or if someone had done that to him. He had a number of rifles lined up in the aisle and he was standing over a pile of bullets. He was taking them out of the rifles' magazines. One by one. Maria screamed again, and I actually jumped. I crouched down, and I waited a few seconds, keeping perfectly still. Then I prepared myself, and I looked again. Please, Maria begged. Please don't hurt me. Please. The man in the gas mask ignored Maria. He continued unloading the ammo magazines, flicking each individual bullet onto the floor of the carriage. I'm immune, Maria said. I'm special. Look, I was bitten. See, I didn't turn. I didn't turn into a monster. Special? The man said. You are not special. You are just a vessel. Your body. The man's voice sounded weird as he spoke through the air filters of the gas mask. It sounded unnerving, almost mechanical, like he had artificial lungs or something. I swear to you, Maria continued. I'm telling the truth. I swear, please, please don't kill me. I am immune. They can make a cure, a vaccine from my blood. The man looked up at Maria. A cure? For what? Tell me, what do you want to cure? This plague, the Oz virus. You think you can save people? You think you can save the human race? I, I don't know. Just please. I have to try. The man shook his head slowly. You do not want to save anyone. What? You do not want to save anyone. You just want to save yourself. No, no, I want to help. I can help. No, he repeated slowly. You do not want to save the human race, nor should you. It is better this way. The world is on fire. The world is burning, and it is glorious. What? What the hell are you talking about? I am talking about a purging fire. I am talking about starting over. I am talking about creating history. For too long we have fought the old wars. For too long we have wasted lives. Our children, our sons, our daughters, our families. So many families have been wasted. But if we create a new history... The man in the gas mask trailed off. He was nodding his head like he was agreeing with himself and everything that he was saying. This is how we become legendary, he continued. Do you think your blood can save us? Do you think your blood can cure the world of this sickness? No, you are wrong. The only way to have our freedom, the only way to have our salvation, is to burn everything to the ground. Burn the old empires. Burn the old memories and the old ways. We purge. We start over. We start a fire. And we watch the world burn. And then and only then will we be free. Only then will we have our salvation. Maria was shaking her head. She was crying heavily. I think she had given up on trying to bargain with him. And so had I. I decided right then and there that I would need to kill this man. I would need to kill him to save Maria. Take a life to save a life. But I would need a weapon. Look at these weapons, the man in the gas mask shouted. And for a split second, I thought he had read my mind. Or maybe I was accidentally thinking out loud. 
For a split second, I thought that he was standing over me. But he wasn't. He was walking slowly towards Maria. He was holding a hunting knife. This is what I am talking about, he said as he waved the knife back and forth. I am talking about weapons, instruments of evil, instruments of ill omen. We are taught to use weapons only when necessary. They can take life. They can destroy it. He held up the knife in front of Maria. The blade, the knife, the sword. Folded metal for strength. It was forged in a fire, under immense heat. The serrations of the blade increased the damage and severity of the wound. The ripping and tearing of flesh. A messy wound is a deadly wound. He was getting closer to Maria. I would need to make my move soon. He took out a handgun and pointed it to all the other guns he had lined up. The guns he had taken from the dead soldiers. A gun is even more efficient, deadly and lethal. A bullet is fired at such high velocity that it completely destroys whatever it touches. But it is limited. It is limited by the man firing the gun. It is limited by his physical abilities, his conscience, by ammunition. Maria was still shaking her head. Tears continued to streak down her face. One evil man can make millions of people suffer, he continued. One evil. Et, the man lowered the gun and then raised the knife so that it looked like he was looking at his own reflection in the blade. If you remove this evil, you give life to the millions of people who have suffered. In this regard, weapons are to be considered the divine will of the gods. In this regard, they are to be considered necessary. I scanned the immediate area, looking, searching for a weapon. Anything. I would have settled for a rock or a sharp stick at that point. Not a fair fight, but I didn't care. I needed to save Maria. Bombs, he continued. Warheads. Heat and pressure. Nuclear. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of fire. A fire burns. Rages. Unsupervised. A fire is alive. It moves. It evolves. As long as there is fuel. A weapon that is alive. A weapon that evolves. A weapon that uses humans as fuel. No ammunition. No limitation. A weapon that is alive. A weapon that will end suffering. A weapon that will end evil. A weapon that will give life. Maybe I could bluff him, I thought. Fake it. Point my rifle at his head. Pretend it was loaded. No, that won't cut it. Before I really knew what I was doing, I had slid the empty magazine out of my rifle. I threw it at the far end of the carriage and shattered the rear window. The glass broke and it sounded like the loudest thing in the world. I could almost feel the man in the gas mask turn and look, like I could feel his gaze, feel the heat from his breath. A few seconds later, I heard his boots, his footsteps, as he came to investigate. I quickly moved out of the carriage, back out the way I had come in. I hid underneath the train, in the darkness. I could hear the man in the gas mask as he opened the connecting door and stepped into the carriage. He began talking to himself. I should have known, he said. You old warriors. You are strong. You are mysterious and powerful. You are the pinnacle of human achievement and endurance. You have carved your bodies. You have built yourselves. You have strengthened yourselves and pushed yourselves to the absolute limit of human capabilities. I slowly moved out from under the train and moved back against the wall of the tunnel, making sure I was still hidden in the dark. The man in the gas mask began slowly walking through the carriage. He took out an ammo mag from his pocket. He loaded the rifle he was carrying. And then he walked through the carriage, putting one bullet into the head of each fallen soldier. I guess maybe he thought they were infected. Or maybe he thought one of them was still alive or something. Either way, he was making double sure that they were really dead. My distraction had worked. I had bought myself some time. There were maybe 20 or 30 soldiers, and he was being extremely methodical and thorough, aiming carefully for each head. I moved towards the front carriage, made my way to Maria. Her head was lowered. She didn't see me until I was right next to her. When she saw me, I had to hold my hands over her mouth so she didn't scream or cry out or say anything. I had to tell her repeatedly to keep quiet. I pleaded with my eyes for her to keep quiet. From the rear carriage, we could hear each single gunshot. Bang! Then a five-second pause as he methodically walked through the carriage. 
re-killing the soldiers, making sure. A bullet in the head. Bang. Maria appeared to have calmed down enough so I could speak to her. I removed my hands from her mouth. Shh, I whispered. It's going to be all right. Everything is going to be fine. We just need to get you out of here. We can hide in the tunnels. We can make it. I talked to her and I whispered reassuring things. I had no idea if I was lying or not. Bang. The gunshot made us jump. Untie me, she said. Cut me loose. Let's go. Her hands were double tied. Her wrists were bound with a plastic zip tie. And then they were tied to the railing of the train. I would need a knife to cut her loose. And the only knife I had was the blunt knife that Kenji had given me. I really needed to upgrade. I tried to cut through anyway. I got nowhere. Come on, Maria whispered. Hurry. Suddenly the gunshots had stopped. The silence was unsettling and frightening. It meant that the man in the gas mask was finished re-killing the soldiers. He would be back very soon. I made eye contact with Maria. I'm sorry. I need to hide. It's the only way. What? No. Don't leave me. Don't. She began to cry again. She was terrified. I'll be right back. I'm not going far. I am coming back for you. I scrambled around on my knees, searching the pile of guns and ammunition for something I could use. Unfortunately, all of the bullets for the rifles had been removed from their magazines. I did not have time to reload each one. But luckily, I found a shotgun. And one single shell. Just the one. What are you going to do? Maria asked. I'm going to kill this bastard. Maria was shaking. She was freaking out. She didn't want me to leave, but I had no choice. I loaded the shotgun with the single shell. The only way I was going to kill this psycho was if I did it from the shadows. Like Ben said, strike from the shadows. Strike hard. Strike fast. I'd only get one chance. Chapter 19 I hid in the driver's cabin. I kept the door open, hoping he wouldn't notice. All I had to do was step out, fire the shotgun, and that would be the end of him. At the downside to this plan is that I would have to wait until he got nice and close. Kenji once told me that a shotgun was only effective as a close-range weapon. A shotgun shell was crammed full with ball bearings that sprayed outwards when you fired. The further away the target was when you fired, the less concentrated the blast would be. So I needed to wait until he got nice and close. I would also need to make sure that I stepped forward, so I was standing over Maria. If I stood back, there was a chance that I could accidentally shoot her. I could not take that risk. All of this raced through my mind as the man in the gas mask walked down the center aisle of the carriage towards Maria. Strike from the shadows, I thought to myself. Strike hard. Strike fast. I was following Ben's advice to the letter. This had to work. Failure was not an option. The man spoke. Slow and methodical, he said. You should have seen the look on their faces when they realized how truly helpless they were. When they knew how insignificant their lives were. They were trapped. They could not do a thing. Not with all their strength and training. Even with all of this, with all of their cunning and skill and force, they were helpless. You can see this all in an instant. It flashes across their faces in their last dying seconds, flashes through their eyes. Maria remained quiet. She had stopped crying. She was waiting for me. She wanted this over and done with. You cannot be allowed to live, the man continued. You do not understand. You are too dangerous. You are not fit for the new world, a world on fire. I peeked around the corner of the doorway. The man in the gas mask had gripped the knife tightly in his right hand. He raised the blade and took a step forward. I made my move. I stepped out from the driver's cabin, making sure I was standing over Maria so I didn't accidentally shoot her. I made sure I was close to the man in the gas mask so he would take the full force of the shotgun blast. The man in the gas mask froze. He had the knife raised. I aimed, held my breath. I took the shot. As Torn Apart takes you through suspenseful twists, are you prepared to navigate your own path? Off-Grid Magazine stands ready with inspiring stories, 
practical survival strategies, and essential gear guides. Experience a world where the captivating saga of Torn Apart meets the raw challenges of survival. Your next adventure is waiting at Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 20 I have never fired a shotgun before in my life. Not even when Kenji and Daniel were teaching us how to shoot. I was too scared to try after Jack nearly dislocated his shoulder. So to say that I wasn't used to the shotgun was an understatement. As Jack had once said, it kicked like a damn horse. It certainly did. It kicked violently, causing the barrel to pull up and to the left. The blast took down the man in the gas mask and shattered some of the windows of the train carriage. For a second, my shoulder was numb, and I thought I had actually dislocated it. The man had fallen onto his back about halfway down the aisle of the carriage. He lay there motionless. I looked around for more bullets, but I couldn't see any shotgun shells. I moved towards him slowly. I was now holding the shotgun as a baseball bat. Is he dead? Maria asked. Please tell me he's dead. I... I don't know, I think so. I looked around for more shotgun shells, but again, I couldn't see any. I moved towards him slowly as I held the shotgun like a bat, ready to swing. I couldn't see his face because it was hidden by the gas mask. I tried to remove it, but it wouldn't budge. And then I saw why I couldn't budge it. It was sewn into his scalp. Oh God, I whispered. What is it? Maria asked. Is he dead? The gas mask, it's stitched into his skin. What? The mask is sewn into his scalp and his face. That is so gross. I moved his head slightly. It was stitched all the way to the back. It was a messy job, like he had done it himself. How or why? I had no idea. It made me think that maybe he had inflicted all those other scars on his upper body himself as well. Forget him, Maria said. He's dead. Hurry up and cut me loose. We need to get the hell out of here. Wait. I need to be sure. I tried to feel for a pulse, but I couldn't find one. I couldn't hear him breathing. His chest was not moving. What the hell happened to this guy? I asked. His body was absolutely mutilated. His torso was covered in scars, cuts and burn marks. It was a mess. Maria was getting impatient. Rebecca, come on, forget him, cut me loose. The knife. Where is his knife? I asked. Ah, I don't know, he must have dropped it. I scanned the immediate area for it. The knife had landed near his head, under the seats. I crouched down and reached for the knife, keeping one eye on the body. The knife had slid a fair way under the seats. I had to stretch out to reach it. Can you see it? Maria asked. Yeah, almost got it. I ended up getting closer to the body of the man than I would have liked, but I eventually retrieved the knife. I quickly cut through Maria's ties. She held her wrists and rubbed them better. I hugged her tight, held her close. I had nearly lost her. I'm so sorry, I said. I was so scared. Don't be sorry, it wasn't your fault. We knew the risks. Yeah, but still, I thought you were... Don't say it. I don't want to think about it. I nodded. We had to stay positive. We were relying on each other for courage. So what happened? I asked, pointing to the body. Who the hell is that guy? I don't know. It all happened so fast, Maria answered. I climbed down the ladder. Felt like I was climbing for hours. I was holding on tight. It was so dark, I couldn't see anything. I basically had to feel my way down. I finally reached the bottom. I felt my way to the door, the emergency access to the tunnel. But it was locked, so I waited. I was so scared just waiting in the dark for that crazy bearded soldier. I was convinced that he was going to kill you. And I was powerless to stop him, to do anything. So I just had to sit there in the dark, waiting, not knowing. After a few minutes, I thought I could hear breathing. I heard footsteps, boots crunching on gravel. I thought it was the crazy soldier. But it wasn't the soldier. It was him, she said pointing to the man in the gas mask. He grabbed me, pulled me onto the train, tied me up. 
He told me that he had killed those soldiers in the other carriage. He said they were the elite, trained warriors, and he killed them all. Killing me would be easy. She paused, took a deep breath. It's not easy to talk about someone wanting to kill you. But he took his time, she continued. I think he wanted to savor it or something, like he was enjoying it. He said he didn't expect to see me, not out here in the desert, not down here in this place. He said that my presence proved to him that he was doing the right thing. It was fate and destiny and chaos. He was crazy, she said, shaking her head. But yeah, he killed all those soldiers. This guy is a mass murderer, a killer, a psychopath. We need to get the hell out of here. We need to get the hell away from this place. I could not agree more, I said. Wait, how did you get away from that soldier? Maria asked. How did you get down here? Big Ben showed up. What? He's alive? Yeah. He said he got away just before the outpost blew up. He figured we had done the same. He came here for revenge, and in the process he saved me. For the second time. He shot the crazy soldier with a rifle. Shot him right in the head. Wait. Why does he want revenge? Revenge for what? I don't know exactly, I answered. He said that they took something from him. His life his freedom. What does that mean? I'm not sure, but someone cut the tattoo off his forearm, the tattoo of the barcode. Cut it? Like, cut the skin? Yeah, they sliced it right off. He thinks whoever did it is down here. They knew they needed a barcode to get in. The barcode is the key. For the trap door? No, it opened a massive platform. We descended down into this airplane hangar. It was bigger than a football field. It's absolutely massive. What is this place? Maria asked. According to Ben, this is the fortress. Maria's eyes lit up. What? No way. This is the fortress? We found it? Yeah. The reason the vehicles, the tank tracks had disappeared is because they were lowered into the storage hangar. It's the perfect camouflage. It's the perfect hiding spot. That's why the dreadlocked woman and Ben said we would never find this place on our own. It's because this whole facility is underground. Deep underground. I'm not entirely sure, but I guess these train tracks lead to the central headquarters or whatever. So we found it, Maria said. I can't believe it. We found it. We have a chance to find the others. Jack and Kim and Kenji. They have to be down here. They just have to be. Where else would they be? Maria's spirits had been immediately lifted. Suddenly, she wasn't so worried about cheating death. She was determined to find the others. And I must admit, her confidence, even if it was misplaced, it gave me strength. I knew the odds of finding our friends down here were slim to none. And finding them alive? I had to stop thinking about the odds. Wait, where's Ben? Maria asked. He's back down the tunnel, I said motioning with my head. He's not doing so good. Well, we still need to get him. We can't just leave him here. Yeah, you're right. Plus, he's been here before. He knows this place. Do you think we could use this train? Maria asked. I think we should walk in, I said. We don't even know if this train works, and I have no idea how to drive it. Do you? No, but maybe Ben does. I don't think he's in a position to drive anything. He's in pretty bad shape. I'm not sure, but I think he's dying. Oh, but we better go and get him, I continued. Like you said, we can't just leave him there to die. What do we do about him? She said, pointing to the man in the gas mask. Forget him. He's dead. Let's just go and get Ben. And then we'll figure out what to do next. I looked back at the man in the gas mask. He lay sprawled on his back, motionless. All right, I said. Let's go, stay close. We need to hurry, and then we need to get as far away from here as possible. We began walking back to where Ben had collapsed. We used the torch on my rifle so we could see. I should probably try and load one of those empty magazines, I said. I hate not having any ammo. We're too vulnerable. Maria nodded. Yeah, I agree but we should be safe down here as long as we keep quiet, right? I'm not so sure about that, I said. Why? Back in the hangar, there were infected people, 
and there was a rogue nano swarm. A swarm down here? How did it get in? I don't know. It must have snuck in. It beat the proximity alarm. It got through the blast doors just before they closed. How did you get away from it? When it set off the proximity alarm, it set off a security failsafe, a purge. A purge? Yeah. Basically, the hangar turned into a giant oven. A furnace. So, it should be dead or whatever. It should have burned up, right? That's the idea. But I don't want to take any chances. There were infected people in there as well. They were trapped in the tanks. It was like the Special Forces soldiers had gone out and rounded them up and captured them, brought them back here on purpose. We killed about 20 or so, but there could be more. So we've got to keep moving. We need to get as far away from here as possible. We need to get Ben and go quickly. Good point. We picked up the pace. We ran back down the track. It was a lot further than I remembered. A lot further. We finally made it to Ben. He was still lying on his back. I hoped he wasn't dead. If he was dead, we were screwed. I knelt over him. Ben! No response. I was about to slap him in the face, but before my palm connected with his cheek, he caught my wrist. Please, don't. Thank God you're alive. He sat up awkwardly. He was still holding his stomach. Not for long. I'm bleeding out here. Don't say that. You can make it. You have to make it. Where is your friend? I'm right here, Maria answered. Wow, there's something you don't see every day. What's that? A miracle, he said. Did I hear gunshots? It was taking him considerably effort to talk. He began drifting in and out of consciousness. Maria was in the train, I said. She had been tied up by someone. He was about to kill her. He was saying some pretty messed up things. Seems to be a lot of that going around. Was it a soldier? Civilian? I don't know, but I was able to take him out, I said. Shot him point blank with a shotgun. I did it just like you said. But I can't tell if it's a civilian or a soldier. He's wearing a gas mask. His face is hidden. I can't get it off. Not that I really want to. His body is all mutilated and scarred. Scars? Yeah. Cuts and burns and grazes and stuff. It's pretty gross. Ben tried to sit up. We need to take the mask off, he said. Show me the body. I need to know who that is. That might be a bit difficult. The mask appears to be stitched into his scalp. I need to know, he repeated. We need to take the mask off. Okay, sure. Let's get you to the train. We can probably use it to move through the tunnel. We think it's still working. We can use it to travel the rest of the way. Sure as hell beats walking, right? And there's no way we can carry you all the way. Ben's eyes flickered. They were half open. The train? No. What? His head dropped forward. Ben? Don't, he whispered. Not the train. Not safe. What's not safe, Ben? It's safe now. I shot that guy. Maria is safe. He was out. He was dying. He was bleeding to death. Right before our eyes. And there was nothing we could do to stop that. Hopefully there was a doctor or surgeon or medical facility down here at the other end of these tracks. We can't carry you the whole way, I said. You're too heavy. We have to take the train. I just hoped we could get it working. I shook Ben by the shoulders. But he was out. He was unconscious again. We would have to drag him back to the train. Chapter 21 We began dragging him along the track. He weighed a ton. We had to stop every 20 feet or so to rest. My hands were on fire. My knuckles and my fingers, they had locked up with pain. We let go of him to catch our breath and shake our fingers loose. We can't carry him the whole way, Maria said. We'll need to get that train moving. I nodded. We resumed dragging him along. It was getting harder and harder to get a good grip. I looked back at the train. It was an island of light in an otherwise dark tunnel. It was like a beacon. Come on, Rebecca, I thought to myself. Just one foot after the other, one step at a time. We need to get out of here. We need to get far away from that airplane hangar. Simple goals. Get to the train. Get out of here. And then what? I had no idea what came next. Hopefully we would find someone in charge. Someone who hadn't lost their mind. 
someone who didn't want to enforce the military's containment protocol, or the lockdown procedure. Hopefully we would find Jack and Kim, and Kenji. It was hard to think about Kenji, so it was best not to think about Kenji. We kept dragging Ben towards the train. We finally made it. My hands ached and burned. They were shaking. Okay, let's lift him into the carriage, I said. Maria nodded wearily. I turned and looked through the door at the man in the gas mask. He was lying where we had left him. What do we do with him? Maria asked. Should we throw him off the train? Yeah, but let's get Ben inside first. Together, we lifted Ben into the train. Damn, he's heavy, Maria said. We dragged him into the driver's cabin. Maria was worried. Is Ben, is he dead? I don't know. I leant forward, checked his pulse. No, he's alive. Barely. But he needs medical attention. He needs help. Maybe there's like a hospital down here or something? Do you think? Yeah, I answered confidently, even though I wasn't sure. Of course there is. He's going to be fine. Maria stood. Do you know how to drive this thing? I shook my head. I have no idea, I said as I scanned the control panel. Shouldn't be too hard. There was a start button for the engine. A throttle. Forwards. Reverse. Brake. Come on. We should be able to figure this out, I said. Yeah, Maria said. But before we go, we should get rid of that body. It's giving me the creeps. All right, I agreed. We'll throw him into the tunnel. Beats bringing him with us. We walked out of the driver's cabin. I stood in the center aisle and a surge of adrenaline shot through my veins. I felt lightheaded. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The body was gone. Chapter 22 Oh no, Maria said. No, no, no. Shh, stay calm, I whispered even though I was freaking out. I thought he was dead, Maria said. You shot him. He was dead. What the hell? I don't know, I answered as I spun around, looking, searching. There was nothing. Where the hell did he go? Where's the body? We stood in the aisle of the train carriage, unable to move, unable to act. We were paralyzed with fear. My heart started to beat faster and harder. This is bad, Maria said. We should have shot him in the head. We should have stabbed him. We should have cut his head off. We should have... What? I snapped. We should have done what? We were out of ammo. He was dead. I shot him. He was dead. He was dead, wasn't he? I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure of anything anymore. Maybe he was infected, Maria said. Maybe he died and then came back or whatever. No. If he was infected, he would have attacked us. Let's get out of here, Maria whispered. Right now, let's go. We need to find him, I said as I jumped out of the carriage. Are you nuts? I checked under the train. It was dark, pitch black. I couldn't see a damn thing. It was very possible he was hiding under there. Get back here, Maria said. We need to go. I thought I saw something move. I thought I heard something. A boot crunching on gravel. I held my hand up. Shh. What is it? Maria jumped down next to me. She had the shotgun. She held on to it as tight as she could even though it was out of ammo. Maybe it was a security thing. We should really load up some of those guns before we go any further. I thought to myself. I continued to look underneath the carriage. Nothing. And I looked back down the tunnel in the direction we had come. Nothing. An abyss. I looked forward. The tracks descended gently into darkness. He's gone, right? Maria asked with fear in her voice. Yeah, I said. He just... He just disappeared. This is messed up. Maria was on the verge of breaking. Not that I could blame her. I was just about to tell her to keep herself together, because as long as we stuck together, we could make it. That we would find the others. That everything would be all right. But I never got the chance. The train lurched forward. The wheels creaked as they moved. The engine fired and the train began to pick up speed. Chapter 23 
What the hell? Maria shouted. Come on, let's go. I grabbed Maria and we jumped on the train before it got away from us. What the hell? Maria said again. Why did it start? Maybe Ben turned it on? I suggested. Why would he do that if he didn't know we were on board? Don't know. Maybe he thought we were. He's been drifting in and out. We made our way to the driver's cabin. Ben was still unconscious. The start button was illuminated. The control panel was lit up. The throttle. The throttle was jammed all the way forward. Maybe it's like an autopilot system or something, Maria offered. Yeah, maybe. The train continued to pick up speed. Next to the throttle was a digital speedometer. Our speed was steadily increasing. 60 miles per hour. 80 miles per hour. 100 miles per hour. Wow, this train is fast, Maria said. We were hurtling through the dark tunnel at well over 100 miles per hour. This doesn't feel safe, I said. Does this thing have headlights? Maria asked. Oh yeah, good idea. I scanned the control panel quickly, found the headlights, switched them on. This was a vast improvement. At least we could now see where we were going. 120 miles per hour. Is this thing supposed to be going so fast? Maria asked. Yeah, I think so. Ben said it was a bullet train, so I'm guessing it's designed to go really fast. The tunnel dipped some more. We began descending. We were rocketing along, burrowing deeper into the earth. The track turned slightly. The train rocked back and forth gently. 150 miles per hour. The movement woke Ben. He grabbed my ankle. His nails dug into my skin. I looked down, and for a fleeting second I thought he was infected. But then I saw his eyes. They were wide open, full of fear. Where are we? He asked. Everything is going to be fine, I said. Are you feeling all right? Where are we? He repeated. We're on the train. We're going to... Wait. Where were we going? I wasn't entirely sure, but I figured this track had to lead somewhere important. It's not safe, Ben whispered. They shut down the track. The code black. The lockdown. What? Maria asked. What are you saying? The lockdown. He kept saying, code black. He kept saying, lockdown. He still wasn't completely with it. Suddenly, we emerged from the tunnel into a huge, never-ending cave. A huge cavern. I couldn't see where it ended. Couldn't see the walls or the roof. It just kept going. The lockdown, Ben whispered. They blew the tracks. The train rocketed inside another tunnel. 180 miles per hour. The tracks have been destroyed, Ben whispered, barely clinging to consciousness. They blew the bridge. Severed the bridge. We need to stop the train. Stop the train. Get off. We have to walk in. They blew the tracks, Maria said. Why would they do that? How do you know? The lockdown, Ben said. It's the protocol. Sever the tracks. Blow the middle of the bridge. No one gets in. I grabbed the throttle. Pulled back. The handle didn't budge. It was jammed. And I mean it was jammed. It was completely stuck. 200 miles per hour. Maria was shaking her head. What do we do? What the hell do we do? We needed to get off this train. We needed to stop it. But we couldn't. The throttle was jammed. It was stuck. We were stuck. We were stuck on an unstoppable runaway train. The tracks had been blown. We were traveling at 200 miles per hour. We were speeding to our deaths. Navigate the turbulent world of Torn Apart and uncover your potential for adventure. Off Grid Magazine is here to lead, packed with stirring narratives, hands-on survival advice, and gear essentials. Join the adventure where the compelling story of Torn Apart meets the practicality of the great outdoors. Discover your adventure with Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 24 It has to have an emergency brake system, Maria said. Well, where the hell is it? I asked. We both looked at the control panel, searching for an answer. Searching for a magical button that would make this train stop. Nothing. The control panel was big and bright with about a million buttons and controls and levers. 
The only thing I could determine was that the goddamn throttle had been jammed forward. It was stuck. How long? Maria asked. How long do we have? Where did they blow the tracks? I shook my head. I don't know. Ben said it would take about 15 minutes to reach the residential area from the entry point. He also said that there was a lake down here, about 10 minutes away. What? A lake? Yeah, there's an underground lake. It's up ahead. He said it would take about 10 minutes to emerge from this tunnel. And then we should come out near or over a lake. Apparently there's a bridge, a massive long bridge that spans the lake to the other side. Wait, Maria said, thinking out loud. If they blew the tracks, they would have done it over the lake, at the halfway point. How do you know that? Well, that's what Ben just said. He said they blew the bridge, severed the bridge. I'll bet my life they would have blown the tracks over the lake to make sure no one on this side could get across. And they would have done it right in the middle of the bridge to make sure that if anyone did try and cross, they would be stranded over the water. They would be sitting ducks. Easier to shoot. Eliminate. She had a good point. A terrifying point. Just like the Sydney Harbor Bridge, she continued. I've got a bad feeling about this. This whole place. If they ordered a lockdown. If they blew the bridge. I mean, what if there was... She trailed off. But I knew what she was going to say. What if there was a containment failure down here? What if they had lost control? What if the virus or the nanoswarms had taken over? What if there had been another massacre of innocent people? What the hell happened down here? Maria asked. This is supposed to be a fortresses for crying out loud. It's supposed to be a refuge. She was right. Ben had told me this place was designed to survive any and all extinction-level threats. What the hell had gone wrong? We can't worry about that now, I said. We've got less than ten minutes before we run out of track. We need to stop this train. What if we can't? If we can't stop it, we're screwed. Could we jump? She asked. It's going way too fast. We'd be killed instantly. Even though the train was traveling at close to 200 miles per hour, it was an unbelievably smooth ride. It lulled us into a false sense of security. If we slow it down, I added, then maybe we could jump. But I'd still rather stop it altogether. I looked back at the control panel and realized there was a small button labeled map that was next to the central display monitor. I pressed the button and a basic map of the track appeared on the monitor. It showed the layout of the fortress, and the train's current location. This section of the train line led into the inner sanctum. There were three other long tunnels like this one. Each of the tunnels were about 40 miles long. It was 33 miles from the vehicle storage hangar, where we had come in, to the lake. The lake was circular in shape, like a donut, like a medieval moat. It surrounded and protected the inner sanctum. The whole facility looked like an intricate spiderweb or snowflake. It was massive. There, I said, pointing to the map, to the halfway point. We need to get off the train before we reach that point. According to the display, we were almost there. We were 20 miles out. I couldn't get over the size of this place. We don't have long, Maria said. If we're traveling at 200 miles per hour, we should reach that point in about six minutes. Six minutes? We have to go. We have to get off this train. Or stop it completely. Okay, Maria said, nodding, thinking. Maybe there's an emergency brake or an emergency stop button back there in the carriages. Let's check it out. Hurry. We moved into the carriage. We searched along the walls, the hand railings, near the doors. Nothing. Next carriage, I said. We moved into the second carriage, the one full of dead soldiers. I had to put my hand over my nose. It was already starting to smell. Again, there were no emergency stop buttons. There was nothing. The two rear carriages were completely dark. They appeared to be locked up. What about back there? Maria said. Forget it. If there are no emergency brakes in these carriages, there won't be any back there. We returned to the driver's cabin. We checked the control panel again. We were looking for answers, but finding none. 
I yanked on the throttle again, trying to pull it back into the neutral position. But it wouldn't budge. I had a bad feeling that someone had purposely jammed this forward. Someone who knew what they were doing. It had to be the man in the gas mask, I thought. It had to be. I looked at the map on the display panel again. We were getting closer to the bridge. We had about five minutes. Sixteen miles. Chapter 25 Maria had a go at trying to pull the throttle back. No luck. I slowly came to the realization that we would have to jump. It sounded like a stupid, crazy idea. I mean, the absolute last thing that anyone in the world would want to do is jump from a speeding train. Jumping from a speeding train means certain death. But we were out of options. We're going to have to jump, I said. Maria shook her head. No way. We are not jumping. Like you said before, if we jump at this speed, we will die on impact. We cannot jump. Well, then what the hell are we going to do? We can't stop this train. We have to jump. Maria's eyes suddenly lit up, like she had an idea. One that didn't involve jumping to our deaths. Wait, we might not have to jump. This train has four carriages in total, right? Yeah. Maybe the rear carriage has another driver's cabin. Another control panel that isn't busted. You think? I'm not sure. But isn't that how trains work? They have a driver's cabin at each end. So when they reach one destination, they just change direction to do the return trip. It's worth a shot, I said. We ran back through the carriages, stepping over the dead soldiers. We arrived at the door to the third carriage. It was dark. The window on the door had been spray-painted black. I should have taken that as a warning sign. We forced the door open. The carriage was dark. Empty. Blood stained the walls and the floor. Even the ceiling. The seats had been ripped out to maximize standing room. What the hell happened back here? Maria asked. Don't know. There's one more carriage. If there's no driver's cabin, then we have to jump. Agree? Yeah, agree. We moved up to the connecting door. There was blood on the handle. The window had also been spray-painted black. We opened it together, using all our strength. My heart sunk. There was no driver's cabin. None that we could see, anyway. We didn't even get the chance to look for one. The carriage was full of infected. They were just standing there. In the carriage. Mindless. They were crammed in shoulder to shoulder, like a train in the middle of peak hour. It's like they were waiting for someone to set them free waiting for us. They must have heard us as we struggled with the door. Because as soon as we opened the door, they were ready to pounce. They reached out for us with single-minded aggression. Chapter 26 Maria and I said nothing between us. We knew we had to get the door closed again. We needed to do it immediately. But we didn't have time. There wasn't even time to scream. We were too slow, and the infected are just too damn fast. They reached the door and jammed their decomposing arms and bodies into the frame. Get back, I said. Shut the door. We tried multiple times to get the door closed. We pulled with all our might, but we couldn't get it shut. We couldn't close it. We just had to fall back. Run. Retreat. Run, I shouted over the howling and the moaning of the infected. Get back to the next carriage. I'll hold them here. Maria ran back to the next door. When she had forced it open, I ran after her. As soon as I let go of the door, the infected barged through. They gave chase. Luckily, we were able to shut the next door before the infected got to us. But they kept coming. They slammed into the door and pushed up against it, slamming their heads against the spray-painted window. Fortunately, they couldn't figure out how to slide the door open. This bought us some time but we both knew it wouldn't be long before they broke through. We were now in the carriage with the dead soldiers. The whole train now felt like a tomb. Quick, Maria said. We have to load these rifles. We don't have time, I said. They'll break through. Just do it. We have to be able to defend ourselves. She had a good point. I dropped to my knees and grabbed a handful of bullets and began loading them one by one into an empty magazine. I couldn't get my hands to stop shaking. 
I must have dropped every second bullet I tried to load. Come on, I said to myself, urging myself to work faster. Maria was unusually calm. She had a look of intense concentration on her face as she loaded her magazine. What the hell are they doing here? She asked. Why would they have a train full of infected? Don't know, I answered as I tried to get my hands to stop shaking. Experiments? Research? I don't know. Not that the reason mattered anymore. The fact was they had been hurting infected, bringing them back here. And now they were loose in this fortress and on this train. The window of the door was beginning to shatter. Spiderweb cracks spread across the panel. The door frame began to buckle. The infected were almost through. Maria had already loaded two magazines. She had even found some shotgun shells. I gathered up some more bullets. Quick, Maria said. We can load the rest of these bullets in the next carriage. There's a whole pile of them in there. Okay, I said. No, wait. And I saw the parachutes that were still strapped to the dead soldiers. What? Maria asked. The dead soldiers, I said. They were special forces soldiers. They were paratroopers. So? So we can use these parachutes. We can jump. Jump? No. No way. Come on, it's the only way. We have to jump. If we jump with a parachute, we might have a chance. Might? We will have a chance. We will survive. You were right before. If we jump at this speed, we won't survive. We will die on impact. But if we jump with a parachute, deploy it immediately, we will survive. It'll be like base jumping. The parachute will catch enough wind and create enough drag to slow us down. Trust me. We will survive. I've done this before. It's the only way. You've done this before? Well, not exactly like this. We didn't get a chance to discuss this dangerous plan any further. Just as I had finally loaded a full magazine, the infected broke through. Maria and I both unloaded with machine gun fire. The narrow doorway of the train kept them all bunched together. As a result, we were able to keep them pinned back. It was like shooting zombies in a barrel. It was as close to target practice as we were ever going to get. I'm not sure how many infected there were. A carriage full. Once again, there were probably more infected than we had bullets. The bottleneck of the doorway bought us precious seconds. Stick to the right-hand side, I shouted to Maria over the roar of the gunfire. Cover me! What? Why? What are you doing? Parachutes! I moved further into the carriage, closer to the infected. As fate would have it, the paratroopers had been sitting at the rear of the carriage when they had been murdered. So unfortunately, I had to get closer to the doorway. Closer to the infected than I would have liked. There was blood everywhere. Blood and bone and brain. The man in the gas mask had made double sure that none of these soldiers were alive or infected. And in the process, he had made quite an unbelievable mess. Over there! Maria shouted from behind as she covered me. The soldiers up the back! I was on my stomach in a sniper's position. I managed to take out a few more infected before I slung my rifle and crawled over to the paratroopers. I wrestled with one of the bodies, trying to unclip the harness. I finally got it. It was weird taking the parachutes off the dead soldiers. I remembered back to when Kenji saved us, back in the interrogation room at the North Sydney police station. All those months ago. There was a dead soldier there. Kenji basically picked him clean. He checked all his pockets and took his ammo and his rifle. I had to tell myself then, and remind myself now, that it wasn't disrespectful. It was about survival. It was necessary. I turned and threw the parachute back to Maria. Take it! Maria was a picture of concentration. Her rifle was raised to her shoulder, eyes down the sight and the barrel. She was doing an excellent job of keeping the infected back. Maybe those shooting sessions with Kenji and Daniel had finally paid off. Or maybe it was just easy to hit something in a confined area like a train carriage. I reminded myself to stay low, keep my head down. I didn't want to get done by friendly fire. Not now. I'd come too far for that. I loaded my last remaining magazine into my rifle, took down a few more infected. Luckily, the force of a rifle shot was enough to knock them backwards off their feet. 
but to get the next parachute, I had to move even closer to the doorway and the infected. I continued to crawl and climb over the dead soldiers. Just a little further, I told myself. Almost there. Hurry, Maria shouted. I'm nearly out of ammo. I slung my rifle and got a move on. If I had to guess, I'd say I had about ten bullets left. But running out of ammunition wasn't really our biggest worry. Our biggest worry was running out of track. Because when that happened, if we were still on board, we would be killed instantly. I needed this parachute and we needed to fall back to the next carriage. Lock the door and then jump. I finally made it to the next paratrooper. I fiddled with the straps of the parachute harness. My hands were shaking with adrenaline and energy and fear. I got the parachute free. I threw it back towards Maria. The infected kept coming. They charged. There was a man wearing overalls. Somehow he was still wearing a hat. He was a farmer in a past life. I shot him in the head and he flew back towards the door. Another infected climbed over the top of his body. It had no legs. It was just a body and hands and fingernails and teeth. It clawed its way forward. I squeezed the trigger. Click. I was out. I scrambled back on my hands and ass. Maria, I'm out. I'm out too, she answered. I was just about to get to my feet and turn and run. It was my only option. We were out of ammo and now was not the time to get into a fist fight with these things. But all of a sudden, Maria jumped over the seats, knife in hand. She stomped on the side of its head and drove the knife through the temple, killing it instantly. Maria grabbed my hand and pulled me to my feet. She looked like a goddamn action hero. Come on, she said. Let's go. It Where'd you get that knife? I borrowed it from one of the soldiers. Maria had just saved my life, but there was no time to thank her. No time to celebrate. All right, I said. We need to shut this next door. And then we need to jump. Maria nodded. We moved into the front carriage. The last carriage. We had nowhere else to go. We slammed the connecting door shut, hoping the infected wouldn't figure out how to use the handle and slide it open. A few seconds later, they crashed into it from the other side. Again, I was extremely thankful that the glass was reinforced. But it wouldn't hold them for long. The glass was already beginning to break and shatter. The frame was already starting to strain and buckle. Every chapter in Torn Apart unveils a thrilling new challenge. Ready to face your own? Let Off Grid Magazine be your guide. Brimming with gripping tales, expert survival tips, and the latest gear, Off Grid Magazine transforms readers into adventurers. Embark on a journey where the intense drama of Torn Apart collides with real-world survival. Your adventure begins with Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 27 The train emerged from the tunnel, speeding along at 200 miles per hour. We had entered another huge cave, an endless space. Suddenly the ground fell away from us. We were now on the bridge. We were now over the water, the underground lake. We were fast running out of track fast running out of time. The bridge was high above the water, at least 200 feet, possibly higher. How long? I asked. How long before the track runs out? Two minutes, Maria answered. Maybe less. Okay, it's time. We have to jump. In one minute, the infected will break through. In two minutes, we're out of track. We need to jump. Maria did not look confident. She did not want to do it. I handed her one of the parachutes. Here, put this on, like a backpack. Was it bad? She asked. When you were sucked out of the plane over Sydney, was it scary? I wanted to lie and say, nah, it was a piece of cake. But I knew she would see right through me. It was terrifying, I answered. And then for a split second, it was kind of fun. But your NBC suit will absorb a lot of the impact. What about you? I have experience on my side. One jump and now all of a sudden you're an expert? Look, we don't have time for this. Maria nodded. She didn't like the idea at all. But she knew it was the only way. I showed her how to put the parachute on, 
and gave her the crash course in how to pull the handle as soon as she was clear of the train. Keep your hand on the handle as you jump. As soon as you're clear, pull the handle. Maria nodded, speechless, too scared to say anything. And, and as soon as I gave her these last-second instructions, my heart began to race. My chest tightened up. We opened the side door and the wind roared through the carriage. It was violent and angry. I guess traveling at over 200 miles per hour, the wind really is angry and violent and dangerous. We had to open the door together, using all our strength to pry them apart. To get the door to stay open, we had to jam the shotgun in there. Maria had strapped on the parachute. The harness was covered in blood. Grab the handle, I yelled over the roaring wind. Turn your back so it's facing out the door. You want me to jump backwards? Are you crazy? You won't really be jumping. You won't have time. Just pull the chute. The wind will catch it and drag you out and away from the carriage. Hopefully, you will float down to the water. And then what? Unclip the chute and swim. Maria shook her head. She still did not want to do it. I can't, she said. I can't. You can. It's too high. That's a good thing, I said. The higher up we are, the more time the chute has to deploy, the more chance the parachute has to slow down your descent. What are you going to do? I'll be right behind you. Wait, what about Ben? She asked. How are you going to get him out? Don't worry, I'll get him. I'll drag him out. He's too heavy. You'll never make it. We don't have a choice. We were almost out of time. The infected were about to break through the door. The tracks were about to run out on us. And it felt like the train was still picking up speed. It felt like we were now flying along, high above the water. I pushed Maria towards the door. The time for arguing was over. She was shaking her head, crying. We made eye contact, and I pulled her chute handle and pushed her out. The parachute deployed out of the door, and she was immediately dragged up and out of the train as she screamed. I watched her for a few seconds to make double sure that she was clear of the bridge and over the water. She had made it. Now it was my turn. I ran to the driver's cabin and grabbed Ben by his arms and dragged him towards the door. I prepared myself. I took a deep breath. I shook my hands out one last time and then grabbed Ben in a sort of bear hug. I clasped my hands and fingers together. Ben was big and heavy, but adrenaline and fear had given me a burst of strength. I could hold him, I told myself. I have to hold him. If I dropped him, he would die. I turned so my back was facing out the door. But then I realized I would only be able to hold on to Ben with one hand, since I needed my other hand to release the chute. This wasn't going to work. I needed to secure Ben to my body somehow. His belt. I whipped it out through the loops on his pants. I quickly buckled it and slipped it over my shoulders. I then made sure Ben's shoulders were looped over the belt as well. It wasn't much of an improvement, but it would help. It was time to go. But just as I was about to jump, the whole train began to shake. I looked up, looked through the door into the driver's cabin. Through the windshield I could see the carriage dip forward. The whole train shook violently again. I was nearly knocked off my feet. We had run out of track. The train began to fall. I remember everything happening in super slow motion. I held on to Ben as tight as I could, all seven foot three hundred pounds of the man. I pulled the handle on the chute. In the end, I didn't even need to jump. The train shook from side to side, throwing me out and away from the train, out into the enormous dark cavern. My chute was deployed and my descent was slowed. I held on to Ben as tight as I could. My arms and my hands and my fingers screamed in pain. Chapter 28 The pain. White hot. It felt like heated knives and bamboo splinters had been inserted under my fingernails all the way up to my knuckles. But I held on. Everything was still happening in slow motion. We were clear of the unstoppable runaway train. We were clear of the tracks. I saw the bridge. Saw where it had been blown up. The train fell majestically into the lake at over 200 miles per hour. It practically disintegrated upon hitting the water, causing a giant wall of whitewash. I was instantly reminded of the destruction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. 
The massacre. For a moment we were in the clear. We were floating and falling. We had been pulled out of the train carriage and the wind had taken the chute. There was enough drag to slow us down and pull us out into the enormous cavern. But as far as I could tell, we might as well have been falling into the night sky. We might as well have been outside, over the Pacific Ocean. I can't adequately describe the enormity of this cavern. It was endless. It was a universe. We picked up speed and floated and descended towards the lake. At this point, all I wanted to do was keep Ben from drowning. Keep myself from drowning. Where is Jack when you need him? He was the strongest swimmer in our group, and he had practically saved me from drowning in Sydney Harbor. I quickly scanned the immediate area, looking for Maria. But I couldn't see her. It was too dark. All of a sudden, Ben's shoulders slipped out from the belt that I had strapped around the both of us. I still had a hold of him in a bear hug, but my hands and fingers were numb from pain and exhaustion. He was starting to slip. Suddenly, my hands seized up, and I could no longer hold on. I let go of Ben involuntarily. He fell away. I screamed, and the enormous never-ending cavern swallowed my voice. I'm sorry, I said to Ben and to myself. I closed my eyes as Ben fell back first into the water. He was unconscious. I started to cry as I realized that in a matter of seconds, water would fill his lungs. In a matter of seconds, he would drown. I continued to fall and float. I eventually hit the water. I hit hard. I must have been falling faster than I thought. I was surprised at how warm the water was. I looked around in a daze. I couldn't see Maria. I couldn't see Ben. I was alone. The parachute had a built-in life jacket. The life jacket no doubt saved me from drowning. I must have hit my head, or maybe I snapped my neck awkwardly. I don't really remember. I must have passed out. The next thing I knew, I was on a boat. An old fishing trawler. I thought I had been saved. I was wrong. Chapter 29 I had floated and drifted to a dark place. I was trapped there, in the darkness, for a long time. I found myself sitting in a chair, and then I was strapped into the chair. My arms were tied to the armrests. I couldn't move, couldn't budge. I constantly felt like I was drowning, suffocating and choking. Suddenly my arms were stretched out, my shoulders were dislocated. I was strung up in front of a crowd of faceless people. I was being crucified. Questions were shouted from the crowd. Why did you do it? Do what? Why did you enter the fortress? Why did you walk off into the desert? You had Maria Marsh. She is the only person on record to have survived a bite. She is the only person immune to the Oz virus. You had her. And instead of getting her the hell out of Australia, you put her back in harm's way. You took her out into the Australian outback with barely any water, hardly any food. What the hell were you thinking? You weren't thinking. Now you are in hell. A labyrinth. A prison for bodies and souls. You are being hunted by nanoswarms and infected undead monsters. You are being hunted by a psychopath in a gas mask. You couldn't even kill him when you had the chance. Why did you do it? For my friends, I answered. For Jack, for Kim, for Kenji. You don't even know if Jack is alive. You don't even know if Kenji is alive. You should never have come down here. The fortress. You were warned. You were told to stay away, to forget about it. This is not a sanctuary. This is not a place of refuge. Not anymore. It is hell. It is a place of torture. Do you think you will find salvation down here? I will find my friends, I repeated. They are my strength. Love leads to loss and fear and pain and suffering. You should let go of these attachments. Let go of them. They are better off. Dead. No. You cannot save them. You will die down here. I woke up suddenly. I felt like I was falling. I woke up on my back on a hard wooden surface. My head throbbed and ached. Maria was next to me. She was asleep. Her head was propped up on what appeared to be a backpack. She looked so peaceful. Her right arm was bandaged and in a sling. She was no longer wearing her NBC suit, just her jeans and a t-shirt. I tried to sit up, but it was hard to move. 
and then I realized someone was standing over me. An old man. He wore a short, messy beard. It was stained with food and drink and dirt. He was wearing denim overalls and big rubber boots. He was holding a giant iron hook. A fishing hook? My heart skipped a beat, and I tried to move back, but I was dizzy and faint and weak. I couldn't focus my eyes. Her shoulder was dislocated, the man said. His voice was gentle, patient. I repositioned it for her. Put the joint back into place, back into the socket. She'll need to keep it in a sling for a few days. Too early to tell if there's any ligament damage. I touched my forehead. There was a fresh bandage wrapped securely around my head. It still hurt. Where am I? I asked. We. Where are we? The old man swung his hook, impaling the underbelly of what had to be a large fish or chunk of meat. He dragged it into an industrial-sized icebox and slammed the door shut. We are lucky, he said. It's hard to catch these fish without the right tools. There's fish down here? Yes, lots of little fishies, some big ones. Where are we? I repeated. You're on my boat. It's a shark in these waters. It's the only safe place left down here. I looked around slowly. It was an older boat. It appeared to be a fishing trawler. On the roof of the cabin, or the bridge, was a radar dish and some other technical equipment. My head throbbed. My vision narrowed. I closed my eyes. I stitched your head wound up, the man said. It was very deep. Ten stitches in total. No need to thank me. He placed the hook on top of the ice box. He then locked it with a large, heavy-duty padlock. He took out a small torch from his top pocket and shined it in my eyes. The light was bright. What are you doing? I asked. Checking your vision, pupil dilation. How do you know how to do this? Are you a doctor? And why is there a fishing trawler down here? Your pupils are reacting nicely, and it's not a fishing boat anymore. It's been converted into a research vessel. The military was interested in the marine ecosystem of this lake. And no, I'm not a doctor. I've had help. A teacher. A teacher? I asked. Who? I was so disorientated at this point. I had a feeling like I was stuck on a roller coaster and I couldn't get off. How did we get here? What happened? Where is Ben? The big man? He is alive. He is below deck. He needed a blood transfusion. He survived? He's alive? Yes, he is strong. I saw the train, saw the explosion. The big man, he was clinging to a piece of driftwood, a part of the train, clinging to life. You two girls were barely conscious. Your parachute harnesses were keeping you afloat. You should thank the design. Thank God that they came built in with a flotation device. And her protective suit. It protected her body. Her bones. Her organs. I have seen the Special Forces soldiers wear them. Where did she get one? I stood. My knees were shaking. It was hard to get my balance. I noticed there was a steady stream of white wash, leaving a trail behind the boat. The engine was chugging along. You need rest, the man said. Where are we going? A safe place. I need to get to the headquarters. I need to find my friends. All in due time. First, you rest. Eat. Get your strength. First, we make sure your friend, the big man, does not die. No. I need to go now. Why are you in such a hurry? Because I need to be. I need to get my friends. I pointed to Maria. I need to get her to safety. You were close to death. You should have died on that train. You should have drowned. This boat is a safe place. Probably the only safe place left down here. Yeah, yeah, I know. There was a code black. The general ordered a lockdown. But trust me, I need to get her out of here. And where would you go? To the general? You would speak with him? I will do whatever I have to do. Why are you so desperate? Why are you so ready to die? To risk your life and your friend's life? You should stay on this boat. Never get off this boat. You should follow my advice if you do not want to meet your end at the hands of the general. I shook my head. I didn't know whether to tell him that Maria was immune. Would it make any difference? 
His mind seemed to be made up. But like he said, I was desperate. I had come this far. She's immune, I said, to the Oz virus. So the rumors are true? What rumors? Rumors floating around this place? A young girl? An angel? Immune to the Oz virus? A living, breathing miracle? A savior? A cure? Yeah, it's all true, I said. She was bitten, back in Sydney. She didn't die. She didn't turn into a monster. She survived. You have come all the way from Sydney? Yes. We were trying to get her to safety, trying to get her out of the country. We? My friends. We were traveling in a group. We were strong as a group. We had two soldiers with us. We were so close to getting out of here. But fate has brought you back. It has brought you down here. I wonder why. We had no choice. Our friends, some of our group, they were captured. That is beside the point. If she is indeed immune to the Oz virus, you should have stayed away from this place. Once we were cut off from the rest of the world, the walls of solid rock began closing in. The desert consumed the general and his soldiers. It changed them. The pressure of containing this virus, the burden of all the lives that have been lost, the isolation. In a matter of days, weeks, months, this place became their prison. It became a literal physical hell, a prison of their minds and their bodies, and their very souls. He was right? Of course he was right. Any rational person knew that Maria needed to be evacuated. She needed to be wrapped in a bubble, kept out of harm's way. But how? What the hell was I supposed to do? Leave my friends? Leave Jack and leave Kenji? Abandon Kim? Abandon everyone? I didn't have the strength to make that call. And neither did Maria. Call us selfish. Call us whatever you want. But we couldn't just leave. You had hope, the man continued. Hope that your friends are alive. Hope that you would find something down here worth fighting for. Worth dying for. I am sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I am sorry to inform you. What? Inform me what? That you should abandon hope. I shook my head. No, they are down here. I know they are. I can't just leave them. It was Maria's idea. She didn't want to leave either. We had no way out of the country anyway. We were stuck. We were screwed. This was our only choice. You need to help us. You need to take us to... To where? He asked, cutting me off. There is nowhere left. Nowhere I can take you. This boat is your last refuge. The military area is in lockdown mode. No one gets in. The residential area is in lockdown. It is off limits now. I'm not sure how many civilians we lost, but trust me, it was bad. It was a killing field, a massacre. They killed the civilians? Yes. Such a cruel twist of fate. They were lucky to have survived the fire of the Oz virus, survived the panic. They made it here. And then, just like that, their fate was decided. There was some debate about how useful the civilians were being. Were they just a drain on our resources? Some were proving to be quite useful, such as the big man. Some of the other scavengers were a great asset to us and the general as well. They could bring in all manner of supplies, but now they are all gone. How did you know he was a scavenger? I saw the mark on his wrist, and I remember hearing stories about a gladiator. Who else could it be? A gladiator? Yes, a true warrior. Like I said, some of the scavengers were useful. He was one of them. But the others? The general was convinced they were just a drain on our resources. A drain on resources? What are you talking about? How can you talk like that? How can you say that? He took a deep breath. This is the way of the world now. Down here, everything is limited. If someone is not contributing to the ecosystem, to this new society, they have no purpose. They cannot be allowed to remain, to exist. There was an outbreak in the residential sector. Nobody knows how the virus got in, but it did. General Spears ordered the lockdown immediately. The fortress is now essentially isolated and cut off from the outside world. Life support systems have been prioritized. Prioritized? What the hell does that mean? It means all non-essential systems have been shut down. 
power is reserved for the military sectors only. So the civilians, the survivors, they just cut them off, turned off their power. I was fortunate enough to have survived. I was lucky that I had access to this boat. I have food supplies, enough to last quite a while. And of course I can always supplement my supplies. But yes, because of the Code Black, the outbreak, because the general ordered the lockdown, he has sentenced us all to a slow death. This changes nothing, I said. I still need to get Maria to safety. I still need to find my friends. It is a bad idea, he repeated. I cannot be certain, but there is talk that the general will not wait for hunger and dehydration. There are rumors that he will open the residential area and the prison. Let the infected roam this fortress. Let the virus eliminate the few remaining survivors. Prison? I asked. Excuse me? There's a prison down here. This place, this entire facility was designed to be self-sufficient. It is essentially an underground biosphere. It was designed to be a microcosm of society, of the world and the environment. This water is the fuel source. It is an underground lake, the biggest of its kind in the world. With this lake, we can create power, oxygen. We have farms. We can grow crops, food. We can be self-sustainable. Well, we could have. Not anymore. You have farms down here? Yes. So, if you have an underground water source and farms and crops, why the need for scavengers? Why has the lockdown condemned everyone to death? The lockdown procedure killed all these processes. Like I said, all power is now prioritized and reserved for the military sectors. And with no one to tend to the farms, they will die. The crops won't get planted. They won't be harvested. The cycle cannot continue. Eventually, the food supply will run out. Eventually, we will all starve. I don't intend on staying here until I starve. I don't intend on dying down here. I need to get to the general. I need to get my friends. You have to help me. Please. You have to take me to the military headquarters. The old man lowered his head and thought about his options. I can take you to the docks at the research facility. It should be the least dangerous place, the least infested. They had security measures. But still, my advice, stay on the boat. Never get off the boat. I don't have a choice. I need to do this. Very well, I can take you there. I'll take you to the docks. But first, you need to eat. Trust me, you will need your strength. With every twist in Torn Apart, a new adventure unfolds. Are you ready to create your own real-world saga? Off-Grid Magazine awaits with inspiring survivor stories, practical advice, and the latest in expedition gear. Experience an adventure where the gripping narrative of Torn Apart meets the practical challenge of survival. Off-Grid Magazine is your companion on this thrilling journey. Visit offgridweb.com for more. Chapter 30 Maria woke up a few minutes after I did. She was even more disorientated. Her shoulder hurt like crazy. She felt sick from the pain. She must have hit the water extremely hard for her shoulder to have been dislocated while she was wearing the NBC suit. I kind of felt bad for pushing her out of the train. Maria must have taken the protective suit off at some point. It was hanging over the side of the boat, drying out like a wetsuit. The old man led us into the dining room area. We sat around a small dinner table and he handed us some small sealed foil bags. You girls need to eat up. You're both way too thin. We haven't had much food over the past couple of months, I said. What are these? Maria asked. MREs, the man answered. Meals ready to eat. Courtesy of the military. Enjoy them. They are our last. Your last ones? I said. We can't take these. You can. You need to eat. Even as hungry as we were, the MREs were hard to eat, especially cold. Wow, these are not the best, I said, reading the ingredients list on the side of the packet. Apparently, I was eating spaghetti bolognese. What did you get? I asked Maria. Mushroom risotto, I think. What did you get? Spaghetti bolognese. 
Maria then started singing a song. It was called Cold Spaghetti. Apparently, it was a Wiggles song. What are you singing? I asked. It's a Wiggles song, Maria answered. You know, cold spaghetti, cold spaghetti? No? No, I can't say that I've heard that one. You missed out. Singing is good for the soul, the old man said. You should sing every day, as much as you can. So what's your name? I asked. Charles, he answered as he retrieved a large bottle of rum from one of the many cupboards in the dining area. He took a long swig, spilling some down his chin. Nice to meet you, Charles. Nice to meet you, too, he replied. And thanks for saving us, Maria said. We owe you big time. He waved us off. Think nothing of it. I was just doing what anyone would have done. And besides, you girls were fine. But the man, he was in trouble. Well, we're glad you saved him, too, I said. He means a lot to us. Charles was quiet for a few minutes after that. He took another swig of rum. His shoulders were hunched forward. His eyes were starting to glaze over. He stroked his beard. After a while, he said, I remember the big man. He lived down here. He was a scavenger. He was highly regarded amongst the soldiers and the civilians. Not as a leader or anything like that. But just as a pillar of strength. I guess it's not hard to see why. He is an intimidating person. Where is Ben? Maria asked. Can we see him? He is below deck, but you cannot see him. Not until he has regained his strength. Not until the blood transfusion is complete. It is good for the muscles. Good to keep everything fresh. How do you know how to do that? The blood transfusion. Are you a doctor? No, I've had help. A teacher. He has lost the ability to practice his profession. So now he teaches me. His body is failing him. But his mind is sharp. We help each other. When the general ordered the lockdown, he ordered the deaths of all non-essential personnel. I was forced to hide. I ran. I took this boat to the darkest corner of the lake. And I hid. I kept quiet. Luckily with this boat, I am a king. Water is used as both protection and a source of life. It gives us power. Feeds us. Protects us. You need water. But we are stuck. We can't get out. We can't leave. So we live on the boat. Like I told you, don't ever get off the boat. He took another long swig of his rum. Both Maria and I had stopped eating. What happened down here? Maria asked. Chaos happened. Evil. The general was forced to be ruthless. Like I said, when the general ordered the lockdown, he ordered the deaths of all non-essential personnel. Civilians. He killed them all. It was cold-blooded, methodical, calculated. First, he herded all those people from the residential area into the storage warehouses. There they remained for days with no explanation. No food, no water. And when all those people became angry and outraged, starving and desperate, they tried to storm the blast doors. It was useless. They were dead from the moment the general had locked them up. He could have let them starve. I don't know why he didn't. Maybe he was being merciful. Finally, the general opened the blast doors. Some people thought we had been saved. That sanity had prevailed. Wait, you were there? He took another drink of rum and began tearing the label off the bottle. Yes, I was considered non-essential. I was expendable. And I knew what the general and his men were going to do. I think a lot of us knew. Some were already walking back from the doors. Yes, they knew. I don't know how they knew, but they knew. The general and his men were waiting for us on the other side of those doors. They were heavily armed. Bullets tore through the crowd of people. It was a killing field. Why? Maria asked. Why did they do it? Why kill all those people? Simple. They didn't want us eating their food. They didn't want us turning into infected monsters. As far as they were concerned, we were a drain on their resources. We were fuel for the virus. We represented a threat to their survival. So we had to be dealt with. How many people? I asked. Hundreds. Maybe thousands. I'm not sure. How did you survive? I hid behind a body. A pile of bodies. I used the dead as a shield for the bullets. I hid there all night. 
I didn't dare move. For as long as I live, I will never forget the sound of bullets tearing into those dead bodies. When they were finished, they sealed the doors up. They got the hell out. So, how did you get out? I was lucky. There was a man, a strong man. The community, everyone down here looked up to him. He was fearless, or at least he gave the impression that he was fearless. So yes, we looked up to him. He gave us strength and hope. When the machine gun fire had stopped and the general's men had cleared out, I found him. He was lying on a pile of bodies. He had so many holes, so many bullet wounds. There was so much blood, yet he was still alive. I couldn't believe it. I stayed with him. I didn't know what else to do. He told me not to worry. He had this weird calming effect on me. He said that the virus had been released. He said that it had gone airborne. He said it was better this way. A few hours later, a military research team came back. For specimens and test subjects and God knows what else. They moved through the piles of dead like vultures, taking what they wanted. I managed to sneak through the blast doors. I escaped with the man. I carried him out. By this time he was barely alive. I dragged him to this boat. I picked the bullets out, one by one. So many bullets. He had died long before I got them all out. And by then he no longer resembled a man. He was just a piece of meat. And yet still, in death, he gave me strength and hope. Don't you see? The great ones, even in death, they give us strength and hope and courage. Hearing the story about the massacre and the execution had crushed what little hope Maria and I had for finding our friends alive. How could anyone survive something like that? Maria had lost her appetite completely. She was obviously thinking about Jack. Had he been executed? Had he been deemed non-essential? Had he been shot in the back with a machine gun and left to rot? What about Kim or Kenji? How many people were left alive down here? Where is Ben? I asked. He is below deck. He is resting. Hopefully tomorrow you can see him. In the meantime, we all need rest. He showed us to a small bedroom below deck. There were two narrow bunk beds built into the wall. I took the bottom bunk. Maria took the top bunk. Rest, the old man said. Tomorrow we will reach the docks. Chapter 31 There wasn't much else to do, so we slept. Not surprisingly, we were both asleep within minutes. We were both sleep-deprived, and we hadn't slept in an actual bed since we spent the night in the farmhouse. It was heaven. But unfortunately, I did not get to sleep for long. Sometime during the night, the noise of the boat's engine woke me up. The engine was working overtime. A few minutes later, I thought I could hear two men speaking. Two men. Who? Was it Ben? I sat up and moved over to the door. I reached out for the handle. It did not turn. The door was locked. I held my breath. Alarm bells began to ring inside my head. Why did he lock the door? What the hell was going on? As far as I was concerned, this could only mean one thing. We were prisoners. I clenched my fists. I wanted to punch through the door. I wanted to walk up there and demand an explanation. This can't be happening, I whispered. Not again. Not now. I moved over to Maria. Psst, Maria. No response. I shook her arm. Wake up. She blinked her eyes open. Huh? What is it? What's going on? We're trapped. The son of a bitch has locked us in here. She was still half asleep, still groggy. Maybe he did it as a precaution. Remember what he said about the soldiers? And the general? No, this is bad news. Being locked up means we're prisoners. I walked back over to the door. Come over here, listen. There are two men talking. It's the old man and someone else. Is it Ben? She asked. I don't think so. We put our ears up against the door and listened. Can you hear them? I asked. Yeah, I hear them. Two men. They were saying awful, violent things. Things about the general. More rumors. We are running low on food, the old man said. Running low on potentials. We can use the brunette, but the blonde is too valuable. She needs to be secured. The general will have to let us back into his circle now. He will let us live. The voices trailed off. We could no longer hear them. 
Suddenly, the boat accelerated. The engine roared. We were nearly thrown off our feet. The boat was now moving very fast. What the hell are they talking about? Maria asked. I don't know, I said. They said they wanted to hand you over to the general. All right, I'm not entirely sure I want to be handed over to the general, Maria said. It sounds like he's lost his goddamn mind. There's no guarantee that he even wants to make an antivirus. Maria was right. If we delivered her to the general, what's stopping him from killing her like he's killed everyone else? Did he even want to make an antivirus? Did he want to stop the plague? Or had he lost his mind? Was he too far gone? I had a feeling it was the latter. The engine of the boat continued working over time. It was loud. You're right, Maria said. We have to get out of here. And then what? Swim for it? I don't know. Maybe we take over the boat. Mutiny, so to speak. To do that, we'll have to take those men as prisoners. Or kill them. First things first, she said. We need to get out of this room. And then we need to get Ben. I looked around the room for something we could use to break out with. Maria tried the handle. When she realized it was locked, she tried pushing the door. Then she barged it with her good shoulder a couple of times. But the door was solid. It didn't budge. I picked up a fire hydrant off the far wall. What about this? We could use it to smash the lock. What if they hear? If they hear us, they'll come looking and we'll have to get the jump on them somehow. Maybe we could use this to hit them in the head, but we can't stay in here. Staying in this room is a dead end. Okay, she said. Do it. I used the fire hydrant to smash the lock, using it as a sort of battering ram. I busted the lock and smashed the door open. It made an incredible noise. We slowly stepped out into the corridor. We waited for a few minutes to see if anyone came to investigate, but no one did. The noise of the engine must have drowned out any noise we were making. There were four rooms below deck. There was one door directly opposite our room, and one to our left at the end of the corridor. To the right were the steps that led upstairs, to the dining room and the cockpit, or driver's cabin, or whatever the hell it's called. There was another door, another room behind the stairs. There was also a trap door that led down, maybe to the engine room. No sign of the old man or the man he had been speaking with. We need to find Ben, I whispered. Maria nodded. We checked the doors. The room at the end of the corridor was unlocked. It looked like the captain's room. It contained a bed and a desk. I guess this is where the old man slept. All the other doors were locked, and there wasn't enough room in the corridor to use the fire hydrant to smash the door. No room to swing. The corridor was too narrow. But Ben had to be inside one of them, I thought. We need to find a key, I whispered to Maria. She nodded, pointed up the stairs. If there were keys, they would be up there. We both knew it. I handed the fire hydrant to Maria so she had something to defend herself with. We slowly made our way up the stairs. We carefully looked around the room. I couldn't see anyone. As far as I could tell, this part of the boat was deserted. The dining room table was empty. In the kitchen area, there was a large pot on the stove. The old man was cooking something. Steam rose from the pot, filling the room. We crouched in the dining area and weighed up our options. Another set of stairs led up to another level. The driver's cabin. The bridge. The boat slowly turned. I pointed up the stairs. Someone is up there, steering the boat, I whispered. Maybe they are both up there, Maria said. This gave us some time to look for the keys. We searched the benches in the dining room and all of the cupboards. We found nothing. I moved to the rear of the boat. Maria's NBC suit was no longer hanging up. It was gone. I saw the large fishing hook resting on top of the industrial-sized icebox. A weapon. From my position on the rear of the boat, I could see up to the bridge. The windows were dark and grimy, covered in dirt and maybe salt. I could just make out the shadow of a man. Odds are the keys to the rooms were up there. The old man probably had them on him. This was no good. I returned my attention to the large fishing hook. At the very least, 
We might be able to use the hook to break open the locked doors, I thought. I tapped Maria on the shoulder and pointed over to the hook. She nodded. I stayed low and crawled over to the icebox. I grabbed the hook. I was about to take it back to Maria so we could briefly discuss whether we should attack the old man or if we should use the hook to break into the rooms. But then I noticed that the padlock on the freezer box was unlocked. I don't know what came over me, but I couldn't resist. Something the man had said earlier. We could use the brunette. Use? What did he mean? I needed to know for sure. I needed to know. I opened the box. I held my hand up to my mouth and held my breath. I had to look away, and I had only looked for a split second, but what I saw would be forever burned into my memory. I saw arms, and legs, human, chunks of meat. I ran back to Maria hunched over. I felt dizzy, nauseas. She looked at me. What's wrong? I shook my head. We need to get Ben first, and then we need to kill these guys. What? I'm serious. It's us or them. They're messed up. They're eating people. We need to kill them. They were talking about food before. They were talking about eating us. Well, eating me? Eating us? Like cannibals? Yeah, this is messed up. Maria was shaking her head. She didn't believe me. I dragged her down the stairs back below deck. I jammed the hook in the door of the room that was directly opposite our room. I used the hook like a crowbar and pried the door open. The room was empty. A narrow bunk bed. A desk. A computer. We moved over to the desk. It was covered in paper. Some of the pages were bounded together. The cover page read, Swarming Behavior of Infected. Another one titled, Hunting Techniques Behavior of Nanovirus. More papers titled, Mutations of Oz Virus and Accelerated Growth. Project Salvation. All of them had been written by Dr. Michael Hunter. What does this mean? Maria asked. I don't know. Maybe this guy likes to keep himself informed. We left the papers and moved to the next room. We pried it open with the fishing hook. We finally found Ben. He was lying down on a bed. He was hooked up to an intravenous thing. A bag of blood was hanging from a hook. Lying next to Ben was another man. He was unconscious. He had no legs. They had been amputated above the knee, about mid-thigh. He had no arms. They had also been amputated, above the elbow, close to the shoulder. He was the source of the blood transfusion. He was giving life to Ben. I dropped the hook and ran over to Ben. I felt his forehead and checked his pulse. He was alive. He slowly opened his eyes. He already knew we were in trouble. We need to get out of here, he whispered. Yeah, he already knew what was going on. They had given him a blood transfusion, not because it was the right thing to do, but because it was better for his muscles, for his meat. They wanted to keep him fresh. If I had to guess, I'd say this is why they had kept this poor man alive. They had cut his legs off, and his arms, but they had kept him alive. Ben stood ripped the intravenous tubes out of his arm. Blood spurted onto the floor. He pushed me aside. Hey, we need to be quiet, I said. Take it easy. But then I turned around and saw why Ben was so agitated. Standing in the doorway with a gun pointed directly at Maria's head was a man who I'd never thought I'd ever see again. A man with one hand. A man we left for dead in the morgue of North Sydney Hospital. Dr. Hunter, Dr. Michael Hunter. You cannot leave, he said. No one leaves the boat. Chapter 32 Maria and I were marched up the stairs at gunpoint. Ben was handcuffed and locked inside the captain's room. For a second, I thought Dr. Hunter was going to shoot him and throw him overboard. But then I realized they wouldn't do that. It would be a waste of food. We were led to the back of the boat. The engines were fired up. It sounded like they were struggling. And then I noticed why. The boat was pointed upstream. It was fighting the current. Water was rushing past the boat, towards a massive waterfall. The old man pointed to the waterfall. The water is rushing. 
It is moving fast. If you try and swim, you will drown. If you don't drown, you will go over the falls. Your bones will be crushed. And then you will die. The old man still had the bottle of rum in one hand, a gun in the other. The bottle of rum was nearly empty. He must have been drinking all night. The water system is circular, he continued. Water has to be flowing. Stagnate water is no good. Dr. Hunter also had a gun pointed at us. They were taking no chances. He threw us a pair of handcuffs. Tie yourselves together, to the railing. The handcuffs he gave us were stained with blood. Look familiar? he asked. I had a bad feeling I knew what he was going to say. These are the handcuffs you used to tie me to the morgue fridge at North Sydney Hospital. Do you know what I had to do to escape from that hospital? The blood on the cuffs had dried to a deep brown. The infected had broken into the hospital, he said. There were more inside the morgue fridge. They were about to break free. I was trapped. No way out. Do you know what a person is capable of when they are faced with certain death? We had no choice, Maria said. You tried to kill us. Kill or be killed, he said. It is the way of the world now. And I guess it always was the way of the world. He paused, looked at his left forearm, where his hand used to be. I thought I knew. I thought I knew what people were capable of. But now I truly know. One of my tools, a surgical saw, was within reach. I used it to cut through my arm. Cut myself free. I only blacked out twice. He opened the icebox and retrieved what appeared to be a surgical saw. This is the very one. I carry it with me now wherever I go. He tossed it over to us. It landed at my feet, clanging loudly on the wooden floorboards of the boat. You may use it, as I did. He was taunting us. What did you do with Kim? Maria asked. We saw you, in that town. You captured Jack. You were with Kim. Where are they? Capture? We did not capture Jack. We rescued him. Whatever. Where are they? They are safe, for the moment. What are you doing to that man down there? I asked. What is in that ice box? The old man dropped his bottle of rum. He tried to pick it up, but he just kicked it further away. When he finally did pick it up, he threw it overboard. Do not judge me. You must free yourself from the judgment of others and of yourself if you truly wish to survive. You have no right to judge me. No right. We are surviving. That is all. You're eating him, aren't you? I said. You're going to eat Ben. You're going to eat us. Not her, the old man answered, pointing a bony, wrinkled finger at Maria. The doctor says we are not allowed to eat the blonde. You're crazy, Maria said. No, the old man said defiantly. We are not. We are not. We know what this is. We know what we have to do. We have massive warehouses of food down here, but the supplies are cut off now. The infection, the airborne strain. We went hungry for the first few weeks. The pain was awful. It made it hard to think. All we did was sleep. We knew we couldn't survive for much longer. So we made a choice. I shook my head. What choice? This is not a choice. We are afraid. Of dying. Of starving. We will survive. We will endure. We will do whatever it takes. The human spirit is capable of such amazing feats of strength and endurance. It can survive almost anything. It adapts. It gains strength from the smallest, most insignificant things. These things give us hope. Hope gives us the strength to live, if only for one more day. You have been hungry, yes? We are doing this out of necessity. We are doing this to live. Survive. Dr. Hunter lowered his head. You don't know. You weren't here. You don't know what it was like. We've gone hungry too, I said. We've barely had enough food or water. We were struggling. Same as you. Same as everyone. I had been living on this boat for over a month, Dr. Hunter continued, ignoring me. He would ferry me back to the docks, back to the inner sanctum, so I could continue my research. But I was living, sleeping, eating on the boat. I no longer trusted the general or his men. There were rumors that civilians and research assistants and non-military personnel were being murdered in their sleep or taken away, thrown into the labyrinth. Labyrinth? I asked. 
I can't continue my research if I'm hungry, Dr. Hunter added. Too weak to think, too weak to concentrate. I can't fix this if I'm dead. I closed my eyes and looked away. I honestly thought I was going to be sick. Our goal, our mission, he said, shaking his head. Mission. It's amazing to even think in those terms now. To have a mission, you need to be organized, from top to bottom. You need to have goals, plans, orders. We have none of that now. Everything is gone. It happened so quickly. What happened? Our mission was to find Maria. The general's men had intercepted intelligence reports that indicated Maria was still alive. There were reports of activity, 300 miles south of here, in the town of Hope. There were survivors. They sent in surveillance drones. They found her. Maria Marsh. If I could capture her, if we could secure her, we would be allowed to stay. We would be allowed to live. She was the answer to our prayers. Kim had been living in the research facility. She was proving to be quite useful, and she would guarantee Maria's cooperation. Unfortunately, we did not find Maria. We found Jack. Kim vouched for her brother. She said we could use him to lure Maria to us, force her to cooperate. The area was becoming increasingly dangerous. We had to fall back. Sometime during the night, we were hunted down by several rogue nano swarms. Part of the convoy broke away to distract the swarms. They were ambushed. They never made it. And when we finally made it back here, there had been a containment failure. The general had ordered a lockdown. Yeah, Maria said. You brought infected people back here, in those tanks. They got loose. Haven't you learnt from your mistakes? We needed them, Dr. Hunter answered, defending his methods. To continue our research, we must know our enemy. But now I'm starting to think the general no longer cares about our research. I'm starting to think he doesn't care about any of it. Not anymore. But you, he said, pointing to Maria. You, the general will take notice now. He will. How can you be so sure? I asked. What if he's gone totally insane? If I prove my worth, he said. If I prove that I can fix this mess, he will allow me to live. Maria shook her head. I'd love to help, really, I would. But remember the last time we met? You tried to kill us. You tried to harvest our organs. Believe me, I want to help but I don't want to be cut up into tiny pieces. I won't hurt you, Dr. Hunter said. You have my word. We will need blood samples from you. Maybe conduct an MRI of your brain, but you will not be harmed, I promise. And what about Rebecca? Maria asked. Dr. Hunter was silent for a moment. I cannot guarantee her safety. Could we trust this guy? Maria and I knew it would eventually come down to this. Maria would eventually be turned into a science experiment, but I had always hoped it would be under slightly better circumstances. Dr. Hunter had turned to cannibalism. He had killed. And continued to kill. And there was something else. It's hard to explain. He wanted to use Maria to create an antivirus, but it wasn't so he could stop the Oz virus from spreading. It wasn't so he could save the world. It was so he could save himself. There was something about the distinction between those two motivations that made me feel uneasy. And of course, for me, the unfortunate part about all of this was even if they kept their word and did not harm Maria, I was still as good as dead. You need to promise me, Maria said after a while. Promise me that you won't hurt my friends. I'm afraid it's not up to me, Dr. Hunter said. General Spears is God down here. It is up to him. Where is Jack? Maria shouted. Where are you keeping him? And what did you do with Kim? I asked. Trust me, he continued. They are safe for the moment. Kim was our last great success. Her body. Yes, they are safe for the moment. And we are safe for the moment. For how long? I do not know. This is the safest place to be. On the water. We are isolated from the rest of the dwindling population down here. The outbreak occurred in the research and residential areas. It was a catastrophic containment failure. I am starting to think we have been the victim of sabotage. All along. I know the virus moves fast. I know it is deadly. But every time we are close, every time we make a breakthrough, we have been met with disaster. 
It is too much. But I believe everything happens for a reason. Dr. Hunter looked at his forearm, and then back at us. Yes, I truly believe everything happens for a reason. My body is just a vessel. My knowledge will ensure my survival, my immortality. I can bargain with the general, and I can teach survivors like Charles here. Together, we will survive. My knowledge, his body, it is a symbiotic relationship. It's funny. The Oz virus, once it takes over, it creates a sort of symbiotic relationship with the primal part of the brain, the reptilian part. It stimulates certain areas, it stimulates the adrenal glands, and it completely destroys other areas, the frontal lobe, the neocortex. It is truly amazing. We created a new form of life, a new predator, a new weapon. So what are you going to do now? I asked. What's the next step? I am going to hand you over to General Spears. Our cooperation will ensure our survival. It will buy us freedom from his wrath. Wrath? He still commands a small but formidable force of special forces soldiers. I told you, the old man said. This boat. This is the last refuge down here. Don't get off the boat. Don't ever get off the boat. I told you. You should stay on the boat. You will be happier here. Lots of people have stayed on this boat. Now they keep me company. They're ghosts. Their spirits. Their souls. I am never alone. Would you like to keep me company? The old man had cabin fever, I thought. He hadn't been outside in a long time. Hadn't seen sunlight in a long time. That's gotta mess with your mind after a while. But as long as Dr. Hunter was with us, he would control that maniac. He would protect us. Or at least, he would protect Maria. I had a feeling I was about to be offered as a sort of sacrificial lamb. Why are you doing this? I asked Dr. Hunter. Why are you helping him? He is giving me asylum. Like I said, it is a symbiotic relationship. It is fair. Yes, asylum, the old man said. You girls should prepare yourself. The general's men will be here soon. Right on cue, three bright red flares were fired high into the sky, lighting up the cavern. The glow from the flares turned everything an ominous red. They had been launched from a tugboat. They are here, the old man said. The tugboat approached slowly. We could see shadows moving around on the deck. Suddenly a rope was thrown over to us. The rope had a grappling hook attached. The grappling hook latched onto the hand railing of the fishing trawler. They had us. They immediately began to tow us along. The movement was sudden and violent. The old man was thrown off his feet. He dropped to his knees and dropped his gun in the process. It slid to my feet. I picked it up with my free hand. I did not hesitate. He looked at me. His eyes said that he was not ready to die. And in the split second before I blew his brains out, he begged me to let him live. Pleaded with his eyes. He spoke. No. He was about to say something else. Present his case for life. But I was not ready to listen. I was not ready to be merciful. Not when he had killed innocent people. Eaten innocent people. No. I was not ready to be merciful. I was ready to kill. I squeezed the trigger and the bullet made a mess of his face and his head. His life was ended. Because he did not deserve it. Every chapter in Torn Apart unveils a thrilling new challenge. Ready to face your own? Let Off Grid Magazine be your guide. Brimming with gripping tales, expert survival tips, and the latest gear, Off Grid Magazine transforms readers into adventurers. Embark on a journey where the intense drama of Torn Apart collides with real-world survival. Your adventure begins with Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Chapter 33 I aimed the gun at Dr. Hunter. We had a chance to kill him once before. We didn't. Was it a mistake? Was mercy a mistake? No, he shouted. You can't. I can make this better. I can fix this. You need me. If I'm dead, then he won't care about Maria. He won't. He is beyond reason. He is beyond it. But I can convince him. If he's beyond reason, then how are you going to reason with him? I asked. 
I can persuade him. He will listen. Trust me. Drop your gun, I said. Throw it overboard. He threw the gun into the water and raised his hand. You lost my trust a long time ago, I continued. Back in the morgue of North Sydney Hospital. Maria is all that matters, he said. I mean, we had her. In the morgue. With Maria, we could have made a vaccine right then and there. And then, you would have butchered us. You were going to pack us on ice, ship us out. North Sydney still would have been firebombed. All those people on the freeway and on the bridge and in the tunnel still would have been massacred. I can fix this, he repeated. You know I can. You know this is the right thing to do. I turned to Maria. What do you think? I think we don't have a choice. I hate to say it, but we need him. Unfortunately, she was right. Dr. Hunter needed to do his thing. He was the only one capable. You take her blood, I said. That's it. I swear, if you put one scratch on her, I will execute you. He nodded. Unlock these cuffs, I said, and don't try anything, or my finger will slip if you catch my meaning. Once we were untied, we then handcuffed Dr. Hunter to the railing because I didn't trust him. I even gave him back his surgical saw. Maybe you feel like cutting off the other one, I said. We went below deck and untied Ben. What about the other guy in there? Maria asked. Do we bring him with us? He is too far gone, Ben said. He's lost too much blood. He's lost both legs, both arms. You know what has to be done. I looked at the gun in my hand. No, Ben said. It's easier this way. He retrieved a hypodermic needle from the bedside table. What is that? I asked. Sedative. I'll give him an overdose. He will die in his sleep. Peaceful. I wanted to say a few words. I wanted someone to say a few words, but seeing that man, no legs, no arms, his pale, lifeless skin, he had suffered so much. I had to leave the room. We made our way back upstairs. According to Dr. Hunter, Ben had been given a life-saving blood transfusion. So that was a good thing. It was the silver lining to this whole messed-up situation. However, the reason he had been given a life-saving blood transfusion was not so good. It wasn't necessarily to save his life. It was so the meat on his bones would be fresh. Live meat doesn't rot. It made me feel sick just thinking about it. Ben was still weak, but he eventually came good. He had plenty of time to regain his strength while we were being towed by the tugboat. It took a long time. Hours. The best part of a day. The waiting and the suspense was unbearable. Would the general help us? Would we find our friends? Could Dr. Hunter really make an antivirus? The longer we waited, the more nervous and anxious I became. My mind began to wander. I couldn't stop thinking about how that day... I had made the explicit decision to take a human life. I had made that decision twice. I had failed once. And I had been successful once. I felt weird. Different. I hadn't really killed anyone thus far on our journey. Kenji had taken care of the dirty work. And Daniel. And Ben. I had killed that soldier in the morgue of North Sydney Hospital. But he was infected. He had turned. And so had Officer Dennis. I hadn't killed a living, healthy human being until now, and I could feel the weight of that person's life on my shoulders like I was carrying their soul or something, like I was carrying an extra responsibility now. I know that doesn't really make sense, but it's how I feel. I feel the weight. I feel the burden. The only thing letting me deal and cope with this burden was repeatedly telling myself that the old man was a cannibal. He had turned mad and evil, like the priest and his men. They had slipped and fallen. They had changed into something reprehensible. A person that had forfeited all human rights to life, to the pursuit of freedom and happiness and all that stuff. They were so far gone, they were so evil, that the only punishment they deserved, the only punishment that could be exacted in this new world, was death. I tried to push these thoughts out of my head as we made our way to the inner sanctum of the fortress. It won't be long now, I thought. The general had us. He was dragging this boat, and us, into his domain. We would meet him very soon. And whatever I thought was going to happen, 
every hope that I had for Maria's life, and for my life, and for my friend's life, and for humanity, for a goddamn cure, every hope and dream and wish was about to be burnt to the ground. My dreams were about to be shattered, and I was about to be broken. Chapter 34 We finally arrived at a long wooden pier. A strange mist hung in the air. A small group of soldiers were waiting for us. All of them were shirtless. Camouflage paint covered their upper bodies and their faces. Then again, it could have been mud. They all had overgrown beards, like they hadn't shaved in years. They were heavily armed. The soldiers secured the boat, and we were ordered onto the pier at gunpoint. Maria and I both had our hands raised to let the soldiers know that we weren't a threat. Dr. Hunter had his head lowered. Ben, on the other hand, was just staring at them. The soldiers stared back, silent and fearless. It was then I noticed the light posts that were situated along the entire length of the pier. Strung from these light posts were bodies, corpses, severed heads. <laughs> Some of them appeared to be people who had been infected. Civilians. Some of them were soldiers, and then I realized some of them were still alive. They had been strung up and tortured. They were moaning in pain, moaning and mumbling because they didn't have the strength to speak, to ask for help, beg for help. I wondered what they had done to deserve such a fate. Suddenly, the soldiers parted as someone moved through them, towards us. I couldn't believe who it was. I was speechless. It was Kim. It's okay, she said to the soldiers. They're with me. They're on our side. It's okay. This is Maria Marsh, the one and only. She is going to save us all. Oh my God, Maria said. Kim! We both rushed forward and threw our arms around her. We hugged for a few minutes, crying and laughing, and Kim was all smiles. She looked surprisingly healthy. Her smile and her skin were glowing. She looked like she was in great shape. Her arm, her shoulder where she had been shot, was almost completely healed. You wouldn't even know she had been shot with a high-powered assault rifle only a few months ago. We stood back. I was shaking my head. We had been separated from Kim for so long. It was a huge relief to know that she was all right. Kim held her arms out like she was welcoming us, like she was expecting us and wondering what took us so long. I can't believe it, she said. I can't believe you guys are here. This is incredible. It's a miracle. He was right. This is divine intervention. He is always right. We stood silent for a few more seconds. We were still in shock, completely dumbfounded. Who is always right? I asked. General Spears. Maria finally spoke. Kim? What happened to you? Where have you been? It's a long story, she answered. What happened in New Zealand? I asked. What happened in the quarantine facility? I had so many questions. The last time I saw her, she was practically on her deathbed. She had lost a lot of blood and was no doubt dying from thirst. And the footage we saw of her on Dr. Hunter's computer. She had been drugged and sedated. She was being interviewed or interrogated. She was being used as a test subject for some sort of experiment. But for what? I was so lucky, she said. I was given a second chance. I was saved. By this man. She pointed to Dr. Hunter. Again, Maria and I were both dumbfounded. Dr. Hunter had been forced onto his knees by the soldiers. Kim moved over to him. I'm glad you're alive, she said. But he is still mad at you. Not for long, Dr. Hunter replied. We have Maria Marsh. He can't afford to lose me now. I'm too valuable. He's blaming the containment failure on you. What? Why? I wasn't responsible for that. You know I wasn't. Shh, save your strength. The soldiers stepped forward, gagging the doctor's mouth and placing a black hood over his head. Take him to the general, Kim ordered. What's going on here? Maria asked. And where is Jack? Why did you sedate him? Why did you take him prisoner? Kim tilted her head. How do you know we found Jack? We saw you, I said. We were looking for Jack as well. He had run off. He was actually looking for you. He said he couldn't leave you behind. 
He didn't even know where you were and he still ran off into the desert looking for you. Jack is safe, she said. For the moment. For the moment, Maria asked. What the hell does that mean? It's going to be okay, Kim reassured. Relax, you're finally safe. I can't believe you made it here in one piece. The containment failure, it was bad. The goddamn infected are everywhere. The residential area is totally overrun. The majority of this facility is overrun. But Jack is safe? Maria asked again. Is he... is he hurt? He's fine. I'll take you to meet him very soon. As soon as the general approves it. But we should get moving. We can't stay out in the open for too long. We'll probably need to evacuate soon. No, Maria said. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me where Jack is. Until I see him. Until I know he is safe. Why did they take him? Why? What have they done to you? Maria was fed up. At that moment, relief and happiness gave way to confusion and anger. They haven't done anything to me, Kim answered. Well, they have. But nothing bad. They saved my life. I was dying. I didn't even know I was dying. And they saved me. Dr. Hunter. Dr. West. They saved me. What did you do to Jack? Maria repeated. Tell me. Look, it wasn't planned or anything, Kim said. The general has surveillance drones all over the desert. There were rumors, intelligence reports about you. At first he didn't believe you were immune, but I told him. I swore to him. Eventually he believed. We sent out a rescue squad. But instead of finding you, we found Jack. I couldn't believe it. My baby brother, in the middle of the desert. It was another miracle. You see, this is why the general is a great man. This is why he will be remembered as a hero. Everything he does is for the greater good. He has this knack of following his gut. His instincts are incredible. And once he has a hunch, he acts. He doesn't hesitate. He just gets in and does it. We wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the general. Kim was acting weird. It was like she was a different person. It's like she had been brainwashed. She was speaking extremely fast, like she had drunk a gallon of coffee. Her eyes were wide, taking everything in. And Jack is all right? Maria asked once again, desperate to be completely sure. Trust me, Kim said. Jack is safe for the moment, and we are safe for the moment. This inner sanctum is really the only safe area left. You guys should be breathing a very big sigh of relief. It is a genuine miracle that you made it here. She stepped forward and hugged us again. I'm so glad you're here. Everything is going to be just fine. She kept saying this. She kept reassuring us. And I wanted to feel safe. I wanted to feel happy. And I should have felt happy. I mean, after not knowing if Kim was okay or if she was hurt or even alive, not knowing for so long, we had finally found her. She had sacrificed her body for us. She had literally taken a bullet, put her life on the line for us. She had survived against all odds. I should have been happy. I should have been relieved. But I wasn't. I was afraid. Something was wrong. I looked at her arm again. The bullet wound was practically gone. Can we talk to the general? Maria asked. Do you think he'll help us? So many questions, Kim said. One at a time. Yes and yes, maybe. Truthfully, I'm not sure when we'll be able to talk to him. You see, we've had a rough time these past couple of weeks. And right now, with the containment failure and the outbreak, and the code black and the lockdown, it's really not the best time. Not the best time, I said. Yeah, well, we've lost access to the research facility. It's overrun. To get in there, we'd need to clear it out. By force. To do that, we'd need to use the general's best men. And I'm not sure he'd be willing to do that at the moment. What? I asked. Why not? There have been a few assassination attempts on the general's life. As a result, he's surrounded himself with a squad of special forces soldiers. 24-7 guard, tough bastards. Just look at them. You wouldn't want to mess with these guys. But we need to do this, I said. We could make a goddamn cure. I know. I know. I'll talk to him. And then you can talk to him. And then you listen to him. Make sure you listen. He wants to help. He's the only one left who's fighting this war. 
He's the only military commander left. Everyone else has abandoned the cause, retreated, wrote Australia off as a loss, but not the general. He will fight until his dying breath. And he will win. It's just that, with everything going on, the lockdown, the outbreak, like I said, he's not himself at the moment. He's angrier. At himself, mostly. She pointed up to the hanging bodies. You see? And sometimes his punishments are severe. But he has to make examples. He has to. It's what great leaders do. It's what lions do. And I'm sorry you have to see that. But let me explain. They were soldiers. Followers who questioned the authority of the general. He had to do it. But he just needs time to get his mind back. To get focused. Get his mind back, I said. And what if he doesn't? What then? If he can't help us, if Dr. Hunter can't help us, then we need to get the hell out of here. Nah, you can't leave. Not yet. And don't worry. The general will come good. I mean, he is good. He's just isolated at the moment. He's been down here in the dark for three months now, you know? But don't worry. He'll come out of his shell. This is good news after all. Maria, you don't know how important you are. It's a miracle you're here. Divine intervention. You. You will bring him back. She paused, like she was thinking about something, remembering something. Let's go and see him, she said. Are you sure it's safe? I asked. Is he... is he dangerous? Has he gone mad? Mad? No. He's not mad. Dangerous? Yes. He is dangerous. But that's a good thing. You need to be dangerous in this world. If you're not dangerous, then you're weak. You're as good as dead. But he's not mad or crazy or anything like that? How could you say that? He chose to stay here. Stay behind when everyone else left. The rest of the military has given up, but he will not give up. He will not surrender. He will not be defeated. He is stronger than anyone I have ever met. Again, I wanted to believe her. Come on she said. We can't stay out in the open. Let's go. Kim turned and walked back through the soldiers. She looked at one of the men and nodded her head and gave a little signal. The soldiers then stepped forward and handcuffed us. They even cuffed Ben, who had been weirdly quiet this whole time. They slipped black hoods over our heads, blindfolding us, taking us prisoner. My pulse began to race. This wasn't how this was supposed to go down. Kim, what the hell are you doing? I'm sorry, she said. It's for your own protection. Chapter 35 We were led off the pier. Wooden planks under our feet gave way to dirt, gave way to rock. Where are you taking us? Maria asked. What's going on? You have to be quiet, Kim answered. This place, it's like a holy spiritual place. You can't talk unless you're spoken to. It's a rule. I was getting more and more worried about Kim. They had done something to her. I was sure of it. They had changed her. And everything she'd told us about the general and everything that crazy soldier had told us led me to believe that the general had gone bat crap insane. He had people and corpses strung up from the light posts on the pier for crying out loud. If that's not madness, then I don't know what is. My only hope at that point was that he would recognize how vitally important Maria was. She was absolutely essential to stopping the spread of the Oz virus and saving the world. Hopefully he would understand this. I had already come to terms with the fact that if I survived this meeting, it would be pure luck. But I knew that my life was not really important. We came to a stop. We're here, Kim whispered. Kim removed our hoods. I'm sorry we had to tie you up and blindfold you, she said. I'm only doing it because he told me to. He'd get angry otherwise, and we don't want that. The soldiers removed Ben and Dr. Hunter's hoods as well. They forced them to their knees at gunpoint. Kim then stood between Maria and me and took us by the hand. She had led us into another cavern. The natural rock formations made this place look like some sort of ancient temple. Then again, it could have been the gates to hell. Military equipment was scattered around the cave. Ammunition caches, computer monitors and radar or satellite surveillance equipment. The technology was mixed in with the ancient formations of rock. 
It appeared that the remaining soldiers and the general had moved their equipment here to this cave, fallen back to this point when the outbreak had occurred. They were hiding here, hiding from the infected and from death. At the far end of the cave was an entire wall of monitors. The wall was at least 20 feet high. It was hard to see from where we stood, but they appeared to show black and white surveillance images of the desert. Perhaps these images were from the drone aircraft, I thought. I noticed the other walls of the cavern were covered in aboriginal paintings. Big bright patterns, paintings of giant fish, and crocodiles, and snakes. Behind us, large steel blast doors slowly began closing, sliding into place. It was then I noticed a group of people were standing at the rear of the cavern. They were covered head to toe in a kind of white paint. They carried spears. A few seconds later, I realized they were a tribe of aboriginals. I had no idea what they were doing in this place. Who are these people? I asked Kim. Shh. The general saved them. Took them in. Kim then shook her head, telling me not to speak. She had a look of fear in her eyes. She motioned forward with her head to the wall of monitors at the far end of the cave. Sitting behind a desk, in front of these monitors, was a man. He was staring up at the images of the desert watching. It was the general. He then stood and walked towards us. He was a tall man. He had long legs and freakishly long arms. He was wearing military-style cargo pants and military boots. He was shirtless. His upper body was covered in stripes of camouflage paint. His whole body was extremely muscular. He was almost as big as Ben. He had short gray hair and a short gray beard. He was old, but he appeared to be in the best shape of his life like an Olympic weightlifter or gymnast. He was all muscle, not an ounce of fat. He was an intimidating man. I could immediately see why people were afraid of him, why he was the undisputed leader of this fortress. He knelt down in front of us on one knee. He placed his hand on the rock floor. This is their land, he said, referring to the aboriginal tribe, and we have destroyed it, but they can save it. They can teach us how to live again. When there is no society, when there is no power of any kind, they will take us in. All the families and children who survived this war, they will look after us and teach us how to live and be free. It was at that moment, Ben decided to speak up. Like I said, he had been weirdly quiet since we had arrived at the pier. I now know why. He was waiting for his time to confront the general. He was preparing himself mentally. And now he was ready. Ben had told me earlier that the general had taken from him. Taken his freedom. For this, he wanted revenge. If I had to guess, I'd say that Ben had come to care about the people down here. The other survivors. The other scavengers. And Ben blamed the general for their deaths. Ben stood, ignoring the rifles pointed at his head. What do you know about freedom? He asked. The general remained kneeling. His head was lowered. I know more about freedom than most other living souls. Ben snapped the chain of his handcuffs like a piece of string. You don't know a goddamn thing about freedom. The general stood to meet the challenge. They were eye to eye. I know that true peace can only be achieved through war and conflict. True peace is suffering. All life, all existence, is suffering. The soldiers closed in on Ben, but the general waved them back. They obeyed and lowered their rifles. Ben raised his fists and threw a series of powerful punches at the general. The general took the body blows while protecting his head. He then countered, grabbing Ben by the neck and throwing him to the ground. Kim pulled Maria and me away to a safe distance. Your anger has given you strength, the general said. It has given you strength for a long time, but it is not enough. It will never be enough. Ben jumped to his feet and charged. The general stood firm. The two of them grappled and exchanged blows. The general finally got the upper hand. He flipped Ben over onto his back, slamming him down on the rocks. Your anger is mistaken, the general said. You think I killed your friends? No, I saved your friends. I saved them from starvation. I saved them from infection. Ben slowly got to his knees. The general circled him. You murdered them, Ben said. You slaughtered them all. 
You condemned everyone. You had no right. No right. The general moved quick, too quick for someone of his age. He stomped down on Ben's head. He launched his boot into Ben's ribs. Multiple times. I earned the right. And now I live with the burden. The general jammed his knee down onto Ben's throat, choking him. He then began to punch Ben in the head and face repeatedly. This is true strength. This is true power. And you will never know it. You will never taste it. I wanted to run over and help, but Kim held me back. It was probably for the best. I would not have stood a chance. The general towered over Ben and everyone else in the room. His body was covered in sweat. His muscles were straining. He pointed to his soldiers. Take him to the labyrinth! Ben tried to stand. He was heavily concussed. His face was bleeding. His right eye was swollen and closing over. But he was still ready to fight. The soldiers stepped forward. They each raised their weapons. Taser guns. Ben was tasered at least six or seven times. He screamed in pain, and his body tensed up and convulsed as thousands of volts of electricity shot right through him. In the labyrinth, General Spears said, you will suffer. There is not a thing on this earth that you fear, but perhaps down there you will learn fear. And just like that, Ben was gone, tasered and taken away. Did you know that you hold the power to get more free audiobooks? That's right. It's as simple as visiting your favorite author's website, filling out a contact form, or sending them an email and letting them know that you would love, love, love to see their work on book TV. Go on. You can do it. Now back to the story. Chapter 36 I began to shake. Fear and adrenaline took a firm grip of my whole body. I learned strength a long time ago, the general said. I learned it from the rocks and the mountains, the old things. I learned it from these people, he said, motioning to the tribe of aboriginals. A true strength. A man like that could never know what true strength is. I wanted to ask him where they were taking Ben, but I couldn't speak. I was too scared. We are miles below the Earth's surface, he continued, and yet the indigenous inhabitants of this land found this cave, this cavern. They are nothing more than hunter-gatherers, nomadic tribes. They are primitive and yet advanced and balanced. They had achieved an equilibrium with this world that can only be described as utopian. When they found this place long ago, they were scared. They were alone. They were blind. But their fear did not stop them. It did not cripple them. They persisted. And they were rewarded with this, this inner sanctum, this temple. These cave paintings are over 40,000 years old. They tell a story, the land, the dream time, the spirit world, the physical world, everything in harmony. Everything. The general knelt down again, on both knees, on the rocks. He placed his hands in his lap like he was meditating. He began to breathe deeply. No one knew about this place, he said. It had been long forgotten. When we built this facility, we had no obligation to tell anyone. No obligation to save it. But who could destroy this? Who in their right mind would destroy this shrine? It is history. A testament to the spirit and the strength of man's potential. To ignore fear. To persist in the face of absolute darkness. This is what we must do. We are facing absolute darkness. And we must endure. We must persist. Kim was still standing between Maria and me. She was still holding both of our hands. I think she was doing this to make it absolutely clear that we were with her, that we were not trespassing. After the general's speech about the aboriginal tribe, I wanted to speak out, tell him that we had delivered Maria Marsh. She was immune. Stop wasting time. We're on the same side. Let's get to work. I actually opened my mouth. But Kim squeezed my hand. It was a subtle gesture that told me not to speak out of line. Weirdly, the general hadn't looked at us yet. He hadn't made eye contact, but he kept talking. The original idea and design of this facility came from Albert Einstein. He knew the destructive effects of nuclear war. He knew better than anyone. Nuclear winters, long-term and short-term. In every simulation, Australia is spared the worst. 
Construction began after World War II, expanded during the Cold War. This is the result of combined resources, years and decades worth of construction and human endurance. He paused, thinking. He finally looked at us. Are you soldiers? I looked at Kim. She nodded to say it was all right to speak. Are we soldiers? I said. No, we're just regular people. We're just survivors. You look like soldiers. The way you walk, your eyes, your hands. You can tell. Your shoulders and your neck. Do you know what I mean? I had no idea what he meant. And I had no idea what to say. Neither did Maria. Where did you take Ben? I asked. The general stared at me for a long time. After a while, he said, He was taken to the prison. He was locked up. Dissent will not be tolerated. I swallowed some excess saliva. An awkward silence followed. The company wants me dead, he continued. They have sent people to kill me. Assassins. The so-called Evo agents. We're here to help, I said. Evo agents are supposed to represent the next phase of the evolution of the soldier, he said, ignoring me. A super soldier. They have sent them here to kill me. The company and the military have cut me off. I'm no longer part of their plans. Can you believe that? They threw me to the wolves. They sent me down here. And now they're cutting me off. I should have expected it, though. I had meetings with the Joint Chiefs. The CIA, the NSA, spy masters, all of them. And all they do is lie. To each other. To themselves. Lie and deceive. Do you know what it's like to be in a room full of liars and conmen? He lowered his head and took another deep breath. Which one of you is Maria? I am, sir. Maria answered quickly. He pointed his finger at Maria. Again, he stared and stared at her for a long time. It was incredibly unnerving and intimidating. I want a no-bullshit answer, he said. Are you immune to the Oz virus? Maria nodded. Yes, I think. You think? Wow, wrong answer, I thought. Come on, Maria, keep it together. We've been through too much to be scared and bullied by this guy. Be strong. Were you bitten? The general asked. Yes. Where? On the ankle, just above the ankle. Well, which one is it? Just above. Were you aware at the time of what happens to someone once they are bitten? Yes, we had seen it. I knew. What happened after you were bitten? I felt weak. I had a fever. I was hot and cold at the same time. I had chills. My joints ached. My bones felt like they were on fire. I was passing in and out of consciousness. Were you alone? No, my friends were with me. Kim, Rebecca. And they did nothing? What? Did they know the effects of the Oz virus? Yes, they knew. And there was no action, only inaction. They let you suffer. No. No? Then what were they doing? He shifted his gaze onto me. We knew what we had to do, I said, unable to hold my tongue, unable to give this man the respect he thought he deserved. Of course we knew. We were in the middle of Sydney for crying out loud. The infected were everywhere. So why did you let her suffer? I shook my head. It wasn't like that. We gave her time. What else were we supposed to do? My boyfriend Jack, Maria said. He stood up. He was prepared to take the shot. To take care of me. But he couldn't. He waited. And eventually, I started getting better. I didn't turn. My body fought the infection. The general paused for a while. He whispered to himself, We have Jack. He was discovered in a town not far from here. One hundred clicks south of here. He then looked back at Maria. The doctor assured me we could use him to lure you here. Sun Tzu states that you must always lure your enemy out of hiding with something to gain. Something that he wants. This is why I agreed to Dr. Hunter's ridiculous plan. This is why I have let the doctor live. He talked casually about Dr. Hunter's life, right in front of him. The doctor surprisingly didn't seem to care. But then again, I guess he already knew he was on thin ice. I am not your enemy, Maria said. I want to help. Where are you from, Maria? He asked, 
seemingly changing the topic at random. Sydney, she answered. What part? North Sydney. Your home is gone. How did you survive the firebombing? How did you survive the containment protocol? Maria shook her head. I don't know. We got lucky. Maybe it was fate. We had help from Kim. And Kenji. A soldier. Yeah, we were lucky. Yes, the general said. Kim is strong. Even stronger now. Sydney was one of my biggest failures. I should have ordered a nuclear strike. I should have reduced the entire eastern seaboard to ash. He lowered his head and was silent for a moment, like he was thinking back, remembering the outbreak, the moment the Oz virus reached Sydney. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I quickly looked back at the blast doors. They were firmly closed, and there did not appear to be any other exits, none that I could see. Do you want to know why I stayed my hand? He asked. Do you want to know why I hesitated? He looked away, at the cave walls, at the paintings of the rainbow snake. He shrugged his shoulders. Powerful beings are supposed to be decisive. I do not know why I hesitated. I do not know why I chose not to use nuclear options. Maybe because I am weak, or was weak, but I made sure not to make that mistake again. I ordered a nuclear strike the following day, on the city of Melbourne. I was sad yet defiant. I had learnt from my mistake. I was getting stronger. My convictions, my fortitude. I was doing necessary evil. They would write stories about me one day. I would go down in history. But the virus had already spread further and wider and faster. So fast. We couldn't contain it. We couldn't stop it. Nuclear weapons became useless. The wrong weapon. Another long pause. Another awkward silence. So now, I think that you surviving in an environment where you should not have survived, and my hesitation, my moment of weakness, my decision not to drop a nuclear warhead on Sydney, on you, was divine intervention. What else could it be? Do you believe in divine intervention? I'm not sure anymore, Maria answered. We were tied up, nearly killed by a priest. He had gone mad. He had changed into the worst possible version of himself. How did you get out here? the general asked. Why did you walk off into the desert? We had no choice, I said. It's too dangerous in the cities. They're overrun with infected. The desert is a dangerous place, he said. Death comes easy here. Are any of you infected? No, sir, Maria and I answered at the same time. Time will tell. Time does not lie. We're not infected, I repeated. We wouldn't have made it this far. He held his hand up to silence me. Kimberly, take these three away. Lock them up. What? Where are you taking us? I asked. What are you doing? Maria is immune. We need to act. We need to do something. You will be locked up. I need to make sure you are not infected. I need to make sure you are not lying to me. Kim gave us a look that said she was sorry. It's going to be okay, she whispered. Again, I wanted to believe her. But I didn't. I was too damn scared. Scared of a general who had gone mad from pressure and death. He was fighting an unwinnable war. His mission was unachievable. His goals were too unrealistic. Like he said, he had been thrown to the wolves. He had been placed in a vice. And now the pressure had changed him. I mean, I felt different from killing one individual. One individual who deserved to be killed. So how did he feel? He ordered nuclear strikes. He ordered mass killings. Did he carry the burden of the dead? Could he feel the weight on his shoulders? Civilians? Women and children? Innocent people? A soldiers? And I think that he did. And I think this weight had pushed him over the edge. And now we were trapped down here with him. We were helpless. We were at his mercy. With every twist in Torn Apart, a new adventure unfolds. Are you ready to create your own real-world saga? Off-Grid Magazine awaits with inspiring survivor stories, practical advice, and the latest in expedition gear. Experience an adventure where the gripping narrative of Torn Apart meets the practical challenge of survival. Off-Grid Magazine is your companion on this thrilling journey. Visit offgridweb.com for more. Chapter 37 We were locked up for six days in total. 
Maria, Dr. Hunter, and myself. The whole time we had no food, and only a few mouthfuls of water. We were getting weaker by the minute, and every day we were locked up, we were wasting time. As we were getting weaker, the virus was getting stronger. It was spreading further. More people were dying. We had no idea where they had taken Ben. We had no idea if he was still alive. Our makeshift prison cell was a shipping container. I guess the container was once used to transport supplies, ammunition, food. A few holes had been drilled into the roof to let air in. But other than that, it was completely dark in there. It took a whole day for my eyes to adjust. It was like we were trapped in a black hole. We were cut off from reality. And I very nearly lost my mind in there. For the first few hours that we were locked up, we thought we were alone. But then someone coughed. They were curled up at the far end of the container. They were wearing black. They hadn't moved or said a word since we had been locked up. And they were barely breathing. If he hadn't coughed, we would never have even known he was there. Maria and I moved back and away from the person who had coughed. Dr. Hunter stayed put. He didn't react at all. Who's there? Maria asked. The man continued to cough. It was loud and violent. He began throwing up. The retching noise was awful. It immediately made me feel sick. I don't have a name, he whispered. I lost my name. What? I asked. What does that mean? No response. Hello? He's out cold, Dr. Hunter said. He's dying. How do you know that? I just do. The mystery man remained unconscious right throughout the night. The next day, Kim returned to give us some water. Kim! I shouted. What's happening? What's going on? Why are we still locked up? It's fine, she said. Everything is fine. He's just being ultra careful. Look, the last time we were locked up, we were nearly killed. I said, I don't like this. We finally made it to a military stronghold and the guy who is supposedly in charge or was in charge can't even help us. This is not good, not good at all. And where the hell did he take Ben? He's taken Ben to the prison. He was too dangerous. Can you talk to him? Maria asked. Can you let him know that we're not infected and that we're not a threat? Yeah, of course. But you need to understand you don't just talk to the general. It's more delicate than that. It's sensitive. He's been through so much. He's the last one left. The last one standing. He survived and he's kept it together when the rest of the military left. When all the other leaders doubted him. When they all told him he was wrong, wrong, wrong. He stood defiant. Unmoving. He was a rock. He is the only one who has not abandoned us. That's why we need to be careful. He holds the power. He can save us. Again, I couldn't figure out what had happened to Kim. She was speaking fast and her eyes were wide. It's like she was on drugs or something. And the way she talked about the general, it just didn't make sense. Once again, I got the feeling she had been brainwashed. But don't worry, she continued. He knows Maria is immune. He knows. And he knows that you're the only hope. Because if he doesn't stop it, if he fails... She trailed off, shaking her head. He can't fail. He will win this war. And then he will prove to all the others that he was right. He was the only one who had the strength to stay and fight and win. He ordered the deaths of innocent people when all the other military leaders ran away in fear. He stood up to fear and darkness and uncertainty. So don't worry. He knows. Again, Kim sort of just trailed off. Then she left and we were left wondering what the hell she was talking about and why she was acting so weird. What did they do to her? Maria asked. It's a side effect of the nanovirus, the mystery man said from the corner. What? I asked. What are you talking about? Who are you? He was still curled up in the far corner of the shipping container. I looked closely, but I could barely see him. He was like a ghost. Early side effects of the nanovirus, he repeated. Hyperspeech, hyperactivity. It's almost like a manic episode. The nanobots improve the neural pathways of the brain. They change it. Make it better, more efficient, more adaptable. When it first happens, it's euphoric. It's like this endless high. Hold up a second, 
I said. Are you saying that she's been injected with the nanovirus? I'm almost certain, he answered. She's displaying all the early symptoms. The same nanovirus the military released into the atmosphere in an attempt to eradicate the Oz virus? The very one. How do you know what the symptoms are? Maria asked. I'm an Evo agent, he said. I was hired by the company, trained by the company. We were all given the injections. I turned to Dr. Hunter. What the hell did you do to her? She said you saved her. What did you do? He was sitting against the wall with his head resting on his knees. He looked like a defeated man. We did save her. We cured her. She was sick. With the Oz virus? No. She had cancer. Skin cancer. It was aggressive. The cancer had spread. It had moved into her lymphatic system. It was advancing. It was killing her. We gave her an injection of the nanovirus. It was purely an experiment. You experimented on her? I asked. There was nothing else we could do. She was terminal. We ran tests. Within days, the cancer went into remission. Within days, she had completely recovered. What? How? The nanobots. When she started improving, we decided to give her concentrated doses. We injected the nanovirus directly into the tumors and the affected areas. The way the nanobots acted, the way they targeted the tumors, attacked the tumors, he trailed off, shaking his head. It was simply amazing. So, the nanovirus cured her? Dr. Hunter nodded. For lack of a better word, yes. But it's changing her brain? I don't know, Dr. Hunter answered. It's a new technology. We are still learning how to harness it. Yes, it will change her brain, the Evo agent whispered, struggling to speak. It's inevitable. Will it change her? Maria asked. Will it change her personality? Only time will tell. But why? I asked. What does the nanovirus do? It makes you stronger, fitter, smarter. It unleashes potential. It turns you into a super soldier. That was the whole point. The next evolutionary stage of warfare. The next evolutionary stage of the soldier. The man tensed up and coughed. But there are side effects. Withdrawal symptoms. If you don't get your monthly injection, your body starts to fail. The nanobots, the injections, it's like a drug. Your body begins to depend on it. Is that what's happening to you now? I asked. Yes. How long since your last injection? 38 days. Maria stood up and moved over to the Evo agent. She offered him the last of her water. What's your name? She asked. Seven, he answered. Seven? That's my number. We were all assigned numbers, told to forget our names. We belong to the company. Here, Maria said. Drink this. He raised his head slightly. It was then he saw Maria. Wait, who are you? What's your name? Maria. He took out a photo from his pocket. It was Maria's school photo. Maria Marsh, he whispered. The whole world is looking for you. Chapter 38 The whole world was looking for Maria, but the whole world was too late. We were sitting in a dark prison cell, waiting for the general to make a decision. It was up to him now to set us free, to call for help, to organize an extraction for Maria. The world would have no say in the matter, and if Maria stayed down here, the world would never find her. The next day, General Spears returned. He opened the door to the shipping container slightly. He was accompanied by two heavily armed soldiers. Are any of you infected? He asked. We already told you, I said. We're not infected. Please, we need food and water. Water you can have, he said. No food. Not yet. He was making us weaker and weaker. He was doing this on purpose. He was torturing us and trying to break our spirits. What's going on? I asked. Why are you keeping us prisoner? Why are you keeping Maria prisoner? She can help. She is the only one who can make a difference. Nobody wants to help, he answered. Not anymore. They are afraid of the virus. They are afraid of this weapon because they do not understand it. But I understand it. Don't you see? They are brain dead. They are dead. 
They feed on the living to spread the infection. The dead feed on the living. And we the living feed on the dead. Don't you see how perfect that is? It is simple. It is pure. It is genius. That is why they are afraid. They have a right to be afraid, Maria said. Of course they do. That is why we need to help. We can stop this. There was a meeting, he continued, right before the military left, Operation Homefront. The situation in Australia had been assessed. They said it was beyond the point of no return. Massive casualties had been suffered. Project Salvation had failed. It was recommended that all military personnel fall back to home soil in preparation for domestic defensive purposes. The probability of an outbreak of the Oz virus on American soil was considered highly likely. Therefore, all military resources would be required in domestic defensive and containment roles. Australia was a non-priority. The remaining population was expendable. The remaining soldiers were expendable. He took a deep breath. They left us here to die. So who is the enemy? Who are we fighting? Who are we fighting for? We can't just give up, Maria said. I agree, and I won't give up. That is why I am still here. He retrieved a small book from his back pocket. This book was a gift. It is The Art of War by Sun Tzu. The general flicked through a few pages. He found the section he was looking for. Sun Tzu states that in order to become invincible, immortal, to become a god, you must know your enemy as you know yourself. The first rule of war is know yourself. Know your weaknesses. Know your strengths. Know your limitations. Once you know this, then you must know your enemy. He put the book back in his pocket. We do not know our enemy. The virus changes and adapts. The cure, Project Salvation, the nanovirus, for all its potential, was a false hope. It became a weapon of unimaginable horror and consequence. It was sophisticated, elegant, and supremely advanced. And it morphed. It changed into something evil. In the end, it became a weapon. And that weapon was in the hands of children. But the real enemy, the real enemy, is within. Know yourself. Know your enemy. But what if you do not know either? There would be no hope. No hope. He left suddenly. Once again, we were alone in the dark, confused and angry and desperate. The Evo agent cleared his throat. The rest of my squad was killed by the general, he whispered. It's like he knew what we were going to do even before we knew. For all our physical abilities, he outsmarted us. And now I think he has been taking the nanovirus injections as well. It's the only possible explanation. He's old. He's got to be pushing 60. But he possesses the strength of a prize fighter. The rest of my squad was in here with me, and the general killed them one by one. Every few days. He comes back. He takes one of us. I am next. And then he will kill you. Excuse me? Maria asked. Why? Why would he do that? It's warfare. Kill or be killed. One by one. We are next. You are next. No, he wouldn't just execute us, Maria said. He wants to stop this plague. He wants what we want. The Evo agent was silent. His breathing was labored. We need to get out of here, I said. We need to escape. There is no escaping, he said. We are deep underground. We are locked in a cell, in a secure cave. We are in a prison within a prison within a prison. There is no escape. Dr. Hunter, I said. Surely you can help. There has to be someone else down here. Your staff. Other doctors in the research facility. What about Dr. West? They can't all be dead? Ben said this place was bigger than Manhattan, so where the hell is everyone? Dr. West fled. He disappeared. When it got real bad, he deserted us. Well, what about the rest of your staff? I asked. There is no one left. Not here. They ran, or they committed suicide. Suicide? They knew there was no escape from Australia. The military had set up their blockade. The infected had taken over. The virus had spread from coast to coast. Australia is now hell on earth. No escape. That's why they did it. That's why. The ones who stayed behind were eventually murdered by the general and his men. So we should just commit suicide, I said. Is that what you're saying? We just wait here to die? Maybe it's the better option, he answered. 
Quick. Painless. The soldier is right. We are trapped in a prison within a prison within a prison. There is no escape. No escape from death. No escape but death. Chapter 39 We were waiting to be executed. It was a weird form of psychological torture. The end of it would be the end of us. Two days passed. We were so weak. We were dehydrated and starving. I began hallucinating. My vision was blurry. I could barely stay awake. Suddenly, the general returned again. He opened the doors to the shipping container. He opened them as wide as they could go. His bodyguards stood behind him. The light from their torches poured into the shipping container, sending me blind. The general stood in the doorway. He knew we could not run. He knew we were too weak to run. We had no strength. None. We had been broken. He walked into the shipping container. He walked right over Maria and me. He stepped over Dr. Hunter. He moved to the rear. He knelt down next to the Evo agent. You were sent here to kill me, he said. You were sent here by the company. You are an assassin. Do you know the fate of an assassin? The Evo agent did not respond. He was barely alive. His lips were cracked and covered in black vomit. His skin was pale. Your fate is death, the general said. Do it, the Evo agent whispered. Please. You were sent by the company, the general repeated. You are the company, and all of you are weak, incompetent. You should have burned the cities. You should have burned this nation. You have the power. You have more than enough power. How can you say that? he asked. Because I know. I now have the strength to do things that normal humans can't do. I have the ability to go above and beyond the call of duty. That's what it means to wear a uniform, to hold rank, to lead men. If you can't order the necessary deaths of the few to save the many, if you can't make that call, then you do not deserve freedom. You are not fit for duty. You cannot be allowed to live as a soldier. You need to be punished. And the only punishment is death. He retrieved a gun from the waist of his pants. He gave the gun to Dr. Hunter. Shoot him, the general instructed the doctor. What? Shoot him. And, and you'll let me live? General Spears did not respond. Dr. Hunter looked at the gun in his hand. He realized this was his one chance. He raised the weapon, aimed it at the general. But before he could squeeze the trigger, the general reached out and grabbed the barrel. He moved faster than the eye could see. He twisted the gun, snapping Dr. Hunter's wrist. The doctor screamed in pain. You have survived against all odds, the general said. Yes, you are a survivor, and I admire that. Dr. Hunter was doubled over, holding his broken wrist. What the hell are you going to do to me? You have caused death on a massive scale, and you are now useless, a surgeon with one broken hand. You have failed to contain this virus, to control this weapon, to control power. You have failed. You should be dead. You should have died a long time ago. Now you must earn your life again. The general dragged Dr. Hunter out of the shipping container. Take him, he said to his soldiers, his personal bodyguards. Throw him in the labyrinth. Let's see if you can survive down there, he said to Dr. Hunter, taunting him. Then I will truly be impressed. No, I shouted. You can't take him away. We need him. You need him. He is just a surgeon the general said. A butcher. He is replaceable. We have other resources. He is not as important as he thinks he is. Dr. Hunter screamed as he was taken away. General Spears came back into the shipping container and I fully expected to be killed at this point. But we weren't. He dragged the Evo agent out by his hair and I never saw that man again. Chapter 40 Hours went by. Days. I'm not sure how long. I'd had completely lost track of time. The general eventually returned. He opened the door and left it open. He tied our hands behind our back. And then he stood over us for what felt like an eternity. At that point, we were at his mercy. He could have killed us so easily. The only reason we were alive is because he wanted us alive. For what reason? I had no idea. 
As he stood over us, he looked like a beast or some sort of ancient mythological god, and I'm pretty sure he had convinced himself he was a god. One of the soldiers handed him a metallic briefcase. He placed the briefcase on the floor in front of us. I want to better understand my enemy, he said. Know your enemy as you know yourself. This is the first step. He opened the briefcase. Inside were four glass vials, two vials of clear fluid and two vials of black fluid. There was also a row of hypodermic needles and a gun, a dart gun. He took up the gun and then threw it away. He picked up one of the glass vials of clear fluid. This is the Oz virus, concentrated and pure. It has caused untold horror and death. It has destroyed this nation. Within months, weeks, it is a weapon, a biological, evolving weapon of mass destruction. He snapped the glass vial in half. The glass cut his hands up. He spilt some of the fluid and it ran down his hands and his arms and mixed in with the blood. I backed away. He drank the rest of fluid in the vial and wiped the blood on his bare chest. You... you just drank the virus? Maria said. Are you mad? You're a dead man. No, I will not die. This is how I become immortal. This is how I become invincible. Know yourself. Know your enemy. In 1,000 battles, I will not know defeat. I will survive. You are not the only one, little girl. You are not the only one who is immune. He held his gut and grimaced in pain. My rank. My power. I have ordered the deaths of many people. I have killed more people with the stroke of a pen, the push of a button, the nod of the head, confirm access code, launch code. Every time I turned a key, I massacred thousands of people in a heartbeat. This will test you. The fear and the weight of the dead will test you. Abraham Lincoln once said, if you want to test the character of a man, give him power. You must embrace the fear of death, the power to kill. Embrace it, or it will break you. It will destroy you. Beads of sweat had formed on his head. He began to shiver. Do you believe me when I say I acted for the greater good of mankind? Will anyone believe me? I ordered the nuclear strikes. Me. I had the power of God. And I used that power. But how could anyone ever understand? I killed thousands to save millions. I killed millions to save billions. How could anyone without true power understand that? He threw the broken glass vial away. It smashed against the far wall of the shipping container. The doctors tell me that infection spreads quickly. Sometimes it spreads within minutes, sometimes hours. I have consumed the Oz virus. Soon I will know my enemy. And then I will know immortality. He stood. He was about to leave, but then he paused in the doorway. You will know your fate soon. Chapter 41 after the general left, the soldiers blindfolded us again, placing black hoods over our heads. We were inmates on death row, awaiting execution. We were alone in the dark. We were miles below the Earth's surface. We were in a prison within a prison. Dr. Hunter and Ben had been taken away. They had been thrown into some sort of labyrinth. Kim had disappeared. We hadn't seen or heard from her in days. We had no idea where Jack was. Or Kenji. I think I had convinced myself that Kenji was dead. And I had convinced myself that Maria and I would join him in the afterlife very soon. We were basically waiting in the dark for the general, or one of his men, to come back and finish us off. We were waiting to die. The worst part was not having the strength to do anything about it. We were so unbelievably weak. There was no point in trying to escape. We were trapped in the deepest, darkest part of hell. Our only option was to try and bargain our way to freedom, or at the very least convince them that Maria was worth living for, worth saving. We spent one last night in that shipping container. All throughout the night we heard screams, and gunshots, rapid machine gun fire, more screaming, the howling moan of the infected. We had no idea what was going on. How did the infected get in? How did they get through the blast doors? Did the general turn? Was he now an infected, undead monster? Why the hell would he drink a vial of the Oz virus? Was he really that delusional? Did he bite and infect his bodyguards? 
The noises, the gunshots, and the screaming lasted for a few hours. And then there was silence. The only noise we could hear was our own ragged breathing. Suddenly the doors to our makeshift prison cell opened. I tried to make a move. I tried to grab Maria. Tried to run. I failed. I was too weak. I couldn't even stand. Maria was crying. I tried to bargain for her life. She is immune. Don't you people get that? We could fix this. We have to. A voice spoke. It was threatening. Almost mechanical. There is no way to fix this world. We must start over. Who, who are you? I asked. Where is the general? Where is Kim? The general is dead, the man answered. Victim of his own hubris. The man dragged us out of the shipping container, forced us to our feet. The general and his men became infected, he said. The general had deliberately infected himself with the Oz virus. He believed that he was God. He believed he would become immortal. He believed he was immune. No one is immune. I am, Maria whispered. Are we sure about that? The virus changes. Maybe you are no longer immune. Maybe we should find out. Who are you? I asked. What the hell are you going to do to us? I am going to give you a choice, he said. I am going to give you freedom. Every chapter in Torn Apart unveils a thrilling new challenge. Ready to face your own? Let Off Grid Magazine be your guide. Brimming with gripping tales, expert survival tips, and the latest gear, Off Grid Magazine transforms readers into adventurers. Embark on a journey where the intense drama of Torn Apart collides with real-world survival. Your adventure begins with Off Grid Magazine. Visit offgridweb.com to get started. Epilogue My blindfold, the black hood is removed from my head. I can see that I am in a room, an interrogation room. I can't see Maria. We have been separated. I am sitting at a table. There is a large one-way mirror to the left of me, and in front of me is a man. He is wearing a gas mask that has been stitched into his scalp. The goggles of the mask are tinted. I can't see his face or his eyes. He looks like a monster, an alien, something inhuman. His shirtless body is scarred and mutilated. His right shoulder is pockmarked with shrapnel wounds from where I shot him. He pulls out a gun. It was strapped to a holster that was strapped to his chest. He aims the gun at me. I close my eyes and he fires the gun. There is no gunshot. Nothing loud, no bang, no boom. There is a noise, but it was weird. It was muffled and soft. I can't describe it, and there was no bullet. I look at my right shoulder. There is a syringe, a dart. He has shot me with a dart gun, a tranquilizer or something. Although I have a bad feeling, it is not a tranquilizer. I have a bad feeling it is something much, much worse. I didn't feel the dart pierce my skin because earlier he injected me with a sedative. The man in the gas mask places a paper crane on the table. What is this? What did you shoot me with? I say this in my head. And the room spins. What is this? What did you shoot me with? This is a paper crane. It is a symbol of hope. In World War II, U.S. forces dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. In an instant, 140,000 people were killed. More than just killed. They were vaporized. They ceased to exist. Ten years later, a young girl was dying of cancer caused by the radiation from the bomb. But she believed that if she folded 1,000 paper cranes, the gods would save her. The tiny paper crane has been folded with amazing skill and care. The crane looks as though it will come to life at any second and fly away. There is only one person in the world who could have made something so goddamn amazing. Kenji Yoshida. The girl, he continues. She never accepted her fate. She was dying. Nothing was going to change that. You have been shot with a time-release virus, a nanovirus. It will remain dormant in your body for three days, 72 hours. After 72 hours, the virus will become active. It will kill you. There is no stopping it. I remove the dart from my shoulder. I stare at it. I am dying. 
Why are you doing this? The man takes a deep breath. I told you. I am giving you freedom. I look at the paper crane. Where is Kenji? You may not know this, but some people do not want to preserve this way of life. Our civilization. Some people want to burn it. Destroy it. I am one of those people. Once I destroy this world, we will be free to start a new life. A new world. Yes. Finally, we will be free. You're crazy. No, I am a savior. Where is Kenji? The Japanese fellow? He was strong. He was a warrior. Was? The man in the gas mask stood and then left the room. Wait, where is Maria? Where are you keeping her? He does not answer me. I try and follow him. I reach out for him. I try and stop him. But I can't. I can't move. I fall off my chair. I lay slumped on the cold concrete floor. At some point, the sedative takes over. And I pass out. I wake up in a panic. I am dizzy and disorientated. The man in the gas mask has disappeared. I am alone. A watch is strapped to my wrist. It is counting down. It reads, 63 hours and 57 minutes. Eight hours. I've been asleep for eight hours. The paper crane is sitting next to me. Written on the wing is a message. It says, Open me. I unfold the crane. Inside is another message. A note. A sick poem. A haiku of horror. Or maybe it's a prophecy. The whole world will look for a girl to save their souls. They will watch hope die. I hold the note tightly in my hand. I slowly get to my feet. The man in the gas mask is a psychopath. He is going to execute Maria on camera. He is going to show the world. I can't let that happen. I have a choice. I can curl up into a ball and die. Or I can live. I can fight. I can fight for Maria. I can fight for my friends. I'm pretty sure I'm dying. I'm pretty sure I have three days to live. 63 hours. 55 minutes. But I choose to fight. We hope you have enjoyed this story. If you have, please share this audiobook with a friend. Your friend will appreciate it, and the Gigabizzle Buppenheimers of the algorithm will like it too.